Today's story is called For Me. The memory verse is from John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The message is, I want Jesus to be my personal Savior. Who is your best friend? Would you be willing to suffer to help that friend? Is there anyone you don't like? Would you do whatever it takes to help that person if they were in trouble? I know someone who would answer yes to both questions. He suffered and died in our place to save everyone. Let's read his story. I have examined this man, and he is innocent, Pilate argued. I will have him whipped, but then I will release him. A great roar rose from the crowd. Crucify him! Crucify him! Release Barabbas to us! The crowd shouted louder and louder. It was the custom to release a prisoner during the Passover season. The crowd was demanding that a terrible criminal be set free and that innocent Jesus be put to death. Pilate was the governor, but he was afraid of the people, and at last he let them have their way. Pilate knew Jesus was not guilty of any crime, but he turned him over to the mob and he let Barabbas out of prison. Thousands of people lined both sides of the road as Jesus struggled along. He staggered under the weight of his cross. Most people shouted and jeered at Jesus. His friends and followers wept. Finally, Jesus fell down. He had no strength left after being beaten by the soldiers. The soldiers grabbed a strong-looking man who was standing nearby. Simon, a traveler from the town of Cyrene, was forced to carry Jesus' cross. They reached the place called Calvary, the place where criminals were crucified. The soldiers pushed Jesus roughly down on the cross. They pounded long iron spikes through his wrists and his feet. Then they lifted the cross and dropped the bottom of it in a hole in the ground so it would stand upright. The pain was terrible. Crucifixion was the most painful and cruel way to put someone to death. But Jesus prayed, Father, forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. The crowd watched as leaders made fun of Jesus. He saved other people, but he can't save himself. They jeered. The soldiers made fun of Jesus, too. They made a sign and nailed it above his head. This is the king of the Jews, it declared. Two thieves were crucified along with Jesus. One of the men mocked him. So you're the Messiah. Prove it by saving yourself and us too. The other thief responded. We deserve to die, he protested. But this man has done nothing wrong. He turned to Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus promised that he would. At noon, the light from the sun completely disappeared. The darkness lasted until three o'clock when Jesus cried, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And then he died. The earth shook, the curtain in the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. Only God or his angels could have ripped the thick curtain. A good man named Joseph went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph put Jesus' body in a new tomb, one that had been carved out of a rock, the very tomb that Joseph had made for himself. A big stone was rolled in place to seal the tomb. It was very late Friday afternoon. All was quiet. Everyone knew something powerful 
had just happened. Today's story is called, He's Alive. The memory verse is from Mark chapter 16, verse 15. It says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Today's message is we serve God when we tell others that Jesus is risen. Have you ever had some good news you wanted to share? Maybe you just couldn't wait to tell someone. Mary Magdalene was among the first to know that Jesus had been resurrected, and she couldn't wait to tell the world. It was Sunday morning after the most difficult Sabbath of Jesus' disciples' lives. Jesus had just died a few hours before sundown on Friday. His sad, troubled followers had buried him quickly in a tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Then they had hurried home to observe the Sabbath. The women who had been at the cross wanted to serve Jesus by caring for his body. They had followed and watched as he was laid in the tomb. They saw the heavy stone rolled across the opening to seal it. They too had rested on the Sabbath, but at daylight on Sunday morning, they hurried to the grave. The burial spices they carried were to anoint his body. Who is going to roll away that heavy stone for us? They wondered as they neared the tomb. They didn't know that an angel had already been to the tomb. With a mighty earthquake, he had rolled away the stone, and he had called Jesus to life in the name of the Father. The women trembled at the sight of the open tomb. Bravely, they looked inside. An angel, shining with the glory of heaven, spoke to them. Do not be afraid, said the angel. I know that you are looking for Jesus, but he is not here. He has risen from the dead, just as he said he would. Go quickly and tell his disciples, Jesus is on his way to Galilee and you will see him there. Can you imagine the shock? After all that had happened the past few days, the women probably didn't know what to think. The Bible says that with fear and great joy, they ran to tell the others. Can you imagine them dropping their spices? Can you see them running back to town as fast as they could go? Do you think they were full of energy? Of course they were. Do you think they were enthusiastic? Without a doubt. Nothing could stop them. They had to share the good news Jesus had risen from the dead. We have the honor of sharing that same message with the world today. Before he left earth to return to heaven, Jesus spoke to his followers, Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Are you ready to tell the world the good news about Jesus? Today's story is called, Let the Children Come. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 18, verse 16. It says, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Today's message is children like me are welcome in God's family. Can you remember a time when an important visitor came to your town? What did everyone do? Were there pictures in the newspaper? Did you stand and wave a flag? In our story today, someone very important has just come to town. It may have happened like this. Have you heard the news? Jesus is in town. Over and over, people in the town told one another the news. Jesus is here. Everyone wanted to see Jesus. Men left their work and hurried to hear him speak. 
friends, and families helped sick people get near him. They had heard how he had healed others. Maybe he would heal them too. Everyone was amazed as they watched Jesus with the people. They saw blind men and women see again. They laughed with the lame people who could leap and jump again. They saw mothers and fathers and children well again. Everyone was helped. No one was turned away. When some of the mothers heard about Jesus, they wanted to see him too. They wanted him to bless their children. The children were excited. They were going to see Jesus. Children everywhere loved Jesus. He smiled at them. He spoke kindly to them and told wonderful stories. He loved the flowers and other small gifts they brought him. Soon, some of the mothers hurried through the town. They called to their friends, Come with us to see Jesus. Children told their friends, and soon many were hurrying to see Jesus. But the mothers with small children could not go very fast. It took time for the toddlers to walk. Finally, all the mothers and children reached the crowd around Jesus. They stood at the back, trying to look over all the tall people in their way. Some of the small children may have tried to crawl forward, but they could not get near Jesus. Everyone wanted to see Him. It seemed as if everyone was pushing, trying to get nearer. The mothers felt as if it were hopeless. Could anyone help them see Jesus? Maybe His disciples would help them. The mothers led the children to the disciples. The disciples frowned at them. They shook their heads. Go away. Can't you see Jesus is busy? Can't you see he is tired? Jesus saw what was happening. Wait, he said. Let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. The kingdom of God belongs to people who are like these little children. The disciples and the crowd were amazed. The mothers and children hurried to Jesus. He spent a long time with them. He took the children onto his lap and blessed them. Maybe he told the mothers how much he loved the children. Maybe he talked about how they could raise their children to love God. We don't know what Jesus said to the mothers and children that day, but we can be sure that he was not angry at them for wanting to be with him. He was happy. He was glad to talk with them. Jesus always loves children and parents, and He wants you to come to Him today. He wants you to be a part of His family, too. The title of today's story is Going Fishing. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. It says, Come, Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. The message is I follow Jesus and share him with others. Have you ever caught a fish or watched anyone fishing? A long time ago, men learned a new way to fish. The lake was rising over the hills east of Lake Genesaret. Peter and his brother Andrew had fished all night without catching a thing. Let's go, Peter said. They pulled up their nets and headed for the shore. As the people crowded closer and closer, Jesus stepped into Peter's boat and asked him to pull out into the water. He sat in the boat and continued to talk to the crowd of people on the shore. He told them that they could be in God's kingdom if they believed in him. When he finished speaking, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Let's go out and catch some fish. Andrew was puzzled. The sun was high overhead. Nobody fished in the heat of the day. Why? Because the fish were far below the surface in the cool, deep waters of the lake. We've worked all night without catching a thing, Peter said. But because you say so, 
I will let down the nets. Peter and Andrew threw their big net far from the boat. It was suddenly full of fish. The net was so heavy with fish that the boat began to tip over. Help us! Peter cried to James and John in their nearby boat. We're sinking! James and John hurried to help them. Hauling that heavy net was hard work. James and John took part of the fish into their own boat. Both boats were so full that they barely made it back to shore without sinking. If you follow me, Jesus said, you will fish for men. Jesus meant that they would tell people about him. The four fishermen looked at their boats. They had never before caught so many fish at one time. Truly, this was a miracle. And the man who had made it happen wanted them to follow him. Peter remembered the people who had followed Jesus to the lake shore. He thought of his nets, so full that his boat had almost sunk. He probably thought of all the money he could earn. But he decided to follow Jesus. So did Andrew, James, and John. They walked away from the biggest catch they had ever seen. They left everything behind and put Jesus first in their lives. As long as they lived, they told many people about Him. We too can follow Jesus when we put Him first and tell others about Him. He will lead us to those who need to know about Him and He will help us to be fishers of men. Today's story is called Balaam and the Talking Donkey. The memory verse is from John chapter 14, verse 23. It says, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Today's message is we worship God when we follow His instructions. Have you ever seen a dog do tricks? Some dogs can roll over and sit up. In our story, a man heard a donkey talk, really talk. Let's find out what it said. The Israelites were nearing the promised land, but the surrounding nations had tried to stand in their way, forcing the Israelites to go to war with them. But God was on their side, and each victory sent a message. Balak, the king of Moab, knew he didn't have any hope against that kind of strength. But then he remembered what he had heard about Balaam. Some said that whatever Balaam blessed was truly blessed, and whatever he cursed was cursed. If Balak could get Balaam to curse the Israelites, his army might have a chance. So he sent some messengers to bring Balaam to him. They took along a lot of gold. That was the money of their day. Balaam believed in God. He had once been a prophet, but he had become greedy and no longer served God. Yet when the messengers came, Balaam asked God for instructions. The answer came back, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people, because I have blessed them. So Balaam sent the messengers home. But Balak sent more messengers with even more gold. Balaam knew that God did not want him to go. So he said, King Balak could give me his palace full of silver and gold, but I cannot disobey the Lord. God knew that Balaam really wanted to go. So that night, God said to Balaam, These men have come to ask you to go with them. Go, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam saddled his donkey and went with the messengers. Balaam did not see the angel standing in the road to block his way, but his donkey did. So she turned off into a field. Balaam beat the donkey to get her back onto the road. The angel appeared a second time, and the donkey moved against a wall, smashing Balaam's foot. Balaam beat her a second time. The third time the angel appeared, there was no place for the donkey to go, so she lay down in the road. 
It was after this third beating that the Lord made the donkey speak. What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? She asked Balaam. Balaam was so angry that he answered without thinking. You've made a fool out of me, he said. You have ridden me for years, the donkey responded. Have I ever done this before? And that's when Balaam saw the angel. If your donkey hadn't turned away from me, I would have killed you by now, the angel said. Balaam's life had been saved by his donkey. I have sinned, responded Balaam to the angel. If I am wrong, I will go back. The angel said, Go, but you will only be able to say what the Lord wants you to say. When Balaam finally met Balak, he warned Balak, I can only say what the Lord wants me to say. In three different places that day, Balak asked Balaam to curse the Israelites. But every time Balaam opened his mouth, blessings for the Israelites came out. After the third time, Balak was angry. Go home, he ordered. I called you to curse my enemies, but you have blessed them three times. Didn't I tell you I couldn't do anything against the command of the Lord? Balaam answered. Before I leave, I will tell you what these people will do to your people. Then Balaam prophesied truly. A ruler will rise from Israel. He will defeat the Moabites. The Israelites will destroy the city. God taught Balaam that worship involves everything you do. It is living a life that is pleasing to God. Worshiping is listening to God's voice and following His commands. It is using our voices, our speech, and our actions to honor God. Lessons from a Worm The message for this week is, I am happy when others join God's family. The memory verse is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. What's wrong? Mom wanted to know, looking at Caitlin's face as she and her brother Jeremy climbed into the car. I got a horrible grade on my spelling test again. And you said you were going to punish me if I got another bad grade in spelling. Caitlin sighed. Jeremy grinned to himself. He remembered when Mom had grounded him for not studying his spelling. I'm sorry, Caitlin, Mom said sympathetically. I'll help you study your words after supper. Jeremy began to feel hot and angry. Why wasn't Mom going to punish Caitlin like she said she would? Jonah was feeling much like Jeremy. Let's look in on him. Jonah's face grew red. He gritted his teeth. God hadn't destroyed the people he didn't like. God was not going to destroy the city of Nineveh after all. Jonah was so mad. I knew you would act like this, Jonah fussed at God. That's why I tried to run away to Tarshish. You're a loving and merciful God. You are patient and kind. I knew you would not destroy these terrible people. Just go ahead and kill me, Jonah shouted. It would be better if I died since nothing I predicted is going to happen. The Lord answered Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry like this? Maybe something will happen to Nineveh after all, Jonah thought. He decided to walk out where he could look down on the city and watch. It was very hot up on the hillside. Jonah made a little shelter with tree branches to protect himself from the sun. Then he sat down and waited. Then the most unusual thing began to happen. God made a vine with big green leaves to grow beside Jonah's shelter. Jonah stared at the plant. He had never seen anything like it. 
he had never seen anything grow up so fast. Up and up and up it went. The stem grew longer and thicker. Big leaves appeared and uncurled one after the other. The vine climbed all over Jonah's little shelter. It made a wonderfully shady place to sit. Jonah smiled to himself. It was nice not to be baking in the sun. He was very pleased with the plant. Jonah spent the whole night in his little shelter. Early the next morning, God prepared a worm that ate right through the stem of Jonah's plant. Of course, the plant died and it shriveled up. It could no longer protect Jonah from the sun's rays. The day got hotter and hotter and God sent a scorching wind to blow on Jonah. The wind blew and blew and the sun beat down. Jonah was miserable and angry. It would be better to die than to endure this, he exclaimed. Then God spoke to Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah shouted. You feel sorry about the vine, but you did nothing to make it grow. And a plant doesn't live very long anyway, God said. Nineveh has many people living there, plus all the animals. I made them all, and I love them. Don't I have more reason to feel sorry for them than you do to feel sorry for the vine that died? Jonah was confused. He didn't understand why God spared the people of Nineveh. But he knew about God's love and mercy. Years later, Jesus spoke of the work Jonah had done. This story shows us how loving and patient our God is. He wants us to follow His example, to be loving, kind, and patient to the people around us. He wants us to be happy when others join His family. Today's story is called The Lion and the Bear. The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 23, verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Today's message is I can't save myself. Jesus saves me. When he had to write a report about sheep, Jamie remembered something his mother had read to him from the Bible. This is what he recalled. David looked over the flock of sheep that dotted the field. These woolly animals were his friends, and he was their shepherd. He walked with the sheep by the still pools of the water in the heat of the day. He led them to the green fields of grass. He was usually by himself, but David did not feel afraid or alone. He knew that God was with him. Just as David took good care of the sheep, God, his shepherd, was taking special care of him. I must stay alert, David reminded himself when he felt like napping. A little lamb might stray from the flock while I sleep. To keep himself awake, he often sat on a high rock and strummed softly on the harp he carried with him. Then, in a clear voice, he sang, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. One day, David saw a movement out of the corner of his eye. He dropped his harp and grabbed his sling. He always carried smooth, round stones, ready for anything that might try to hurt the sheep. A lion crouched in a thicket at the edge of the water. Just as the huge lion was ready to spring on a sheep, David released the stone. Zing! The stone flew through the air and hit the lion. 
Then David fought the lion until he knew the lion could no longer hurt the sheep. Quickly, David laid down his sling and walked among the sheep, counting them carefully. They were all there, and none were hurt. The Lord had helped him protect the sheep. Soon David sat on his rock again, playing his harp. This time he sang, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Another day, David decided to lead the sheep into the hills. Here the sheep could graze on new grass, but danger lurked in the hills. Bears lived in dens in the hillsides and often wandered out searching for food. David carefully watched the lambs. Suddenly he saw something move in the tall grass nearby. Instantly he was alert. A huge brown beast moved in the grass near the lambs. Suddenly it rushed forward. Quickly David loaded his sling, swung it, and let it go. The stone hit the bear so hard that it fell and never got up again. Once more, God had helped David save his sheep. That evening, as David led the sheep home, he might have sung, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Like the sheep, we need someone to watch over us. We need Jesus, the Good Shepherd. We can't save ourselves, but Jesus can. Only Jesus saves us. Today's story is called On the Way to Calvary. The memory verse is from Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Today's message is we can help others carry their burdens. Has anyone ever helped you carry something really heavy? Or have you helped someone lift something that was too heavy for them? Simon helped Jesus carry something very heavy for him. Jesus had just endured the worst night imaginable. After the Passover feast, he had gone with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. There he was arrested. During the night he was put on trial. He was harshly questioned before the high priest, the Jewish leaders, Pilate, and Herod. He was spit on, slapped, mocked, and insulted, and he was sentenced to death. Twice he was whipped until his back was bleeding and raw. And now it was morning. Prisoners were expected to carry their own crosses to the place of execution. And so, as Jesus was taken out of the court, his cross was laid on his bleeding back. And then he met Simon. Simon was from the town of Cyrene in northern Africa. The Bible doesn't tell us what he was doing in Jerusalem. Maybe he was in town to do some business and got caught in the big crowd. Simon looked where everyone else seemed to be looking, and he saw something horrible. A man surrounded by four Roman soldiers. The man had a crown of thorns on his head. His back was bloody, and he looked like he was going to faint. And he was carrying a cross. That meant he was going to be crucified. He must have done something horrible, Simon may have thought. Only the very worst criminals are crucified. Suddenly the man fell down. He's been beaten so much and lost so much blood. He looks almost dead already, 
Simon probably thought as he watched. But this prisoner is different. Most criminals I know about curse and yell and fight, but this man does nothing. He, he says nothing. He looks kind. As Simon watched, the soldiers talked with one another. The man didn't even try to get up. Simon felt sorry for him. Just then, a soldier looked around and pushed through the crowd right to Simon. Come with me, the soldier said. You can carry Jesus' cross. Simon didn't dare disobey. Any Roman soldier could make anyone do any work. Simon picked up the cross and started to walk. The cross was heavy. Simon wondered how a beaten man could carry it even a little way. And they don't go the shortest way when they take a man to be crucified, Simon may have thought. They wanted to hurt and shame the person as much as possible. I'm glad I could help him. I can't stop what's going to happen, but I can help by carrying his cross. Simon must have watched as Jesus was nailed on the cross. He must have heard him comfort the thief who asked to be remembered when Jesus comes again. He must have heard Jesus forgive the people who hurt him. All of this must have changed Simon forever. For the rest of his life, Simon would remember doing something to help Jesus. Simon must have learned about the heavy burden Jesus carried the weight of the sins of the whole world, and Simon had done something to help the Savior who died for him. What can you do to help Jesus today? Today's story is called 70 times 7. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 18, verse 35. Forgive your brother from your heart. Today's message is God wants me to forgive others from my heart. Have you ever been so angry at someone that it was hard to forgive them? One day, Peter asked Jesus, How many times shall I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? In Jesus' time, the priests and rabbis taught that people only had to forgive a person three times. So Peter thought he was being generous by suggesting the number seven. Not seven times, Jesus said, but seventy times seven. Jesus meant that we should not count the times that we forgive someone. We should be willing and ready to forgive. Then Jesus told a story to make his point. A certain man worked for a king, managing the king's money. One day the king sat down to look at his accounts. He discovered this man's account was millions in debt, far more than the man could ever repay. The king ordered the man, his wife, and his children to be sold and everything he owned was to be sold. All the money would help to repay the debt. The man fell on his knees and begged for mercy. Give me time, he said, and I will repay everything I owe. The king knew the man could never repay so much money, but the king felt sorry for the man, so he canceled the debt and let his servant go. The king's servant was so relieved he rushed away. On his way out, he met another servant, one who owed him money. It was just a little bit, about a day's wages. The king's servant grabbed the second man by the neck and he began choking him. Pay me back the money you owe me, he demanded. Please be patient with me, begged the second man. Give me time, and I will repay back everything I owe you. But the king's servant refused. He had the second man thrown in prison until he could repay the debt. Other servants of the king saw the whole thing. They immediately reported it to the king. The king called the first servant back. 
You wicked servant, he stormed. I canceled millions you owed me. Shouldn't you have had the same mercy on someone else? Someone who owed you so little? The king had his servant taken away to prison. We are like the king's servant. He owed more than he could ever repay. We can never be good enough. But just as the king forgave his servant, God has forgiven our sins. And since God has forgiven us, he asks us to treat others with mercy and kindness and forgiveness. Today's story is called No, No, No. The memory verse is from Psalm 119, verse 11. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The message is, when I have God's word in my heart, I can say no to Satan. Have you ever been tempted to do something that mom or dad have told you not to do? To do something you know is wrong? Satan tempted Jesus, but Jesus said no. How was he able to be so strong? Jesus had just been baptized by John. He needed to be alone. He wanted to pray and think about what he was to do on earth, so he went into the desert. For 40 days, he did not eat. He prayed all day, every day. After the 40 days, Satan suddenly appeared. Satan knew Jesus was hungry and weak, so he said to Jesus, If you are really God's son, turn some of these rocks into bread. Satan knew Jesus was God's son God had just called Jesus his beloved son at Jesus' baptism. If Jesus did this miracle, he would be showing that he doubted God's word. Furthermore, Satan knew that Jesus would never do miracles to help himself. He would only help others. Jesus had learned the scriptures from his mother and at the synagogue his family attended. When Satan said, Turn some rocks into bread, Jesus thought about the things he had learned. People don't live just by eating, he replied, but by the words that come from God. God had said that Jesus was God's son, so he did not need to prove it. Jesus wanted Satan to know that to obey and trust God was more important than food at the moment. Jesus knew he could depend on God to provide food for him at the right time. Then Satan led Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. Satan took Jesus to one of the highest places on the temple. It was probably the place where the priest stood to blow the horn to call the people to worship. If you are God's son, sneered Satan, jump off. The scriptures say your father will send angels to rescue you. They'll catch you and keep you from crashing onto the rocks. That was true. God had promised that angels would keep his people from crashing onto the rocks. But Jesus knew he shouldn't purposely put himself in danger, and he did not want to use the power God gave him to save himself, so he knew he wouldn't jump. The scriptures also say, Do not challenge the Lord, Jesus replied. Satan tried one more thing. He took Jesus to a high mountain. There he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Bow down and worship me, he demanded, and all this can be yours. Satan was lying. He couldn't promise the world to Jesus. It didn't belong to him. The world and everything in it belongs to God. Satan knew if Jesus bowed down to him, he could never save the world. Everyone would be lost forever. Get away from me, Satan, Jesus commanded. The scriptures say you must worship and serve only God. Satan left Jesus then. He knew Jesus would never worship anyone but his father. After Satan left, 
Angels came to be with Jesus. They comforted him. They gave him food and water. How did Jesus resist Satan's temptations? He read the scriptures and thought about them. He went to the synagogue every week. He participated in worship services. And he prayed. You can read one of his prayers in John 17. Worshiping God gave him strength. You too can gain strength as you worship God. Today's story is called Strong Outside, Weak Inside. The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 51, verse 10. It says, Create in me a pure heart, O God. The message is God loves me and can work with me even though I make mistakes. Have you ever done something you knew was wrong? How did you feel? That is probably how Samson felt. Again and again, he ignored God's plan. But God did not give up on Samson. Samson grew up hearing his mother telling him about God's special plan for his life. She often spoke of the angel who had spoken to her and Samson's father before he was born. The angel told them that Samson's hair should not be cut. He was to become a Nazarite, set apart to serve God. God had promised, As long as you do not cut Samson's hair, I will give him strength. God wanted Samson to use his strength to lead Israel against the Philistines. But Samson did not follow all of God's instructions. Samson wanted his own way. He wanted to follow his own wishes, not God's. Even though Samson continued to disobey God and do what he wanted, God still worked with him to bring down the Philistines. One day, Samson went to the Philistine city of Gaza to see a woman there. Then he was trapped in her house. It was midnight. Some men were whispering outside the house. The house is surrounded, they said. We'll kill him at dawn. Even though Samson had abandoned God, God was still with him. Samson ran to the city gates, but they were locked. Then Samson grabbed the huge wooden doors, lifted them right out of the ground, and walked away. The Philistines were amazed. Not long after his escape from Gaza, Samson went to see a Philistine woman named Delilah. When the Philistine leaders found out about this, they went to see Delilah. We'll give you lots of money if you find out the secret of Samson's strength, they promised. Three times Delilah begged Samson to tell her his secret. Three times he told her a lie. Three times she tied Samson, then called to him, The Philistines are attacking you! Three times Samson escaped easily. You don't love me! Delilah finally told Samson. If you really loved me, you would tell me the secret of your strength. You would tell me everything. Every day, Delilah begged Samson to tell her the secret of his strength. Over and over, she begged him until Samson got tired of hearing her ask. Samson finally told her the secret of his strength. If my head were shaved, I would be weak, he said. That night, Delilah had Samson's hair cut. Then she screamed, Samson, the Philistines are attacking you. This time, Samson's strength had left him. More important, God had left him too. The Philistines captured Samson and put out his eyes. They took him back to Gaza through the very gates he had once carried. Thousands of people came to see Samson, who was now weak and blind and helpless. The Philistines put Samson to work in the prison. Gradually, his hair began to grow back. Samson knew he had done wrong. 
he told God that he was sorry and asked God to forgive him. After some time, the Philistines threw a party in a temple to their idol, Dagon. They were celebrating Samson's capture. During the celebration, Samson was led from his prison cell. There in the temple, men teased Samson and humiliated him. Finally, Samson asked to rest. A servant led him to the pillars in the middle of the temple. There Samson prayed, Oh God, please strengthen me one more time. Samson pushed against two main pillars in the center of the temple. God gave him strength again. The pillars collapsed and the temple fell. Samson was killed along with thousands of Philistines. God had given Samson enormous physical strength, but Samson disobeyed God. He was strong, but on the inside, Samson was weak. Let's ask God to strengthen us inside and outside so we can resist temptation and always do what is right. Today's story is called Brotherly Love. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Today's message is we honor God when we live peacefully with others. Jerry was angry. His brother, Jimmy, had a new bike, and Jerry got his brother's old one. Jerry was jealous. He wanted a new bike, too. So one day, Jerry just took Jimmy's bike and went for a long ride. The Bible tells us about two brothers. One was jealous of the other, and a terrible thing happened. After they left the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had two sons. Cain and Abel. Cain became a farmer. Abel became a shepherd. Every day Cain worked in his fields while Abel took his sheep to graze. Abel loved God. He wanted to do the things God asked of him. He liked bringing gifts to God and he loved to worship him. Cain was different from his brother. He did not want to do what God wanted. He wanted to do his own own thing. Cain didn't want to think about what had happened to their parents. You remember what happened. God told Adam and Eve that they could eat from any tree in the garden except one. If they ate from that tree, they would die. But Adam and Eve listened to Satan and ate fruit from the tree. They did not die right away but they had to leave their beautiful home. God told them about his plan to send his son to die for them, but it would be some time before Jesus came to earth. So God found a way to show Adam and Eve what it meant to die. After Adam and Eve sinned, God created clothes with the skin of animals. And as they watched the flowers die, and the leaves fall from the trees, they began to understand a little bit about death. Then God showed Adam how to make an altar of stones. He showed him how to take a perfect lamb from the flock and place it on the altar. Adam was to kill the lamb and offer it as a sacrifice. Sacrificing an animal was a way for Adam and Eve to say they were sorry for their sin. It was also a way to show that they believed the promise that Jesus would come. This sacrifice was to remind Adam and Eve that Jesus would die for their sins. Adam and Eve felt terrible when they understood this. When they were old enough, Cain and Abel learned to sacrifice animals for their worship too. Abel accepted God's promise that Jesus would die for him he wanted God to know he trusted his promise to send a Savior. So he built an altar and sacrificed a lamb from his flock. God accepted his offering and sent fire from heaven to burn it up. 
Cain knew they should offer sacrifices to God, but when it was time for him to make a sacrifice, he did not do it God's way. He built an altar just as Abel had done, but he put fruits and vegetables that he had grown on the altar instead of the lamb that God asked him to use. God didn't accept Cain's offering. He didn't send fire from heaven to burn it up. Abel tried to tell Cain to do what God said, but Cain was stubborn. He was angry because God didn't accept his offering. He was angry at Abel, too. He was so angry that he killed his brother. God sent Cain away from his family after that. If only Cain had done as God had asked him to do. If only he hadn't become jealous and angry. If only he had been a peacemaker. Aren't you glad you don't have to kill a lamb for your worship? Aren't you glad that Jesus came and died to save you? Just pray to God and say, I'm sorry for my sins. I accept Jesus' sacrifice. Thank you for the gift of Jesus, the one who died for my sins. He will hear you, and He will accept you into His family. He will help you to be loving and kind at all times. Today's story is called A New World. The memory verse is from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Today's message is, God is love, is written upon all He has made. Have you ever been in a very dark place? No light, anywhere. That is just what it was like when God began to create our world. God looked at the dark, watery space. It was time to put His plans for earth into motion. Then God said, Let there be light. And suddenly there was a bright light. God separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day and the darkness night. This was the first day of creation. God looked around. Water covered everything. He spoke, and the waters divided, forming the sky. This was the second day of creation. God looked at the watery world. He said, Let the water under the sky be separated, and let dry ground appear. As He spoke, it happened. God called the waters seas and the dry ground land. God looked at the land and the seas, and he saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. God looked at the plants and the trees and saw that it was good. This was the third day of creation. God looked up at the sky. Let there be lights in the heavens to separate the day and the night, he said. They will light the earth and mark seasons, days, and years. God made two great lights. The sun was the brighter light to shine during the day. The moon was the weaker light to shine at night. God also made the stars. He looked at the sun, the moon, and the stars and saw that it was good. This was the fourth day of creation. God said, Let the seas and the rivers be filled with living creatures. Let birds fill the air with their songs. God looked at all the creatures that live in the water. He watched the birds. That's good, he said. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the seas, the rivers, and the sky. This was the fifth day of creation. God said, Let the land produce living creatures, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals. God looked at them and saw that they were good. 
Then God said, Let us make people in our image. They will rule over the fish of the sea, the birds, the livestock, the animals that creep on the ground, and all living things. God created man and woman. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and rule over it. I give you all the seed-bearing plants and fruits of the trees for food. I give every creature every green plant for food. God looked at everything he had made, and it was very good. This was the sixth day of creation. God made the world in six days. When he finished making it beautiful, he gave it to Adam and Eve to care for. God still gives us wonderful gifts today because he loves us. When we see the wonderful things in nature, let's remember that God's love is shown by the things he has made. Today's story is called Josiah Gets It Right. The memory verse is from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 2. It says, Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. The message is I can be a good example to others. Have you ever been in a situation where a friend tries to get you to do something you know is not right? How easy is it to say no? Josiah was surrounded by people doing bad things, but he learned to say no and changed a whole country. King Josiah was not at all like his father, King Ammon, or his grandfather, King Manasseh. His grandfather did a lot of evil things. He built places for people to worship false gods and to worship the stars in the sky. He even offered one of his sons as a burnt sacrifice to one of the gods. King Manasseh built strange idols and altars in God's temple. He hurt a lot of people who did not do anything wrong. While Manasseh was king, the scroll with God's book of the law disappeared. The priests were supposed to read from the scroll to the people every day. Without the scroll, the people could not learn about God. Josiah's father, King Ammon, did even worse things. His officers hated him so much that they killed him in his own palace. And then the people killed those officers. And that's how Josiah became king when he was still just eight years old. King Josiah was not like his father and grandfather. He really loved God. He always tried to do the right thing. As a teenager, he dedicated himself to God. When King Josiah was 20, he began to get rid of all the idols and altars to false gods. He destroyed their worship places. He tore down their altars. He had men break up the idols and grind them into powder. When King Josiah was 26, he decided to purify the land and repair the temple. He sent his royal assistant, Shephan, to see Hilkiah, the high priest. Before Shephan left, King Josiah gave him some instructions. Tell Hilkiah to gather all the money the gatekeeper priests have collected from the people at the temple, King Josiah said. Tell him that this money is to be used to repair the temple. He is to give the money to the builders. They are to pay workers and buy supplies with it. Shephan entered the temple and found Hilkiah. Hilkiah listened carefully to King Josiah's instructions. Immediately, Hilkiah told the gatekeeper priest to gather the money the temple would be repaired. At the same time, Hilkiah had news for King Josiah. He said to Shaphan, I have found the book of the law. Look at this, he said, holding up a big scroll and smiling. It was right here in the temple all along. 
Hilkiah handed the book to Shaphan. Shaphan read a few paragraphs. The king needs to see this, he exclaimed. Please take it to him, said Hilkiah. And Shaphan did. Next week, we'll discover what happened when King Josiah received the long lost book. Today's story is called Naaman and the Dirty Water. The memory verse is from John chapter 1, verse 16. It says, From the fullness of His grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Today's message is God's grace is for everyone. Can you do something for me? Can you touch your elbows? Now, I'd like for you to rub your index fingers together. Which could you feel more? Your elbow or your index fingers? There are many more nerves in your fingers than on your elbow. God gave us special nerves to help us know when we touch something hot or cold, hard, soft, or painful. People who have leprosy lose the ability to feel those things. Here's what happened to one man who had leprosy. Naaman was the commander of the army of Aram, that's Syria. He was famous for winning battles, and he was a close friend of the king. One day, this warrior got very sick. His skin began to dry up. It turned white and began to fall off. And he was losing some of his ability to feel things. Naaman had leprosy, a disease no doctor could cure. A young Israelite girl worked for Naaman's wife. She was a captive from one of Aram's raids against Israel. The girl now lived far away from home, among Israel's enemies. But she had not forgotten the great things God had done for Israel. Why doesn't my master Naaman go to ask the prophet in Israel to heal him? Elisha could ask God to cure the leprosy, she asked Naaman's wife. Naaman had seen every doctor in Aram. He tried every medicine. Nothing had worked. Elisha was his last hope. Naaman led several troops of Aramean soldiers to Israel. Wagons followed, loaded with treasure to pay for a miracle cure. What a strange sight this must have been. But Elisha didn't give Naaman any medicine. He sent his servant to tell Naaman to go wash himself, not just anywhere, but in the Jordan River, which flowed nearby. Naaman was frustrated. Elisha hadn't even talked to him. He had expected Elisha to ask the God of Israel to do something big. But all he had been told to do was to dip himself in a dirty river? Not once, but seven times? He was ready to go home. If he was going to wash himself, he would do it at home. The rivers near his home ran fast and clear, The Jordan was a muddy stream, not much wider than a camel path. Fortunately, one of Naaman's servants stopped him. If Elisha had asked you to do something big, would you have done it? Well, of course I would, Naaman thought. He had conquered entire countries. There was no big thing he couldn't do except to heal himself. The servant continued, Then what is so hard about doing such a little thing? Naaman thought about it. Then he made up his mind. He would do what God's prophet said. He went to the Jordan River. Six times he lowered himself into the water. Nothing happened. As he rose from the water a seventh time, something had changed. His pale, dry skin was gone. He was covered with the soft, healthy skin of a young man. 
Not only was he changed outside, Naaman had also changed inside. I know that the God of Israel is the only true God, he said. Only the love of God could make a captive servant girl be kind to her captors. Only the power of God could work miracles through the prophet Elisha. Only God's grace could heal a foreign warrior of his sickness. God wants to give his gifts of grace to everyone, including you. Today's story is called Lost and Found. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 18, verse 14. It says, Your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. The message is Jesus comes looking for me when I am far from him. Seven-year-old Carla was with her mother at the market. She wandered away to watch a man showing how a toy plane worked. When she looked around, her mother was nowhere in sight. Carla was afraid. She was lost, and she didn't know what to do. A long time ago, a little lamb was lost. Let's read about it. Broken bits of bushes stuck to the wool of the tired sheep as they moved along the path. The shepherd gently guided his flock of one hundred sheep. The scraping sounds of their hooves on the rocks mixed with the bleating of the young ones. It was music to the shepherd's ears. Come back over this way, he coaxed, smiling at a playful lamb. The sheepfold was in sight now. Like most of the sheepfolds in the area, the shepherd had made it secure. He had piled many rocks on top of each other. Then he placed thorn bushes along the outside of the rocks. Finally, the shepherd and the sheep reached the sheepfold gate. As each one went into the sheepfold, he checked it carefully for cuts or bruises. He ran his strong but gentle hands over every sheep. The shepherd spoke soothing words and poured medicine on sore places. The impatient animals bumped against one another, eager to get in to rest. Tired and hungry, the shepherd would be glad to reach home as well. Ninety-four, ninety-five, ninety-six, the shepherd counted. Every morning he took his sheep to pasture, and every evening he counted them as he brought them home. Ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, he kept counting. Ninety-nine? What? thought the shepherd. I'm so tired tonight that I didn't count correctly. Slowly he counted again. A frown crossed his face. Ninety-seven? Ninety-eight? Ninety-nine? His eyes checked every ewe, every ram and lamb. Oh, no! Where was the little lamb the shepherd had been calling back to the flock? It was just a short time ago. Now it was nowhere in sight. That one sheep could be anywhere. Carefully, the shepherd latched the gate to the sheepfold. He turned back the way he had just come, despite the rising storm. He called out to his missing sheep. I really have to listen, he thought. With the wind blowing like this, it will be hard to hear, especially if my lamb is hurt. The shepherd called. Then he listened. Then he called again. Carefully, the shepherd worked his way in the dark back over the rough ground. Where are you, little one? he thought. The stinging rain began to make the rocks slippery. The wild wind howled. How could the small lamb have strayed so far in such a short time? Straining once more to hear anything, he paused. Yes, he shouted into the storm. Yes, I found you. There it was, just over there, beside some rocks. The lamb lay in a crumpled heap, 
tangled in thorns and bleeding. Okay, okay, you'll be fine. The shepherd's gentle words calmed the frightened lamb. He untangled the thorns and scooped the lamb up into his arms. I'm so glad I found you, he whispered. Let's go home. The rugged shepherd hiked back over the slick trail again, but this time he smiled. This time he was holding his rescued one close. Bursting into the house, the shepherd gently laid the sheep down. He cried joyfully, I have found my lost sheep. He was so happy, he wanted to share the good news with all his friends. When we wander far from Jesus, he comes looking for us too. We are his sheep. He loves us so much, and he is very happy when all his sheep are safe at home again. Today's story is called, Whose Side Are You On? The memory verse is from John chapter 14, verse 1. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Today's message is we can worship our awesome God every day. Have you ever had part in a program? I mean a really big program in a church with hundreds of seats. You feel important practicing for the program. You mustn't make any mistakes. But then you worry so much that you nearly forget your part. That is about how Joshua felt after Moses died. Joshua walked between the rows of tents. He smiled at the families he passed, but he didn't stop to talk. He needed some exercise. He needed time alone to think. So many amazing things had happened in the past few days. Joshua quickly reached the edge of the camp. His steps got even longer as he headed back across the fields. He walked on until he had a good view of the Jordan River. Then he stopped and just looked. The river was flooded and dangerous, but the Israelites were all safely across and in the promised land. Once again, their awesome God had seen them through. The people had just finished celebrating the Passover. Soon it would be time to move on. But moving on was scary. The Israelites had powerful enemies in this new land. As Joshua slowly turned in a circle, he studied the great walled city of Jericho. Big, tall walls, thick walls. How small the Israelite camp looked with Jericho's walls towering above them. Joshua had no idea what to do. How was he going to lead the army of Israel against that mighty city? They had no fancy weapons of war. Joshua shuddered to think of his poorly trained soldiers. They were not ready for battle. Suddenly, someone stood in front of Joshua holding a sword. Joshua stepped boldly up to him. Whose side are you on? Joshua asked. Ours or our enemies? If he were an Israelite soldier, he had some explaining to do. Joshua had not told any of his soldiers to leave camp. If the stranger were an enemy, Joshua was ready to fight. Neither, the man answered. I am here as the commander of the Lord's army. Suddenly, Joshua realized that this was no ordinary soldier. This was the Lord himself. Joshua fell at his feet in worship. I am your servant, sir. What do you want me to do? Take your sandals off. You are standing on holy ground, the commander replied. Joshua removed his sandals and worshipped the Lord. What a relief! Joshua had been thinking about battle plans. He had imagined there was to be a war 
and that he would be the general in charge. But now he learned that the battle was the Lord's. The plans were already made, and the Lord was in charge. Joshua did not have to bear the heavy responsibility of leadership all alone. The Lord was here. His awesome God was with him. Today's story is called Up, Up, and Away. The memory verse is Romans 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Today's message is God's grace is the gift of eternal life. But I don't want to go to bed, complained David to his older sister. You know we all need to rest, Martha answered. We always will in this life. But when we get to heaven, we won't need to rest like we do now. How do you know? asked David. Let me tell you what I read in the Bible about Elijah and Elisha, David. Then you will understand too. God had something wonderful planned for Elijah. God wanted to take him straight to heaven without dying first. This was a special honor that God had given to only one other person, Enoch. Elisha was Elijah's assistant. Elisha knew that soon the prophet Elijah would end his work and it would be Elisha's time to carry on. Many of the prophets who worked with them also knew that Elijah would soon be leaving them. God's gentle voice had told them so. One day, Elijah took Elisha on a last journey to visit God's schools of the prophets. The prophets in these schools were asking Elisha, Did you know God is going to take Elijah today? Yes, I know, Elisha said. The thought of losing Elijah the prophet filled Elisha with sadness he was probably a little nervous about taking over Elijah's work, too. Elijah also knew that he would soon be leaving Elisha, so he gave his helper a test. At each school they visited, Elijah told Elisha, Stay here, I need to go on. But each time, Elisha insisted on going, too. He didn't want to let Elijah out of his sight. He wanted to be with him till the last moment. As the Lord surely lives, and as you live, I will not leave you, Elisha said. So the two of them walked on. Soon they came to the Jordan River. Elijah took off his coat, rolled it up, and hit the water with it. The water parted, and the two men walked across on dry ground. On the other side, it was time to say goodbye. What can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elijah asked Elisha. Elisha could have asked for a lot of things. He could have asked for money. He could have asked to be famous. But instead, he asked for a special blessing. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, he answered. He knew that the only way he could do the work he had been called to do was with extra help from God. If you see me, when I am taken up from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, not, Elijah said, and they kept walking. Then suddenly, a chariot and horses of fire appeared and separated the two men. Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha called after him, My father! My father! The chariots and horsemen of Israel! But Elijah was gone. Elisha tore his clothes to show his sorrow at losing his teacher and friend. Then Elisha saw Elijah's coat where it had fallen. He picked it up and walked back to the Jordan River. Rolling up the coat, Elisha hit the water with it, just as Elijah had done. 
Again, the waters parted, and Elisha walked across on dry ground. God had indeed given Elisha the gift of his spirit. God wants to give us good gifts too. His very best gift is the gift that he gave Elijah, the gift of eternal, forever life. And like Elisha, we have to ask for the gift. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus, just as Elisha had to keep his eyes on Elijah. And we have to believe our prayers have been answered and act in faith. We have to believe, just as Elisha did, when he hit the water with Elijah's coat. Today's story is called Walking on Water. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 18, verse 27. It says, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Today's message is by keeping our eyes on Jesus, we are saved. Do you know how to swim? Can you stay on top of the water? A long time ago, Jesus and Peter were both on top of the water, but they weren't swimming. Let's find out what happened. The disciples were in a boat together sailing across the Sea of Galilee. They had spent the day with Jesus and had seen him do something amazing. He had taken five loaves and two fish and used it to feed more than 5,000 people. How they wished Jesus would let the people crown him king. But at the end of the day, Jesus had sent the people home. And to the disciples, he said, Go ahead, go across the lake in the boat. Then Jesus had gone to a quiet place to pray. Out on the lake, dark clouds began to gather. The wind whipped angry waves against the fishing boat. The experienced fishermen strained at the oars. They pulled harder and harder, but the storm was very strong. The storm continued raging through the night. The wind pushed the waves higher and higher. By now, the disciples were a considerable distance from the shore. Shortly before morning, but while it was still dark, Jesus saw them way out on the lake and decided to go to them. Suddenly, the disciples saw someone coming across the water toward them. They cried out in fear. It's a ghost, they shouted. It frightened them to see a person coming toward them walking over the waves as if they were on solid ground. Don't be afraid, a familiar voice called. It is I, Jesus. Then Peter called out, If it's really you, Lord, tell me to come to you on the water. Come. Jesus beckoned toward his eager and sometimes reckless disciple. Looking at Jesus, Peter climbed out of the boat and began walking along the top of the water. He took several steps. Then he turned his eyes away from Jesus and looked back at the disciples. He may have been thinking, Hey, look at me. Can you believe it? As he started to turn back toward Jesus, he saw the huge waves. He felt the strong winds. He became afraid, and he started to sink. Instantly, Peter's courage was gone. Lord, he shouted, save me. Even as Peter began to sink, the strong arm of Jesus reached out to him. Jesus grasped hold of his outstretched hand and lifted him up. You of little faith, Jesus said, why did you doubt? Jesus meant that Peter needed only to keep his eyes on him. Peter needed to keep believing that Jesus had the power to save him. Jesus put his arm around Peter, and they climbed into the boat. Once Jesus was in the boat, 
the wind calmed and the waves relaxed, and the little fishing boat sailed quietly to the other side of the lake. Today, Jesus says to us, Just keep your eyes on me. I'm here to rescue you. You can't do it by yourself, but don't worry. I can save you. Just keep trusting me. Today's story is called Midnight Song Service. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 16, verse 25. It says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. The message is, I worship God when I praise Him, no matter what happens. Have you ever been blamed for something you did not do? Paul and Silas were beaten and put into prison because men told lies about them. But they still praised and worshipped God. These men are servants of the Most High God! The slave girl's voice rang out as she followed Paul and Silas down the street. She had been following them for days, shouting over and over, These men are servants of the Most High God. Suddenly, Paul turned around and commanded, In the name of Jesus, come out of her. Immediately, the evil spirit left her, and she became silent. Her masters watched in astonishment. Then their astonishment turned to anger as they realized what Paul had done. The slave girl had made them wealthy by telling people's fortunes. Now the evil spirit had left her. She would not be able to tell fortunes. She would no longer earn money for them. Her owners grabbed Paul and Silas. They dragged them to the marketplace and took them before the local judge. They accused Paul and Silas, saying, These men are Jews. They are stirring up trouble and encouraging people to go against Roman practices. An unfriendly crowd quickly gathered. Soon the judge ordered that Paul and Silas were to be beaten and thrown into jail. The jailer took them into his deepest dungeon. He put their feet in stocks and locked the door, leaving them in darkness. It was cold and damp in the cell. Their backs were bleeding and sore. The stocks dug into their ankles. They could not move. As they sat in the dark cell, Paul and Silas began to pray and sing hymns to God. The more they sang, the better they felt. They forgot about their sore backs and ankles. They worshipped God for keeping them alive. They praised God for being with them and looking after them, even in prison. The other prisoners listened in amazement. How could these men sing after being so badly beaten? Around midnight, an earthquake began to shake the prison. The prisoners' chains fell off. The cell doors flew open. They could walk out of prison. The jailer ran out of his house. He saw the open prison doors and was sure that all the prisoners had escaped. Immediately, he took out his sword to kill himself. He knew the penalty for letting prisoners escape was a painful death. He would rather take his own life. Paul called out to the jailer, Stop! We are all here! The jailer called for lights. He hurried to their cell. Yes! He shouted, They are all here! The jailer took Paul and Silas to his home. He had heard Paul and Silas singing and worshiping God in their cell. As he washed their cuts and bruises, he asked them to tell him more about the God they worshipped. The two men told the wonderful story of Jesus. They told how God had sent His Son to die for their sins. The jailer and his family listened carefully, and they decided that they wanted to follow Jesus. 
Immediately they joined with Paul and Silas in worshiping God and were baptized. The next morning, Paul and Silas were released. The judge had learned how they were Roman citizens. He knew that the law said Roman citizens could not be imprisoned without a trial, so he apologized to them. As Paul and Silas left town, they worshipped God for giving them the opportunity to witness to the jailer and his family. They continued to praise God as they traveled to tell others about Jesus. No matter where we are or what happens, we can always praise God too. Today's story is called Fire on the Mountain. The memory verse is Psalm 4, verse 3. The Lord will hear when I call to Him. Today's message is God listens and answers when I pray. Jack and Mary were spending a week at camp. They missed home so much. If they could only speak to Mom and Dad, they were sure they would feel better. They called home from the camp office. When Mom answered the phone, they were very happy. And that's how Elijah felt when God heard his prayer. Obadiah ran down the path. His robe flapped behind him. Elijah is here, he shouted to King Ahab. King Ahab's face turned red with anger. Elijah was just the man he was looking for. It hadn't rained in Israel in three years. There was almost no food to eat, and it was Elijah's fault. The king hurried to meet Elijah. There you are, Israel's troublemaker, he shouted. Elijah stood tall and unafraid. I have not made trouble for Israel, he replied. You are the troublemaker. You and your family worship Baal's idols instead of the Lord. Bring all the people of Israel and all the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel, Elijah went on. There we will see which is the true God, Baal or the Lord. So King Ahab called all the people and all the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel. Elijah stood before them. The prophets of Baal will sacrifice a bull, he said. They will put it on top of the wood on their altar, but not set fire to it. I will sacrifice a bull too, and put it on top of the wood on my altar. I will not set fire to it either. Baal's prophets will call on the name of their God. I will call on the name of the Lord. The one who answers by setting the wood on fire is the true God. All the people agreed that this was a fair test. Elijah looked at the 450 prophets. You may go first, he said. The prophets sacrificed their bull and laid it on the altar. Then they began to pray. They called and shouted to Baal all morning, but there was no answer. They began to dance wildly. They even cut themselves with knives to get Baal's attention, but still there was no answer. In the evening, Elijah said, Now it's my turn. First he repaired the altar and dug a ditch around it. Then he sacrificed his bull and laid it on top of the wood. Fill four large jars with water and pour them over the offering and the wood, he directed. People rushed to do as he asked. Do the same thing again, Elijah said. More water was poured over the altar. Do it a third time, Elijah ordered. This time the water ran all over the altar and overflowed the ditch. Then Elijah bowed his head and prayed. O oh Lord, prove today that you are the God of Israel. Instantly, fire flashed down from heaven. It burned up the bull. It burned up the wood. 
It even burned up the stones of the altar and the water in the ditch. The people of Israel fell on their faces and shouted, The Lord is God! The Lord is God! Out of Darkness The message for this week is God will help me share His message of salvation with others. The memory verse is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Akiko squinted several times as she came out into the bright sunshine from the cave she and her class had been exploring at the zoo. It felt good to come into the sunshine and the fresh air. Jonah was so happy to be on dry land again. First, he took some really deep breaths of fresh air. It smelled so good after the fishy smell of the last three days. He blinked a lot. The light probably hurt his eyes after three days inside the fish. He stretched and moved around. How good it was to be able to move freely again. Jonah rejoiced and praised God for saving his life. Suddenly, God spoke to him again. Jonah, I still want you to go to Nineveh. I need you to preach the message I will give you. Jonah still did not want to go to Nineveh, but he had promised God that he would obey him. So he went. Jonah began to preach as soon as he arrived. He told everyone God's special message for the people living in Nineveh. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. The news spread quickly throughout the city. Nineveh is going to be destroyed? How could this possibly happen? What can we do to stop it? Everyone was serious. They believed the message Jonah delivered. Soon people began to wonder, maybe if God sees that we're truly sorry for doing wrong, He will save us. Maybe He wouldn't destroy our city. Let's show Him how sorry we are. We should stop eating food for a while and not wear our regular nice clothes. This will show God that the most important thing to us right now is to talk to Him and to have Him listen to us. So everyone put on sackcloth to show how sorry they were for their sins. They fasted and prayed for forgiveness. The king of Nineveh heard what was happening in the city. He knew at once that Jonah's warning came from God. He believed the message. He decided to show God how sorry he was for all the wicked things he and his people had done. He took off his royal clothes and put on sackcloth, simple, coarse clothes. Then he sat in the dust and prayed to God. The king sent out a message to all the people in Nineveh. No man, woman, child, animal, herd, or flock is to eat or drink anything. Everyone is to wear sackcloth. We need to pray to God urgently. Let us stop being violent and unkind to one another. Maybe God will be merciful to us. Maybe He will forgive us for all the wrong things we have done and not destroy our city. Everyone did just as the king commanded. God saw the people. He could see how sorry the people of Nineveh were. He believed that they were really sorry. So God forgave them and decided not to destroy the city. The people of Nineveh were grateful. God had shown them His love and mercy, and they would change their ways. They began praising God for His love and forgiveness. Jonah had done what God had asked him to do. He had given the message God gave him. God had shown that He cared about the people of Nineveh. He wanted them to be good people. He wants us to care about others, too. He wants to use us to share His loving message of salvation with others.
Today's story is called Captured. The memory verse is from Psalm 119, verse 30. It says, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. The message is, I serve God when I help my friends make good choices. Imagine what it would be like if you suddenly had to leave your home, if you could not take anything with you. What if you had to leave your family? Daniel had to leave everything behind. It happened a long time ago. The people of Judah had forgotten about God again. Many chose to break God's laws and worship idols. But a few people still loved and worshipped the true God. Daniel's family was among them. When Daniel was born, his parents gave him a special name. They wanted to remind him always to be loyal to God. Daniel's name means God is my judge. His parents wanted him to know that it did not matter what people around him did or said. The only thing that really mattered was whether God would be happy with what Daniel did. As he grew up, Daniel decided to live for God. He put God first in everything he did. God came first in his everyday chores and in bigger things. Daniel wanted to be a servant of God, just as Samuel had been. Daniel lived in Jerusalem, the capital city of Judah. King Jehoiakim also lived in Jerusalem. The king did not worship God. He encouraged the people to worship idols. He built beautiful temples to these idols, and he led the Hebrew people in celebrating those idols' holidays. Daniel decided that no matter what happened, wicked King Jehoiakim could not force him to do wrong. Daniel was not alone. He also had three friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, who also wanted God to be first in their lives. After King Jehoiakim died, his son Jehoiachin became king. He also did not worship God. While Daniel and his friends were still young, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon attacked Jerusalem. He quickly defeated the Hebrew army and entered the city. His army captured King Jehoiachin and his family. They went into the temple Solomon had built and took away many golden treasures. As the soldiers went through the city, they took anything they wanted from people's homes. King Nebuchadnezzar took many prisoners back to Babylon. Among them were Daniel and his three friends. They were taken away from their families into a foreign land. Though torn away from home and family, they encouraged each other. Together they decided that when they arrived in Babylon, they would live for God. They would help each other make right choices. Upon arriving in Babylon, the four were given new names. Daniel became Belshazzar, Hananiah was named Shadrach, Mishael became Meshach, and Azariah became Abednego. These new names honored foreign idols, idols they would not worship. Daniel had lost his home and his family. He had even lost his name. What did he have left? Much. Nebuchadnezzar and all his armies could not take God away from Daniel. Daniel had chosen to serve and love God, and God was with Daniel no matter where he was. Daniel had everything he needed, a loving God and good friends to encourage him. God would remember Daniel and his three friends. He had a special work for them to do. God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to learn about him, these four Hebrews would lead the way. They would teach the king about the God of heaven. Today's story is called Nehemiah, God's Builder. The memory verse is from Nehemiah 
chapter 2, verse 8. It says, The gracious hand of my God was upon me. Today's message is God gives me the grace and power to do His will. How come the pastor is always asking for money? Jessica wanted to know. Because our church family has outgrown its old church and we need a new one, answered Dad. It takes money and a lot of people willing to help build, he explained. It reminds me of Nehemiah rebuilding Jerusalem's walls. I'm so glad to see you again, Nehemiah exclaimed, hugging his brother Hanani. Hanani had recently arrived with others from Judah. How are you? How are the rest of the Jews surviving back in Jerusalem? The smile left Hanani's face. Not well, he said sadly. The wall around Jerusalem has been torn down. The gates have all been burned. Enemies could walk right in and attack God's people. Nehemiah sank into a chair. Tears spilled down his cheeks. For the next few weeks, Nehemiah mourned. He fasted and he prayed. Oh, Lord, he pleaded, listen to my prayer. I am going to ask the king for a great favor. Please put it into his heart to be kind to me. One evening, Nehemiah went to work as usual. He carried the king's drink to him at the dinner table. The king looked up. Why do you look so sad tonight? he asked. Long live the king, Nehemiah exclaimed. I am sad because the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins. How can I help you? the king asked kindly. Nehemiah prayed a quick, silent prayer. Then he answered the king, Please send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Nehemiah took a big breath. He had more to ask. O oh, king, please give me a letter to the manager of your forest. Tell him to give me wood so I can build. I will rebuild the city gates and the walls and a house for myself. The king wrote the letter. Then he ordered army officers and soldiers on horseback to go with Nehemiah. They would protect him on the long, long journey to Jerusalem. Finally, Nehemiah reached Jerusalem. After staying there for three days, he rode his donkey around at night to look at the damage. He found that he couldn't even ride through some of the gates into the city. They were plugged with big rocks that had been part of the wall. Then Nehemiah spoke to the city leaders. He told them about the king and how God had helped him so far. Let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, he exclaimed. So the people began the work, and they worked hard. But their enemies made plans to attack and kill the Jews. The Jews prayed and asked God to protect them. Then Nehemiah told them to get their swords, their spears, and their bows and arrows. They would guard the wall with one hand and work with the other. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, Nehemiah encouraged them. Many times the enemies tried to stop the rebuilding work. Nehemiah prayed constantly, and God gave him the wisdom to know what to do. The work continued, and the wall was finished in just 52 days. God blessed this project in many ways. He gave Nehemiah courage to ask the king for help. He gave the workers power to carry on their rebuilding. God truly led His people. Today's story is called Rescued. The memory verse is one of my favorite memory verses. It's from Esther chapter 4, verse 14. It says, Who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. The message is God leads us to opportunities to serve Him and His people. 
Have you ever wanted to know something and mom or dad says, wait a minute? It feels as if you're going to burst with curiosity. That is probably how King Xerxes felt when he came to Esther's second banquet. King Xerxes and Haman were enjoying Esther's second banquet, but the king was curious. He wanted to know what Esther wanted and why was she taking so long to tell him. Queen Esther, he said, what is it that you want? You may have up to half of my kingdom. My king, if you truly care for me, please let me live and let my people live too, she pleaded. I have been told that we are all to be killed. If we were to be sold as slaves, I would say nothing, but we are to be destroyed. What? Who has done this? Where is he? The king shouted angrily. It is Haman, that man, said Esther, pointing at Haman. Haman stopped eating. He was frightened. He hadn't expected Esther to know. He could tell the king was very angry. The king slammed down his glass and stormed from the room. Haman knew the king would kill him, so he threw himself on Queen Esther to beg for mercy. Just then, the king walked back into the room. Haman, he roared, how dare you attack the queen, especially while I am still here. As soon as the king said the words, the king's servants rushed forward. They covered Haman's face and took him away. One of the king's servants, Harbona, spoke to the king. Haman has built a hanging platform in his own yard. He built it for Mordecai, the man who warned you about the plan to kill you. Hang Haman on it, the king ordered. King Xerxes gave Queen Esther everything Haman owned. Esther told the king that Mordecai was her cousin. She explained how Mordecai had raised her. The king sent for Mordecai. He gave Mordecai the ring that he had taken back from Haman. That ring was a symbol of the power the king gave to Mordecai. Mordecai was now the king's assistant. Esther wasn't finished with her work yet. She went back into the king's throne room and knelt before him. The king held out his scepter to her again. Esther stood. She begged him to stop Haman's plan. Please, my king, help us. Please do something to cancel Haman's orders, she cried. I can't cancel that law because it was sealed with my signet ring, he said. But I can do something. Have Mordecai tell my secretaries what to write. After they are done, he can seal the orders with the ring I gave him. Mordecai told the secretaries what to write. The Jews could fight back against anyone who tried to kill them. They could also take the property of anyone who tried. Soon the letters were done and sealed with the king's seal. The king's special messengers rushed to deliver them throughout the land. The Jews in Susa shouted for joy when they heard the new orders. Everywhere they were delivered, the Jewish people celebrated. Some other people even became Jews. From that day to this day, Jews have celebrated the Feast of Purim. For two days each year they celebrate. They remember how Esther and Mordecai served God, how they helped save God's people from death. Today's story is called Safe in the Storm. The memory verse is from John chapter 14, verse 27. It says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Do not be afraid. The message is God's grace calms my fears. Jamie and her parents were out on a lake in their canoe. Suddenly, dark, ugly clouds rolled in. It started to rain, and the wind began to blow. Hard! The canoe rocked 
up and down on the rough waves. Thunder growled and lightning flashed. Jamie was really afraid. Her parents paddled as fast as they could to get to shore. Jesus and his disciples were also caught in a storm on a lake. Let's read their story. Jesus had been teaching and healing people all day long. It was evening now, and there were still many people who wanted to be near him. He had been working long hours every day, and he was exhausted. Across the lake, it was so peaceful. The towns along the shore were quiet and small. Jesus thought it would be a nice place to go and relax. He turned to the crowd of people. We have had a good day, but it is time to rest, he said. Turning to his disciples, Jesus asked, Are you ready, friends? They nodded and climbed into the boat. Jesus joined them. As they pushed off, they noticed other fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus was so glad to be able to rest for a while. He lay down in the back of the boat. The restful sound of the waves may have helped Jesus go to sleep. Some of the disciples had been fishermen on this very lake. They loved to hear the night sounds and to feel the cool wind. But suddenly the wind changed direction, as it sometimes does on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples looked at the sky. Might be a storm, someone said. That could be, another agreed. They braced themselves as the wind howled down from the mountains. Storms often came up suddenly on the Sea of Galilee, and that is just what happened. Lightning flashed and thunder crashed. Huge waves soon began to splash into the boat. The disciples had to shout to hear one another. The disciples knew all about sailing and fishing. They knew all about boats and storms, but they didn't know what to do now. They were more than afraid. They were terrified. Then someone thought of Jesus. Jesus! Jesus! He shouted. The disciples had been trying so hard to do everything that good fishermen do in a storm that they had forgotten about Jesus. A flash of lightning cracked through the sky and they all saw Jesus, still sleeping. Sleeping? Wake up, Jesus! Save us! We're about to drown! They yelled. Jesus stood up in the rocking boat. He saw the frightened faces of the disciples. They were wet and tired and helpless. Jesus lifted his hands. Quiet, he said. Be still. And right away, the storm just stopped. No more wind, no more lightning, no more waves crashing in. Why were you afraid? He asked the disciples. Where is your faith? The storm had pushed many of the boats close together, and now every person in every boat just stared at Jesus. He was not afraid, not even a little bit. Everybody began to whisper about Jesus. What kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Today and forever, Jesus is always with us. He knows what we need and he will care for us wherever we go, whatever we do, if we will call on him as the disciples. Today's story is called Food for One More. It says the God of all grace will himself restore you and make you strong. Today's message is even though bad things happen to me, I know God loves me. Kara was hungry. His family was hungry too. They had not had any food for three days. Their father had gone to try to find something, but he came back with nothing. I'm sorry, he said. There is no rice left in our village. It has not rained for many months. Without rain, things will not grow. 
we may not have any food for a long, long time. Just when they thought they would die, God sent help. A truck with a sign that said Adra came to their village. Rice! Rice! The driver called. Each family may have one bag of rice. Soon each family in the village had enough rice to last for several days. More trucks came during the long months until the rain came. A long time ago, God took care of Elijah in a special way too. It hadn't rained in Israel in months. The fields were brown and dead. Bare trees stood like skeletons against the hot sky. The rivers and streams had dried up. And finally, even the brook Kareth where Elijah had been hiding from King Ahab ran dry. But God was still caring for Elijah. Go to Zarephath, God said. I have told a widow there to take care of you. So Elijah left Israel and traveled more than a hundred miles away to another country. There at the gate to Zarephath, a widow was gathering sticks. Would you please bring me a little water and a jar? Elijah asked her. And would you please bring me some bread too? The woman had turned to go get the water, but she stopped when Elijah asked for bread. I don't have any bread, she said. All I have are a handful of flour and a little oil. I'm gathering firewood so I can bake some bread for my son and myself. And after we eat that, we will die. Don't be afraid, said Elijah. Go home and make me a small piece of bread. Then make something for yourself and your son. For God says the oil and the flour will not be used up until he sends rain on the land. This woman was not an Israelite, but she believed in God and placed her faith in him. She decided to trust God to take care of her needs. It happened just as Elijah said it would. He went home with her and she made some bread for him. After that day, whenever she went to bake bread, there was just enough flour and oil. The flour and oil never ran out. The miracle God worked to save Elijah also saved the lives of this woman and her son. Sometime later, this woman's son became sick and died. Her first thought was that God was punishing her. What do you have against me? She cried out in her sorrow. Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Of course, God had not caused the boy to die. God's grace brings the gift of life. God's grace had kept all three of them from dying during the famine. Elijah had been staying in an upstairs room at the widow's house. He took the boy to that room and cried to God, O oh Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. God quickly answered Elijah's prayer. At once, the boy came back to life. God cares about the problems in your life, too. Even though bad things sometimes happen, God still loves you. He wants you to trust Him. He will take care of your needs, just as He cared for Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Today's story is called Nine Times No. The memory verse is from Psalm 103, verse 2. It says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Today's message is We Worship God When We Trust Him in Every Situation. Charlotte and her older sisters were playing outside. She stood between her sisters and fell back to one sister, and then fell forward to the other. She trusted her sisters to catch her, and they did. 
A long time ago, the Israelites learned that they could trust God. Moses made the long journey back across the desert from Midian to Egypt. Somewhere in the desert, his brother Aaron came toward him. God has sent me to help you, said Aaron. Together they would face Pharaoh. After meeting with the Israelite leaders, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh's palace. Moses spoke bravely, I have a message from God to you. God says, Let my people go to hold a festival for me in the desert. Pharaoh answered, Who is this God? I do not know him, and I will not let the Israelites go. Moses replied, Let the people go. Otherwise, God may respond with plagues or the sword. But Pharaoh refused and dismissed Moses and Aaron. Then he told the overseers to make the Israelites work harder. Each day, Pharaoh went to worship at the river Nile. God sent Moses to the river. There, Moses said to Pharaoh, If you will not listen to God and let the Israelites go, something terrible will happen. Water will turn into blood. All the fish will die. Pharaoh refused. Then Moses stretched out his staff, and the river water turned to blood. But Pharaoh still refused to change his mind. Seven days later, Moses again asked Pharaoh to let the Israelites go and worship in the desert. Again, Pharaoh said no. Moses responded, This is what the Lord says. I will send a plague of frogs. They will be everywhere, in your bed, in your food, in your ovens. And it happened. Frogs appeared everywhere. Pharaoh sent for Moses. Take away these frogs, and I will let the people go, he promised. Soon great mounds of dead frogs littered the country. But as soon as the frogs died, Pharaoh changed his mind. Again, God sent Moses to Pharaoh. Again, Pharaoh said no. And Moses promised, God will send a plague of gnats. Soon gnats were everywhere, plaguing people and animals. Pharaoh's advisors said, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh would not listen to them either. Then God told Moses to go to Pharaoh when he worshipped his gods at the river. Moses asked again, but Pharaoh still refused. So Moses delivered another message. God will send swarms of flies. The air will be black with them. And it happened just as Moses had said. But there were no flies where the Israelites lived. So Pharaoh sent for Moses and said, I will let your people go. Just do not go far. And as soon as the flies disappeared, Pharaoh changed his mind again. Moses went to Pharaoh again. God says, If you continue to refuse to let my people go, he said, all your animals will get sick and die. The next day, the Egyptian livestock died, but Pharaoh still refused. Next, God told Moses to throw ashes into the air before Pharaoh. He did, and the Egyptians broke out in big boils and sores. But still, Pharaoh would not listen. Then God told Pharaoh to let the Israelites go, or God would send a terrible hailstorm. The hail came all over Egypt, except where the Israelites lived. When the storm came, Pharaoh admitted that he had sinned and that God was righteous. He sent for Moses and said, I will let the people go. Just ask God to stop this storm. But when the storm was over, Pharaoh changed his mind again. God sent two more plagues. Locusts came and ate up all the green plants. Then three days of darkness. It was so dark that the Egyptians could not see each other. But the Israelites had light. Still, Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. 
Nine times God sent plagues on Egypt. The Egyptians worshipped the river Nile and the creatures involved in the plagues. God proved to them that their gods could not help them. Nine times God gave Pharaoh an opportunity to recognize that the God of the Israelites is the true God. And nine times Pharaoh refused. Nine times God showed the Israelites that He was their God, that they could trust Him completely. How did they know? All through the plagues, God kept them safe. Today's story is called Judging Jesus. The memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and by his wounds we are healed. The message is, I praise Jesus for saving me. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples ran away. The mob followed the soldiers down the hill. They made an evil parade with torches lighting the way. John watched as the parade moved across the brook. What am I doing? John asked himself. I should follow the mob to find out what will happen to Jesus. He and Peter followed the mob toward the home of Annas, toward the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest. When they arrived at Caiaphas' palace, the priest let John in because they knew him. John turned and saw Peter walking near the gate. Peter was hiding in the dark outside. He did not want people to see him there. John went back to the woman at the gate. Please let my friend in, he said, and she did. She kept watching Peter as he moved to the fire in the courtyard. Finally, she asked him, Aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? Oh, no, said Peter as he turned to warm himself. Just then, Jesus was led onto the big porch beside the courtyard. John pushed as close as he could. There were bruises on Jesus' face. He walked slowly, painfully, as if his whole body ached. Caiaphas began to ask Jesus what he believed even though he already knew. Jesus said, I have always talked openly. Your people know me. A big muscular guard frowned. He swung at Jesus' face and hit him hard. Jesus was in pain, yet he stood firm like a king. At the gate, the servant girl said, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter strongly denied it. There was more questioning back near the fire. Aren't you one of his disciples? Again, Peter strongly denied knowing Jesus. Then a rooster crowed. Peter had denied knowing Jesus three times. Peter looked up and saw Jesus looking at him. There was no anger in the look, just love. Then Peter rushed out the gate of the courtyard. The trial went on. Caiaphas asked Jesus another question. Jesus calmly said, You have said it right. I am the Son of God. Caiaphas leaped from his golden throne. That's it! He screamed. Jesus says he is like God. He was so angry that he ripped his beautiful priestly robe from top to bottom. Some who saw it thought, This is against the law. The high priest is to die if he tears his robe. They will kill Caiaphas. But the mob didn't notice Caiaphas. They were too busy shouting, Death! Death to Jesus! Take him to Pilate! Put him to death! People were pushing at Jesus, poking him and hitting him. Soldiers ran in and grabbed Jesus, pulling him away. Roman soldiers formed a circle around him and hurried him toward Pilate's palace. Within a few hours, Jesus would go to Pilate, to Herod, and back to Pilate. Jesus would be beaten and mocked through it all. What suffering! He willingly suffered that you and I may know 
God's love. Today's story is called Loving the Unlovable. The memory verse for today's story is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. It says, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Today's message is God wants me to include those who get left out. When Raphael and his family moved to a new neighborhood, he felt lost. He felt lonely at his new school. Then one day, a student came up to him in the hall and said, Hi, I'm Corinne. I've seen you, but I don't know you yet. Come sit with me and my friends during lunch. Someone else included people who were left out. Jesus. He was friends with everyone. The dinner party at Simon's house was the place to be. Simon was one of the leading Jewish rulers, and Jesus had healed his leprosy. To show his thanks, Simon planned a huge feast for Jesus. Everybody who was anybody came. Mary was there, too. She was the kind of person people talked about, not to. Everyone knew she was a sinner. Everyone knew Jesus had ordered seven unclean spirits out of her. She probably wasn't even invited to the party. But since she followed Jesus everywhere, no one stopped her. They just wanted her to stay quietly in the background. Mary knew about her reputation. She knew she was not accepted in polite company, but she wanted to show Jesus how thankful she was. She had with her a small alabaster jar of perfumed ointment. When no one was looking, she poured the ointment over Jesus' head and feet. Her tears of love and thanks flowed into the ointment. Quietly, she knelt down and wiped Jesus' feet with her long, flowing hair. Probably no one would have noticed if it weren't for the fragrance. It smelled so good and quickly filled the whole room. People started talking. That stuff is expensive, they whispered to each other. It cost what a man earns in a whole year. If she sold it, the money could have been given to the poor. What a waste. Simon had a different thought. If Jesus really were a prophet, he wouldn't let that woman touch him. She's a terrible sinner. Mary was caught, and she was embarrassed. Jesus knew what Simon was thinking. He also knew what Mary was feeling. Leave her alone, he told the whisperers. You will always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. She has done a beautiful thing for me. Then Jesus turned to Simon. Two men owed money to the same money lender, he said. One man owed 500 denarii. The other owed 50 denarii. The money lender knew that neither man could pay him back, so he canceled their debts. Which one do you think loved him more? I suppose the one who had the bigger debt, said Simon. You're right, said Jesus. When I came into your house, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't pour oil on my head. You didn't even give me a kiss of peace. But this woman did all that and more. She has been forgiven for a lot, and she loves me a lot. Jesus showed respect for Mary, the least acceptable person at the party. He even praised her efforts above Simon's. The last person anyone would have expected became a good example. That kind of respect took Mary by surprise. She was used to being unloved and left out. Now she was being appreciated. We all know people like Mary, people who get ignored or picked on. Jesus treated Mary kindly. He wanted her to feel wanted 
and respected. He wants to include every person in his family, just as he did Mary. And he wants us to treat one another the same way he treats us. Today's story is called, Do You Love Me? The memory verse is from John chapter 21, verse 16. It says, Again, Jesus said, Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Today's message is we serve God when we take care of others. Have you ever had someone ask you the same question over and over? Didn't they hear my answer the first time? You may have thought. Three times Jesus asked Peter the same thing. Peter was restless. I'm going fishing, he told the other disciples. At least fishing was doing something. It had been a while since Jesus had been crucified. He had appeared to them twice since his resurrection, and it was wonderful to see him and to know that he was alive. Jesus had not mentioned that Peter had denied him three times. Peter was still so embarrassed. He was ashamed of what he had done. He had asked God to forgive him, but he may have thought that Jesus would no longer trust him. How much do the other disciples know about it? He may have wondered. Do they know how sorry I am? Some of the other disciples decided to go fishing with Peter. So just as the sun was going down, they stepped into Peter's boat. The wind swept them across the water. They stayed out all night, but caught nothing. What a waste of a night's work, Peter probably thought. Early in the morning, just as the sun was coming up, they returned to shore without any fish. As their boat drew closer to the shore, they noticed a man standing on the beach. The man called out, Have you caught any fish? The disciples called back, No, none at all. The man called out again, Throw your net on the right side of the boat. You will find some. Perhaps they wanted to please the man, or perhaps they just wanted to try once more. Whatever the reason, they did what the man said. Immediately their nets were full of fish. They couldn't even haul their nets into the boat. Suddenly, John recognized the man and called out to Peter, It is the Lord. Peter was so happy to see Jesus again. Jesus was waiting for them. The boat was very close to shore, so Peter decided not to wait. He jumped out of the boat and hurried through the water to Jesus. The others followed in the boat. When they reached shore, they found that Jesus had made a fire. He was cooking some of the fish for their breakfast. They soon enjoyed the fish and some bread. After breakfast, Jesus turned to Peter. Do you truly love me more than these? He asked. Peter immediately answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus looked into Peter's eyes and said quietly, Feed my lambs feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked, Peter, do you truly love me? And Peter replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus replied, take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus asked, Peter, do you love me? Peter didn't know what to think. Perhaps he wondered if Jesus didn't believe him. And why did Jesus ask three times? Was it because Peter had denied Jesus three times? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him three times. With a heavy heart, Peter answered, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said again, Take care of my sheep. Finally, Jesus said to Peter, Follow me. Peter realized then that Jesus had forgiven him. Jesus still wanted Peter to follow him. Why did Jesus ask Peter these questions in front of the other disciples? 
so they would know that he had forgiven Peter. Jesus also wanted to teach Peter a lesson in patience, sympathy, and forgiveness. Peter would need all of that in the future. He had a work to do for Jesus. He would lead and care for many new believers of Jesus during the rest of his life. Jesus also wanted us to know something special. There is only one thing we must do to follow and serve Him, and that is to love Him with all our hearts. And when we really do, we will want to take care of others, too. Today's story is called Hiding from God. The memory verse is from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Today's message is God still loves us and will forgive us if we are truly sorry when we do something wrong. Have you ever done something wrong and been afraid to say that you did? Adam and Eve must have felt that way. It probably happened like this. Adam and Eve were happy in their garden home. The best part of the day was the evening, when God often came and talked with them face to face. On the seventh day Sabbath, they spent the whole day with God. They probably never wanted Sabbath to end. God told them to enjoy every tree in the garden except one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, you must never eat the fruit. If you do, you will surely die. One day, Eve was walking through the garden and came near the tree. As she looked at it, a beautiful creature, a serpent, began to talk to her. Is it true God has told you that you can't eat from any tree in this garden? The serpent asked. Eve knew she should go away from that place, but she didn't. Instead, she answered the snake. God told us we can eat from all the trees in the garden except this one. We are not to eat its fruit. We are not even to touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake answered, You won't die. You will be as smart as God is. Eating the fruit will make you wise. Eve reached out and touched the fruit. Nothing happened. Then she took some fruit and bit into it. It tasted good. She picked more and gave it to Adam. When he knew Eve had eaten some, he ate some too. As soon as Adam took a bite, something happened to them. They realized that they were naked. They were ashamed and afraid. They knew they had done wrong. They ran to a fig tree and used its leaves to cover themselves. That evening when they heard God walking through the garden, they hid. They were ashamed to meet Him. When God found them, He asked, Why are you hiding? We heard you in the garden, Adam told God, and we were afraid. God knew what they had done, and he was sad. They would have to face the consequences. He told them that they would have to leave the beautiful garden. They would begin to get old and eventually die. Life outside the garden would be hard. Weeds would grow. There would be thorns. They would have to work hard to grow their food, and everything else would die too, the plants and the animals. Even though Adam and Eve had chosen to disobey him, God did not leave them alone. He told them about his plan to make things right. He would send his son into the world. His son would die and take the blame for all the things they did wrong. Adam and Eve were very sad and very sorry for what they had done. God forgave Adam and Eve for disobeying Him. He will forgive you too when you do wrong, if you ask Him, and if you are really sorry. He wants to help you do what is right, 
and He wants you to be ready to go to heaven when Jesus comes again. Today's story is called Escape from Prison. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 5, verse 29. It says, Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. Today's message is, At church we learn that Jesus is most important. It was too much! The leaders of the Jews could not believe what was happening. Didn't we order Peter and the other apostles to quit teaching about Jesus? They asked each other. But they are still teaching, and now they are doing miracles. Crowds of sick people stream into the city every day, and everybody is being healed. The temple leaders were angry. The high priest and the Sadducees believed that they had to stop the apostles. So they arrested them and sent them to prison. They thought that that would give the apostles some time to think. Maybe then they would stop all this talk about Jesus. They had to stop telling people that Jesus rose from the dead. The Sadducees did not believe that anyone could come back to life. They did not believe in angels either. God must have smiled about that. That night, He sent an angel to let the apostles out of prison. Go back to the temple and tell the people all about this new life in Jesus, the angel said. Of course, the apostles happily obeyed, and very early in the morning, they went to the temple and began teaching again. But others were busy that morning, too. The high priest and the Sadducees called all the other important leaders together. They sent orders to the prison to have the apostles brought to them. In a short time, the men who had been sent to the prison came back. Their eyes were wide with fear. We found the jail securely locked, they reported. The guards were standing at the doors, but, but, but we found no prisoners inside. The leaders shook their heads. What now? Then word came in from the streets. Look, the men you put in prison are back in the temple courts, and they are teaching the people again. Grinding their teeth, the leaders sent more men to the temple. When the apostles finally stood before the leaders, the high priest glared at them. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name he shouted. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you are trying to make us guilty of this man's blood. You must stop. The apostles answered plainly, We must obey God rather than men, they said. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, the same Jesus you had killed by hanging him on a cross. God has made him a prince and a savior. He will give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. The leaders shook with anger. They really wanted to have the apostles put to death, but they could not. Too many people believed that these were God's men, and through it all, the apostles stood firm. Jesus was more important to them than their own lives. Today's story is The Day Jesus Cried. The memory verse is Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Carry each other's burdens. Today's message is God wants me to care about others. Has someone you loved died? Have you lost a friend or a pet? One day, Jesus visited some friends who shared bad news with him. What do you think he did then? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived in Bethany, not far from Jerusalem. These two sisters and their brother were close friends of Jesus. He often stayed with them when he was in Bethany. They knew his power, so when Lazarus became sick, Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus. But Jesus did not hurry. 
he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he started for Bethany. By the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Jesus knew Lazarus would die. He planned to raise Lazarus from the dead to prove once and for all that he, Jesus, was the Son of God. But Lazarus's poor sisters didn't know about Jesus' plan. All they knew was that Lazarus had been sick, and they had sent for Jesus, and he hadn't come. When Martha heard that Jesus was nearing the village, she went out to meet him. If you had been here, my brother would not have died, she said. But there was still a glimmer of hope in her. I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask, she added. I am the resurrection and the life, said Jesus. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, said Martha. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. She had new hope in her heart, and she ran and got her sister. The teacher is here, she told Mary. He is asking for you. Mary jumped up and hurried outside the village to meet Jesus. When she saw him, she fell at his feet and cried the same thing Martha had. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus knew what was going to happen next. He would ask for the stone to be rolled away from Lazarus's tomb. He would pray to his Father in heaven and then call Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus would come walking out, still wrapped in burial cloths. In just a few minutes, these sisters would have their brother back, and they would be happier then. But right now, two of his best friends were heartbroken and one of them was weeping at his feet. His own tender heart was moved, and Jesus cried. He shared Mary and Martha's loss. He felt the sorrow they were feeling, and he cried with them. Here, Jesus gave us an example of bearing one another's burdens. He showed us how to treat others. He wants us to put ourselves in the place of others to feel what they are feeling. Just as Jesus shared his friend's loss, we are to share one another's joys and sorrows. Today's story is called Payday at the Vineyard. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 10, verse 34. It says, God does not show favoritism. Today's message is God wants us to treat others as he treats us. John was busy raking leaves in his yard. After an hour, his friend Sam came by and offered to help. John found another rake and the two boys worked together. Two hours later, they were done with the job. John's father was very pleased. He gave each boy some money to say thank you. John and Sam received the same pay, even though John had worked one hour more. John thought to himself, This is not fair. Then he remembered a story Jesus told about fairness. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. In Jesus' time, men would gather in the marketplace at six o'clock in the morning. There, they would wait for someone to come and hire them. One morning, a vineyard owner came looking for workers. At six o'clock, he hired some men. He agreed to pay them the usual pay for 12 hours of work. At nine o'clock, he came back to the marketplace. He saw men still standing around. Go work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you what is right, he told them. 
at noon, and at three o'clock he hired more men. Again, at five o'clock in the afternoon, just one hour before quitting time, he did the same thing. At six o'clock in the evening, the landowner told his foreman to pay the workers. He should begin with those who were hired last, and end with those who were hired first. First, the foreman paid those who had only worked an hour. He gave them a full day's pay. Then he paid those who worked for three hours. He gave them a full day's pay too. Those who were hired first began to smile. They were sure they would receive more. After all, they had worked longer and harder than the others. It would only be fair, wouldn't it? But when they received their pay, their smiles turned to frowns. They got the same pay as everyone else. Wait, they complained. Those men only worked an hour. You made them equal to us. We did most of the work, and in the heat of the day too. I'm not being unfair to you," said the landowner. "You agreed to work for the usual pay for a day's work. That's what I'm paying you. I can do what I want with my money. Don't be jealous because I'm generous." Then Jesus said it again: "The last will be first, and the first will be last." Do you like that story? Do you think it's fair? You may not. And that's the point Jesus was making. God does not treat us the way we deserve. God treats us much, much better than that. It's His grace that saves all of us: those who accept Him at the last minute, and those who accept Him early. God doesn't have to save any of us. He does it because He loves us. Do you treat others in God's family the same way God has treated you? When someone is mean to you, do you treat them with love and kindness? Try to treat others as God treats us. In that way, you show that God is much, much better than simply fair. Hello, everyone. It's Aunt Fernita, and we're studying Lesson Ten, the Runaway Prophet. The message for this week is: People in God's family share His love with others. The memory verse is from Psalm chapter forty, verse eight: "I desire to do Your will, O my God." Come, Jonathan," called Mother. "I need your help." Jonathan frowned. He was having fun riding his bike, and he didn't want to answer. Speeding up, he turned the corner and rode away from home. Maybe his mother would think he hadn't heard her. Later, he thought, "I'll help her later." A long time ago, God asked a friend to do something for him. What do you think it was? Jonah, God called. I need your help. You know about Nineveh, that big city. Many of the people living there are wicked. I can no longer ignore all the wrong things they do. Go and tell them they must change. Jonah knew he should do what God wanted, but Nineveh was a big city. The city was so big it would take him three days just to walk from one end to the other. Jonah did not like the people of Nineveh. Besides, what if the people listened to him and changed? What if God decided to spare them because they repented? Then people would think he is a false prophet. Maybe they would even laugh at him if he told them that they would be destroyed, and they were not. So Jonah thought, "No, God really couldn't expect me to go to Nineveh." So Jonah ran away. Jonah hurried to Joppa, the nearest seaport. There he found a ship just ready to sail for Tarshish. 
He didn't really care where the ship was going, as long as it wasn't anywhere near Nineveh. Quickly, he paid his fare and went on board. Soon after Jonah boarded, the ship sailed away. After watching the shoreline disappear, Jonah felt safe. He searched for a quiet place away from the sailors and was soon fast asleep. Jonah did not feel the boat begin to rock. At first, the rocking was gentle, but then the waves got higher and higher. The storm clouds gathered. The sails began creaking in the wind. Jonah was sleeping so soundly he didn't even hear the howling wind or the crashing thunder. This ship is going to break up. We will all drown, the sailors called to one another. Desperately, they tried to lighten the ship. Cargo, supplies, everything movable was thrown overboard. Still, Jonah kept on sleeping. The captain looked for passengers and came across Jonah still asleep. How can you sleep through this? The captain screamed at Jonah. Wake up! Call on your God! We are drowning! Pray, and maybe he will help us! Then one sailor shouted to the other, Let's cast lots. That'll tell us who's responsible for all this trouble. This isn't a natural storm. Someone's God is angry. Jonah tried to slip into the shadows, but the sailors would not let him. You have to take part in the lots, they demanded. Reluctantly, Jonah joined them. He knew who was responsible. When the lots were cast, everyone else knew too. Who are you? demanded the sailors. What did you do? Where do you come from? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew. I worship the God of heaven. My God created the earth, the sea, and all that lives. If only Jonah had taken that message to Nineveh. But Jonah chose to forget that he could never really run away from God. As a result, the people on the ship suffered. We are all part of a community. Everything we do affects others. When we do what God wants, we can make good things happen in our community. We can share His love with others. Today's story is called, I'm Listening. The memory verse is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9. It says, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The message is, I will listen and answer when God speaks to me. Have you ever heard your mom calling and pretended that you didn't hear? The opposite happens in today's story. Samuel heard someone calling him and tried to answer. The little boy was an answer to his mother's prayers. Hannah had prayed for a son. She had promised God that she would give her child to him to be his servant. And so it was that she took her little boy Samuel to live with priest Eli in the tabernacle. Samuel was very helpful and was like a son to Eli. Samuel became a joy and a delight for the old priest. And Samuel loved the old man. In those days, the Lord did not speak directly to people very often. But God would soon speak to Samuel in a most unusual way. Eli's eyesight was failing. He was almost blind. And he really needed Samuel's help. One night, Eli and Samuel had gone to their rooms and were about to fall asleep when suddenly Samuel heard a voice calling, Samuel! Samuel sat up with a start. A lamp still burned nearby. Did Eli need him? Samuel got up and went to Eli's room. Here I am, he said to Eli. You called me? But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Samuel quietly returned to his bed. I'm sure Eli called, he may have thought as he closed his eyes. Again, Samuel heard a voice. Samuel! 
Samuel. The boy sat up and looked around. Then he scurried out of bed and dashed to Eli's side. I am here, he said. You called me? No, Samuel, I didn't call you, responded Eli. Go back to bed. So Samuel returned to his bed. I'm sure I heard Eli, he likely thought as he snuggled under his blanket again. Samuel, Samuel, that voice again. Samuel jumped up and rushed to Eli again. I am here, he spoke softly. You called me. No, Eli answered. I didn't call you. Then Eli realized that the Lord must be speaking to Samuel. So he told Samuel, Go to bed. If he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord. I am your servant, and I am listening. This time, when Samuel heard the voice call him, Samuel! Samuel! He answered as Eli had told him, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said, I am going to do something that will shock those who hear it. I will do to Eli and his sons everything I have promised, because his sons have done terrible things. Samuel was shocked. He probably didn't sleep much the rest of the night. In the morning, he went quietly about his duties. He was afraid to tell Eli what God had said. But soon Eli approached Samuel and asked, What did the Lord say to you? Don't hide it from me, Samuel. So Samuel revealed all that the Lord had said, and Eli knew that God had made Samuel his messenger. God gave Samuel the first of many messages Samuel was to deliver to God's people in the years to come. Samuel truly was God's servant throughout all his life, and God wants you to serve him too. You can be God's messenger. You can share with others what God says as you learn more of His Word, the Bible. Today's story is called Jesus the Servant. The memory verse is from John chapter 13, verse 14. It says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Today's message is we show God's love when we serve others. Do some chores you have to do seem unpleasant? Jesus did one of those jobs for his disciples. He wanted to show his disciples how much he loved them and how they should serve others. Jesus and his disciples had gathered to celebrate Passover. Jesus knew this was the last meal he would eat with them before he died, and there was still so much he wanted to teach them. His disciples could feel that something was about to happen, but they were expecting Jesus to take the throne and to become the ruler of the country. They were waiting for him to set up a kingdom on earth, and each wanted the very best place in it. Each one of them believed he deserved the most important position. In those days, a servant usually washed the guest's feet before dinner, especially an important dinner like the Passover. And everything was there in the room where they had gathered, the pitcher, the bowl, the towel, everything except the servant. Dinner was ready. If someone would just come and wash their feet, they could begin the Passover feast. The room grew quiet as they waited. Uncomfortably quiet. None of the disciples would look at the others. Each one of them knew what needed to be done, but none of them would do it. I'm not going to do the work of a servant, each one probably thought. After all, I deserve the most important job in Jesus' new kingdom. I am not going to get down on my knees and wash the other's feet. 
Jesus knew what his disciples were thinking. He desperately wanted to teach them that his kingdom was built on love. The way to show his love to others was to unselfishly put others first. Jesus' disciples had spent three years with him, but they still had not learned the most important lesson. Greatness in God's kingdom comes through humble service to others. So Jesus gave them one last example. Quietly, he got up from the table and took off his coat. He wrapped the towel around his waist. He poured water into the bowl. Without saying a word, he began to wash the disciples' feet. He didn't lecture. He just did the job they each thought they were too important to do. Can you imagine how embarrassed they felt? He was their master, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, and he was doing the work of a servant. It was more than Peter could bear. Lord, you are not going to wash my feet, he exclaimed. If I don't wash you, you have no part with me, Jesus replied. Jesus was washing more than the dust from his disciples' feet. He was washing away their pride and selfishness. He was teaching them to serve one another. He was showing them how to reach those to whom they would soon be preaching the good news. Jesus finished and sat down. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked his disciples. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have given you an example. You should do as I have done for you. Serve others, Jesus was saying. Don't be ashamed to do anything that will show my love. Humility is a sign of greatness. That night, Jesus' disciples learned a lesson they would never forget. Jesus wants us to learn that lesson too. When Jesus was finished, he gave another promise. He said, I will not have another service like this until I share it with you in heaven. Someday we will all be with Jesus and we will share in that special service. But for now, Jesus wants to help all of us live a life of helpfulness to others. That's one way to show God's love to others. Today's story is called, In the Image of God. The memory verse is from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created Him. Male and female, He created them. Today's message is God surrounds me with His gifts of love. God created a beautiful and perfect world in six days. Then He created two very special people to enjoy it. Let's read about it. God had created the sun and the moon. He had created the plants, fish, birds, and animals. He looked at everything and saw that it was good but his creation was incomplete. It was time to create people. Making people would be different from making the creatures and the plants. People were to be in God's own image, and they were to rule over the animals. So God formed a man out of the dust of the ground. He carefully made the man's fingers and toes, his eyes, ears, and mouth. When God finished modeling the man, he blew into the man's nose. The man began to breathe. He opened his eyes and looked around. God smiled at the first man and called him Adam. There was a lot to do that day. God told Adam that he was in charge of all the animals. His first job was to name them. Adam probably laughed when he saw the monkeys hanging from the trees, chattering to each other. 
He may have grinned when he saw the elephants with their long trunks and big flapping ears. He probably stopped to pet the shy deer and play with a black bear. God said, It is not good for Adam to be by himself. I will make a mate for him. Adam had probably noticed that he was by himself. He may have noticed that all the animals had a partner. They had creatures like themselves to keep them company. They could communicate and share things, but there had been no one for him. So God made Adam fall into a deep sleep. Then he took one of Adam's ribs and created a woman. When Adam woke up, God brought the woman to him. Adam was pleased. He said, She was made from my bones and my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. And Adam called the first woman Eve. At the end of the day, God looked at everything he had created. He saw the plants, the trees, the fish, the animals, and Adam and Eve. It had been a good day. And God said, This is very good. Something smells fishy. The message for this week's lesson is God helps me to admit my mistakes and make them right. The memory verse is from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He will forgive us. Sven walked slowly into the kitchen. He really hated doing the dishes, and he had put it off for as long as he could. However, Mama would be home soon, and she was expecting a clean kitchen when she came. He walked to the sink, took a dismal look around, and slowly turned the faucet on. One of God's friends was asked to do something he did not want to do. This may be just how he felt. Jonah had run away from God. He did not care where he went, just as long as it was far away from Nineveh. Now he was on a boat going toward Tarshish, which was about as far from Nineveh as he could get. How wrong Jonah was! God knew exactly where he was and what he was doing. God sent a terrible storm to rock that boat. The sailors were terrified. They had never seen such a storm. They cast lots and learned that Jonah's God had sent the storm. He admitted it. They asked, What have you done? Why is your God so angry with you? I'm running away from what he wants me to do. Jonah answered. He wanted me to go to Nineveh, but it is such a dreadful place. I didn't want to go there, so I ran away from the Creator of the land and sea. The only way to calm the storm is to throw me overboard. The men did not want to throw Jonah overboard. Instead, they tried to row back to land. They could not. The waves got higher, the wind blew harder, the lightning flashed, and the thunder roared. The sailors even tried harder to row the boat to shore, but they got nowhere. Are you sure that throwing you overboard is going to end this terrible storm? The sailors asked Jonah. Yes, answered Jonah. You must throw me overboard. The men believed Jonah, and they pleaded with God. Do not hold us guilty of killing this man, they prayed. Then they threw Jonah over the side. As he disappeared under the waves, the wind immediately stopped blowing. The thunder and lightning stopped. The sea became calm. The sailors could hardly believe it. Immediately they prayed to Jonah's God, promising to serve him. Jonah sank deeper and deeper into the water, it was cold and wet and dark. Suddenly it felt different. He was not sinking anymore. He was inside something damp, warm, and clammy. It smelled terrible. 
God had prepared a big fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah began to think about what he had done. He knew God still loved him, even though he had run away. So from inside the fish, he prayed, Thank you for hearing my prayer. As I sank beneath the waves, I was sure I was going to die. I could feel the seaweed around my legs, and it was getting harder to breathe. Thank you for saving me. You have given me back my life. I know you are the most wonderful God. You are the God of power, unlike the gods of wood and stone. I will do whatever you want me to do. My life belongs to you. After three days, the big fish spat Jonah out on dry land. The sailors suffered because of Jonah, but they also learned about the true God, the God who created the land and the sea. God still loved Jonah, and Jonah was still part of God's family. God still had work for him to do. God loves us in just the same way. We belong to Him even when we make mistakes. Today's story is called, Who is My Neighbor? The memory verse is from Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. The message is everyone is included in God's love. Jake sat down in an empty chair in the Sabbath school room. The other children were talking together, but Jake sat alone. He didn't know anyone. He felt out of place. No one spoke to him. His family had just arrived from a faraway country. He spoke with an accent. It hurt to be lonely. Why wouldn't anyone speak to him? In today's Bible lesson, Jesus told a story about a man who was hurting and needed help. Who would pay attention to him? The young lawyer stood up. He straightened his belt and cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Teacher, what shall I do to have eternal life? What do the scriptures say? asked Jesus. That I should love God with all of my heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love my neighbor as much as I love myself. The lawyer replied, You're right, Jesus said. Keep doing these things and eternal life is yours. But just who is my neighbor? questioned the young man. Let me tell you a story, said Jesus, smiling. Once there was a man who left Jerusalem to travel to Jericho. Along the way, robbers attacked him. They beat him. They took his money and clothes and left him lying in the hot sun, half dead. It just so happened that a Jewish priest was traveling the same way. A little later, he came to the place where the injured man was lying. Quickly, he looked away. He may have thought, Oh no, that man's in great pain. I can't tell if he is a Jew or not. I better hurry on. And the priest crossed to the other side of the road and went on his way. Soon a Levite who worked in the temple came by. Curious, he stopped to look at the wounded man. Poor man, he may have thought. He looks terrible. I really ought to help him but I don't want to get involved. I wish that I had not come this way. Surely someone else will help him. And the Levite hurried down the road. It wasn't long until a Samaritan came by. Jesus looked around. He knew that the Jewish people hated the Samaritans. But he continued. The Samaritan felt sorry for the poor man and stopped right away to help him. He gave him water he put medicine on the man's wounds. He gently helped him up on his own donkey. Carefully, he took the injured man to the nearest inn, where he stayed with him through the night. In the morning, he gave the innkeeper money to take care of the hurt man. 
Let me know if that isn't enough, said the Samaritan. I'll gladly pay you more when I come this way again. Jesus looked into the young lawyer's eyes. Now, my friend, he quietly asked, which of the three was a neighbor to the wounded man? The one who helped him, the young man answered quietly. Jesus spoke kindly, Go, go now and be that kind of neighbor. Today, Jesus wants us to be good neighbors too. In God's eyes, every person is equal. Every person is someone to be loved and accepted no matter where they come from, how they sound when they speak, the color of their skin. This week, ask Jesus to make your heart like His. Ask Him to help you show His love to your neighbor. Today's story is called, Where Are the Nine? The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 103, verses 2 and 3. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Today's message is we worship God when we thank Him. Have you ever had the chicken pox? I have. If so, you probably had to stay home from school for a long while. If you had gone to school, some other children might have caught the disease from you. That's because chicken pox is contagious. People can easily catch it. In today's lesson, we learn about 10 men who had a contagious disease. One day, Jesus and the disciples were walking to Jerusalem. They traveled a road on the border between Galilee and Samaria. Just as they were entering a village, ten men called out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus looked around. He saw the lepers' shacks built outside the village. He saw men dressed in ragged clothing. He saw bandages wound around their feet and hands. And instantly, Jesus knew that these men were lepers. Jesus felt very sad when he saw the lepers. He knew how much they wanted to be well again. Long before Jesus lived on the earth, Moses had given some rules about leprosy. When the first sores of leprosy appeared on a leper's skin, he or she had to show them to the priest. The priest would look very closely at the sores and then send the person away. After a set amount of time, the person would return to the priest. If the sores had not healed, the priest would say that the person was unclean because he or she had leprosy. Lepers had to live outside of the village. They were not allowed to return to their families unless their sores healed. And though the lepers hoped and hoped, leprosy did not heal. Nine of these lepers were Jews, and one was a Samaritan. They had heard of Jesus. They held out their arms to Jesus and begged him to help them. Go show yourselves to the priest, Jesus called. For just a moment, the lepers may have been disappointed. But then they understood. They knew why Jesus was sending them to the priest. The lepers knew they would have to show themselves to a priest. If the priest said that they were healed, everyone else would welcome them back into the village. They could go home and live with their families again. What are we waiting for? They probably asked as they hurried to find the priest. As they ran, the feeling returned to their feet 
and their hands. The sores went away. They were truly healed. As much as the Samaritan wanted to reach the priest with the others, he stopped. He turned around and ran back to Jesus. Praising and thanking God, the man fell at Jesus' feet. Thank you, he may have whispered, and then louder, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus' eyes sparkled. So few people he had helped were truly thankful. He looked down the road at the nine Jews hurrying on their way. Were there not Ten lepers cleansed? Jesus sadly asked. Where are the other nine? Is the Samaritan the only one who will thank and praise God? Then Jesus turned to the Samaritan and said, Get up and go. Because of your great faith, you have been made well. Joy filled the man's heart, and with a thankful heart, he worshipped God. Today's story is God's Gentle Whisper. The memory verse is Isaiah 30, verse 21. It says, Your ears will hear a voice saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Today's message is, I will listen to God's gentle whisper. One night, Glenda was alone in her bedroom trying to go to sleep. Every shadow seemed to move. She felt afraid. Then her mother came into the room. Her gentle voice helped Glenda calm down. A long time ago, God's prophet Elijah became frightened too. Then God spoke to him in a quiet voice. Elijah was running for his life. King Ahab's wife, the wicked Queen Jezebel, was trying to kill him. Elijah was so scared that he had forgotten all the wonderful things God had done for him. He had forgotten that God could protect him from the wicked queen. Instead, for 40 days, he ran hundreds of miles into the desert. Finally, he came to Mount Horeb. There he hid in a cave. What are you doing here? God asked him. You can tell Elijah felt sorry for himself by the way he answered God. I have worked very hard for you, Lord, he said. The Israelites have rejected you. They have broken down your altars and killed your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Elijah was telling God, I worked hard for you and see how tired and discouraged I feel. So God replied, Go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. This was God's way of saying, Elijah, come here. I want to talk to you. Elijah did as God said. Then a great wind tore through the mountains and shattered the rocks. But Elijah didn't get up, because he didn't hear God's voice in the wind. God was not in the strong wind. Next, an earthquake shook the mountain, but Elijah still didn't get up. He didn't hear God in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a terrible fire swept by, but still Elijah didn't hear God's voice. God was not in the wind the earthquake, or the fire. After all those powerful forces of nature, a gentle whisper came. Some Bible translations call it a still, small voice. And in that gentle whisper, Elijah recognized God's voice. He pulled his coat over his face. Then he stood at the cave entrance to listen to God. Again, God asked Elijah the same question. What are you doing here? And Elijah gave his same poor me answer. 
God wasn't angry at Elijah for giving up and running away. God wasn't angry because Elijah forgot to trust him. God's gentle whisper spoke of God's love. God loved Elijah even when he felt sorry for himself. Gently, God encouraged the tired prophet. Then he sent him back to work, and God assured Elijah that he was not alone, for he wasn't. For God still had 7,000 faithful worshipers in Israel. Today's story is called Esther's Banquet. The memory verse is from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6. It says, In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. The message is, With God's help, I have the courage to do what is right. Have you ever been to a special dinner where everyone dressed in their best clothes? Esther planned a special dinner, a banquet, for the king and Haman. After three days and nights of not eating or drinking, Esther dressed in her prettiest clothes. Then she went in to see the king. She walked to the door of his throne room and stood quietly. When King Xerxes saw her, he smiled and held out his gold scepter. Esther walked toward him and touched it. What can I do for you, my queen? He smiled. I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. I've prepared a banquet for you and Haman today, replied Esther. Will you please come? Of course, we'll be there, he said to Esther. Later, when Haman and the king were at her banquet, the king asked Esther, What can I do for you, Queen Esther? Remember, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. Come back tomorrow with Haman for another banquet, she replied. I will answer your question then. Haman left for home feeling very happy. Not everyone was invited to dinner with the king and queen. Then he saw Mordecai sitting at the gate. Mordecai did not bow to him. He didn't even stand up when he saw Haman. Haman was very angry, but he said nothing. When Haman arrived home, he bragged to his family and friends, I have ten sons. I have money and power. The king likes me. He gave me a great position. I am the most important person in the palace after the king. I am the only person Queen Esther invited to her banquet for the king and she invited me back again tomorrow. Then he complained to them about Mordecai. Everything would be perfect except for him, he said. He's always sitting at the king's gate. He refuses to honor me. Why don't you have him hanged, someone suggested. Haman liked that idea, so he had his workmen build a hanging platform. That night, the king had trouble going to sleep, so he asked one of his servants to bring the daily court record to him. He read about the two guards who planned to kill him. Then he read about Mordecai's part in reporting those plans. Mordecai saved my life. Did we reward him? The king asked a servant. No, sir, said the servant. We never did. The next morning, Haman came before the king. He planned to ask for permission to hang Mordecai. But before he could say anything, the king asked him a question. What should be done to honor a man who has done a good thing? Haman thought the king was talking about him. So he replied, Give him a royal robe and crown to wear. Let him ride through the streets on a royal horse. Let your servant announce this is what the king does for a man he wants to honor. I like that idea, Haman, King Xerxes replied. Do everything that you've said for Mordecai right away. Don't leave anything out. 
Haman had to do what the king asked, but he was so embarrassed and ashamed that he hid his face all the way home. When he got there, he told his friends and family what happened. You're losing all your power to Mordecai, they said. You can't win. You're going to be ruined. But before Haman had time to answer, the king's servants arrived. They hurried Haman away to the second banquet Queen Esther had prepared. What would happen? What would Esther say? God would be with her, and God will be with you too. Giants and Grasshoppers The message is, we encourage one another to follow the Lord. Our memory verse is Hebrews 10, 25. Let's encourage one another. Have you ever gone camping or moved to a new neighborhood? It's always fun to get up and go exploring. God gave the Israelites a chance to explore their new land before they moved in. When Moses brought the Hebrew people out of Egypt, they marched from Goshen to the edge of the Red Sea. None of them knew the way, but God did. So he led the people with a huge pillar of cloud. This cloud sheltered them from the hot sun during the day. At night, the cloud gave them light and heat. As the people neared the Promised Land, God told Moses to choose one leader from each tribe. These men were to spy out the land. See what the land is like, Moses told the spies, and bring back some fruit. After forty days, the men returned. The Israelites came out to welcome the spies and hear their report. Caleb, a strong, tall man from the tribe of Judah, could hardly wait to give his report. Joshua, a young leader from the tribe of Ephraim, also had a good report. Both Caleb and Joshua allowed the others to speak first. The land flows with milk and honey just as God told us, the spies reported, and we have brought back some fruit. Two men stepped forward with the huge bunch of grapes they carried on a pole between them, but the other spies only spoke about the walled cities and giants they saw in the land. The people listening began to grumble and complain. Caleb could see that their mood was growing ugly. Suddenly, he stepped between Moses and the people. We can go. We can go up at once and take possession of the land, he encouraged. It is a good land, and we can certainly do it. How can we? The ten discouraged spies complained. We felt like grasshoppers beside those people, and that is how we seemed to them. The people raised their voices and cried all night long. It would have been better for us to die in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, the people wailed. Why? Why is the Lord taking us into that land? We will be killed in battle, and our wives and children will be captured. Let's go back to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell with their faces to the ground. Caleb and Joshua were distressed by Israel's lack of trust in the Lord. They tore their clothes and held up their hands for silence. The land we explored is excellent, the two faithful spies exclaimed. Don't be afraid of the people who live there. With God's help, we will conquer them easily. The Lord is with us. He has left them. Caleb looked out over the angry multitude. The other ten spies mixed with the crowd spreading discouragement. Caleb shook his head. It was a good land, a beautiful land, rich and full of food. After all, it had taken two men to carry home one bunch of grapes. Yes, the people of the land were powerful. Their cities were well protected. But the children of Israel had God on their side. Suddenly, the crying and wailing of the people took an uglier turn. Let's stone them, they muttered, pointing to Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua. Stone them! Stone them! 
At that moment, a dazzling light spread over the tabernacle, the Lord's tent. The people backed away, fearful, squinting and shading their eyes with their hands. Then the Lord spoke, Because you people are afraid of entering the land, you will not do so. You will wander in the wilderness until all of you who are adults die. As for your children, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you rejected. But God promised Caleb and Joshua that they would go into the land because they spoke encouragement. Like Caleb and Joshua, we should encourage one another to follow the Lord. Escape from Jericho The message is with our church family, we listen and learn what is important. Our memory verse this week is from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Natasha sat under a table that was covered with blankets. She typed on an old typewriter hidden inside a wooden box. The blankets and the box helped soften the sound of the typewriter so it could not be heard outside. Why was she doing that? She lived in a country where books about Jesus were forbidden. But books about Jesus were important to Natasha and other Christians. So Natasha risked her life to type copies of these books so others could learn more about Jesus. One day, the police pounded on Natasha's door. They arrested her and took her away. A long time ago, the guards in Jericho wanted to arrest two men who were working for God. This is how it happened. Forty years went by after the ten spies brought back their discouraging report. Joshua, the young spy who joined Caleb in bringing a good report about the Promised Land, was now Israel's leader, and he was still looking for ways to encourage people. Just as Moses had done years before, Joshua sent out spies. This time, the two spies went into the Promised Land. Go, look over the land, Joshua told them, especially Jericho. So the men slipped into that mighty city. That night, they went to a house built on the city wall. Rahab, the woman who lived there, answered their knock. She knew they were Israelites, yet she invited them inside. Now everyone in Jericho, including Rahab, knew about the Israelites. Everyone knew the Lord fought Israel's battles, and that scared the king of Jericho and his army. But instead of calling the soldiers, Rahab talked to the men. Then she hid the two Israelites on her roof under some stalks of flax. When the king's soldiers came knocking, Rahab swung the door wide open. Bring the men who have come to spy on us, they demanded. The men left here a short time ago, she lied. Go quickly and you will surely catch them. The soldiers dashed away looking for the spies. About that same time, the gates of Jericho clanked shut. The city settled down to sleep. When all was quiet, Rahab crept onto the roof. I know the Lord has given the land to your people, she told the spies. We have heard how he dried up the Red Sea for you. Everyone is afraid. Our courage has melted. You know I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sign that you will show kindness to my family. We will, the men promised. Our lives for your lives. You don't tell what we are doing, and you will be safe when the Lord gives us the land. So Rahab took a red rope to let the spies down from her window. After we have gone, tie this rope in your window, the spies told her. When we take the city, we will save you and the family members inside the house with you, but the rope 
must be in the window. Rahab watched as the men climbed down the rope and disappeared into the darkness. She carefully tied the cord to the window. Deep in her heart, she knew that she had discovered something very important. The God of Israel was the true God. He would be her God from that day on. Today's story is called Water from a Rock. The memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 26, verse 4. It says, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord is the rock eternal. Today's message is we worship God when we trust Him. Have you ever run out of water? Imagine how thirsty you would be. You would probably be upset and cranky. Years ago, God told Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Moses did, but they had a water problem. This is how it happened. The Israelites were out of water again. So they started complaining to Moses again. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert? They grumbled. There's nothing good to eat here, and there's no water to drink. They didn't mumble about this just once or twice. Again and again they complained, their voices growing louder and louder. How many times had Moses heard that? In fact, the people had complained about having no water 40 years earlier. At that time, God had told Moses to strike the rock, and water had gushed out. Gallons and gallons of water had poured out, and it kept pouring from out of the rock as long as the people were there. So here they were again, without water. Instead of trusting God to care for their needs, they grumbled and complained. And Moses, as he always did, turned to God for help. God told Moses to take his staff, his walking stick, and call his brother Aaron. They were to gather all the people together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. God said, Moses had been patient for a long, long time. But after 40 years of listening to the Israelites grumble, he had heard enough. He was angry. He was tired of their grumbling and complaining. Once more, they were showing that they did not trust God. Moses was so irritated that he forgot it was God who had caused all the miracles to happen. God had caused water to flow out of the rock 40 years before. Only God could cause it to flow again. But Moses forgot. He felt he was the one who could make the water come from the rock. Listen, you rebels! Must we bring you water out of this rock? Moses yelled at the people. But he didn't speak to the rock as God has commanded. He raised his arm and hit the rock twice with his staff, and God made the water gush out. Moses may have felt quite pleased with himself for a moment. He would probably wanted to yell at the people for a long time. And it may have felt good to hit that rock. But Moses had given the impression that the power to make the water flow had come from him and Aaron. So God was dishonored. If Moses had obeyed, it would have reminded the people that although Moses was their leader, he got all his instructions from God. Then God spoke again in his calm 
gentle voice. Moses, Moses, you did not trust me, not even to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites. God said, because of that, you will not bring this community in the land that I give them. Immediately, Moses realized what he had done. He too had forgotten to trust God. He had forgotten for a moment who was really leading Israel. For 40 years, Moses and Aaron had struggled in the wilderness. For 40 years, they had led God's people. But Moses and Aaron could not go into the promised land. The Israelites had to learn that whoever their leader was, that person had to trust God completely and honor all of God's instructions. God wants us to honor and worship Him. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to know that He will be with us every day. We worship Him when we do what He asks of us. And we worship Him when we trust His leading. Today's story is called Healthy Choices. The memory verse is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The message is, I serve God when I choose to be healthy. Imagine you are very hungry and you are invited to a banquet. You sit down at the table and you find wine and unclean foods that you know you shouldn't have. What will you do? Daniel and his three friends face that problem. Let's see what they did. King Nebuchadnezzar's army had invaded and conquered Judah. All the young men from the royal family and other important families had been taken to Babylon. Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael were among the young Hebrews. Nebuchadnezzar's empire was enormous. The king knew that the Hebrew captives had many abilities so he decided to train some of them for work in his government. They could help rule some parts of his vast empire. But first, they had to learn Babylonian ways. They needed to learn the language. They had to learn the way things were done in Babylon. Daniel and his three friends knew that they were going to serve the king, but they decided that God would be first in their lives. They would serve him first, no matter what happened. There were so many new and interesting things to see in Babylon. Great temples for worshiping idols were everywhere. The young Hebrews saw parks shaded by strange trees and hanging flowering plants. The cities of Babylon were truly beautiful. After their long journey, Everyone looked forward to their first meal in Babylon. They were to eat the best food. It was the same food served at the king's table. Rich roasted meats and sweet wine were on every table. The sweetest desserts in the whole land were there for all. All of the Hebrews were delighted with the food. All except Daniel and his three friends. They could not eat it. They knew that this food was not good for them. They also knew that some of the food and wine had been offered to idols. Daniel and his three friends determined to serve God no matter what happened. So Daniel asked the officer in charge of all the Hebrews to help. He asked for simple food and water to drink. Although the king's officer respected Daniel, he refused. He was afraid for his life. King Nebuchadnezzar himself had ordered the meal. If Daniel and his friends didn't eat that food, 
they might not be as strong as the others. And if that happened, the king might have the officer killed. But Daniel did not give up. The officer had appointed Melzar, a steward, to watch over Daniel and his friends. Daniel appealed to Melzar. Test us, he said. Let us eat simple food and drink only water for ten days. If we are not as healthy as the others, do with us as you will. The steward agreed. At the end of ten days, the four Hebrews were stronger and more alert than the other captives. With God's help, they had passed the test. During all three years of their training, they were served simple food and water. God was pleased with Daniel and his friends. The Bible says God helped them with their studies. He gave them wisdom and understanding, and He gave Daniel the ability to understand dreams. Daniel served God first. He obeyed God's rules about eating and drinking, and God rewarded Daniel. Daniel's service to Nebuchadnezzar would lead that great ruler to know the true God. When we put God first, he can use us to show others the great things He can do. Today's story is called Free at Last. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. It says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Today's message is God helps me to be faithful no matter what happens. Have you ever had a dream that you couldn't remember? Or have you had a dream that didn't make sense? Today's story is about dreams that left someone very puzzled. Potiphar put Joseph in prison after Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of a crime. God knew that Joseph was innocent. He let Joseph go to prison anyway. Sometimes God lets his people be put in the strangest places for a special reason. God blessed Joseph even in prison. The prison warden noticed the good work that Joseph did. He soon put him in charge of the other prisoners. Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker were two of the men Joseph met in prison. One day, Joseph noticed that these men were sad. They both had just dreamed a dream they could not understand. Joseph knew about dreams. God had given him some important dreams when he was younger. He listened to the men's stories and God helped him to tell them the meanings of their dreams. Everything he said would happen, did happen. The cupbearer returned to work for the king, but the baker did not. Joseph had asked the cupbearer to mention him to Pharaoh in hopes of getting him out of prison. But the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph, and Joseph spent two more years in prison after that. One night, Pharaoh had two dreams. In the first dream, he saw seven fat cows eating grass on the riverbank. Then, out of nowhere, came seven skinny cows and ate them up. In a second dream, Pharaoh saw seven ears of healthy corn, and then suddenly seven little unhealthy ears of corn appeared and swallowed up the healthy ones. These dreams disturbed Pharaoh so much that he couldn't go back to sleep. What did they mean? No one in Pharaoh's palace could understand the dreams. Then the king's cupbearer remembered Joseph, and Joseph was brought from prison. Joseph told Pharaoh that God sometimes gives people dreams. He had given these dreams to Pharaoh for a reason and God had given Joseph the meaning of them. 
Your two dreams predict the same event, Joseph explained. For the next seven years, Egypt will grow more food than you could possibly use. The cows and the grain will be fat. Then the seven years after that will be very bad. No food will grow and many people could starve. You should build more storehouses. Keep the extra grain grown in the fat years, Joseph suggested. If you do, Egypt will have enough food for the years of famine. Pharaoh agreed with Joseph. He decided that Joseph was a wise man. So he set him in charge of building the storehouses. Pharaoh gave Joseph his official ring. He gave him nice clothes, nicer than those taken by his brothers or by Potiphar's wife. And he placed Joseph in charge of the entire country of Egypt. Truly, the Lord was with Joseph. He left Joseph in prison for a reason. When bad things happen to us, we can be faithful like Joseph. God can help us be faithful to Him, the God we are learning about in our home and church families. He can do great things with our lives, no matter where we go or what happens. The title of today's story is Living Water. The memory verse is from John chapter 4, verse 14. It says, Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. The message is Jesus is everyone's friend. One morning, Maria had a surprise at school. A new girl was sitting in the desk right next to hers. Maria's teacher introduced the girls. Maria? This is Pei Ling. She and her parents come from China. Nice to meet you. Welcome to our class, said Maria. Nice to meet you, Pei Ling answered with a strong accent. That night, Maria asked Jesus to help her to be Pei Ling's friend. It was good that Maria went to Jesus for help. Jesus knows how to be friends with everyone. One day, Jesus and his disciples were walking through Samaria on their way to Galilee. The Jews and the Samaritans didn't like each other. They never even spoke to one another. The Samaritans were different. They had a different religion, so neither Jews nor Samaritans felt a need to be friends with each other. Outside the town of Sachar, Jesus sat down beside a well. He was tired, hungry, and very thirsty, and he was alone. His disciples had gone to town to buy some food. Usually this well, called Jacob's well, was very busy. But as Jesus sat there, only one woman came to draw water. In the heat of the day, most Samaritans stayed inside. May I have a drink? Jesus asked. The woman looked around. Was this Jew really speaking to her? She thought. Why would a Jew speak to a Samaritan? They never spoke to each other. Why do you, a Jew, ask me for a drink? She replied. If you asked me for water, Jesus answered, I wouldn't refuse you. I would give you living water, and you would never be thirsty again. The woman listened. Never be thirsty again? She forgot that she was not supposed to talk to a Jew. All she could think of was this water Jesus spoke about. She wanted this special water so she would never be thirsty again. Then Jesus explained, The living water he spoke of was really eternal life, which we receive when we believe in Jesus and choose to follow him. The woman believed. She wanted others to believe too, so they could receive the living water Jesus promised. Quickly, she ran into the town, 
Come, she invited others. Hear a man who has a wonderful message. Jesus stayed in Sekar for two days, pouring the water of life for all the people there. It did not matter to Jesus that the people were different from him. It did not matter that they were a different religion. It didn't matter that they were hated by the Jews. Jesus loves all the people in our world. Everyone is Jesus' friend, no matter where they live or what they look like. He wants us to make new friends for Him, no matter how different they are from us. Today's story is called The Day Jesus Died. The memory verse is one of my favorites. It's from John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Today's message is we serve God when we share his love with others. Do you love someone so much that you would do anything for them? God loves us so much that he sacrificed his only son to save us, and Jesus was willing to die for us. Jesus' terrible night of insults and beatings was finally over. Now the Roman soldiers were taking him and two thieves outside the city to crucify them. Simon had carried Jesus' cross to the place of crucifixion. The awful deed would soon be done. The Bible simply says they crucified him. The people who lived when the Gospels were written knew what that meant. They knew crucifixion caused a slow, painful death. They knew a crowd would often follow the prisoners to the place of execution, shouting insults along the way. They knew soldiers would nail the hands and feet of the prisoners to the cross. They knew those soldiers would drop the cross into a hole in the ground. And yes, they knew it was the worst possible way to die. The soldiers nailed him to the cross, then placed his cross between the crosses of two thieves. The crowd that had followed them out of the city gathered around. The mocking that had been going on all night continued. If you really are the Son of God, come down from that cross, one shouted. He saved others, but he can't save himself, another sneered. Come down from that cross and we'll believe in you, another said scornfully. If God wants him, let God rescue him, laughed yet another. After all, he said he was the Son of God. And so it went on and on. Even a thief who was crucified with him shouted insults at him. Although the pain and mocking were terrible, something even worse was happening to Jesus. When he came to earth to die for us, Jesus took our sins on himself. That means that the guilt of every person who would ever live was resting on him as he hung on the cross. The sense of sin was so great that Jesus felt God had left him forever. That feeling of abandonment by his father caused Jesus to cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And even though he thought he might never see his father again, Jesus was still willing to die for us. But God the Father had not abandoned Jesus. God and all the angels of heaven were watching and suffering with him. Even the earth reacted to Jesus' agony. Darkness covered the area for three hours, and when Jesus finally died, the earth shook and the rocks split. Do you love anyone so much you would be willing to die a horrible death to save them? That's how much Jesus loves you. He loves you so much there is nothing he wouldn't do to save you. That's the core of Christianity. It's the reason for every song we sing, every prayer we pray, 
everything we do. That love is the message we are asked to share with others. Who doesn't need to know that they are loved that much? Who couldn't help loving a God who would do absolutely anything to save them? Tell someone you know. Today's story is called Forgiveness Fire. The memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. It says, Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Today's message is, Because of God's grace, my sins are forgiven when I ask Him. Have you ever had to tell someone something that you didn't want to tell them? Isaiah didn't think he was good enough to be God's messenger. God used an unusual way to encourage him. One day, Isaiah was visiting the temple. Suddenly, he seemed to be standing in heaven in a dazzling room looking towards God on his throne. Glittering rainbows as though thrown from a gigantic diamond danced across the space. God's royal robe draped down the platform of his throne and seemed to fill the room. A sacred altar to one side had bright orange, burning coals with a drift of smoke rising from it. And what were those bright and shining creatures flying above God's head? Isaiah studied the creatures. Angels! They were angels called seraphim with six wings. With two of their wings they covered their faces. They did not look at God because He was so holy. With two other wings, they covered their feet, probably so they would not touch God. And with the two remaining wings, the angels were flying above God's head. The whole room rang with angels' beautiful music. It was so powerful, the doorpost shook. Isaiah's whole body tingled. Soon, smoke from the altar filled the room. But Isaiah sensed it was not dangerous. It was holy. God's presence seemed to be a part of the smoke that surrounded Isaiah with warmth. But what were the angels singing? Isaiah listened carefully. They were calling to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. When Isaiah realized where he was, he began to cry. I don't belong here with God, he said. I have said things that I should not have said. I live with people who aren't kind to each other all the time, and I'm not always good to them. I'm not good enough to be here with God, and yet here I am. What is God going to do with me next? As he stood there with his face upturned, he saw one of the seraphim, an angel, fly to the altar. The angel took some tongs and very carefully lifted a burning coal. Then the angel flew to Isaiah and touched his lips with the glowing coal. It didn't hurt and it didn't burn. The angel said very gently, See, this has touched your lips. The guilt is taken away. A wonderful sense of relief washed over Isaiah. His sins were gone. Before he could thank God for this blessing, God spoke to him. He spoke like a kind father, concerned about his children because his children wouldn't listen to him. God said, Whom shall I send to take my messages to the people? Immediately Isaiah said, Here I am, Lord. Send me. With renewed love for God, he was ready to be God's messenger. God didn't force Isaiah to be a prophet. He first showed his love to Isaiah. Then he allowed Isaiah to volunteer. This was the beginning. For more than 60 years, Isaiah delivered God's messages to God's people. God loved Isaiah just as he was. We call that love grace. And because of God's grace, Isaiah always chose to follow God. 
and God is still reaching out with love to each one of us. God offers us the same promise of forgiveness that He gave to Isaiah. If you believe Him and confess your sins like Isaiah did, the gift of forgiveness is yours. God is a Father who keeps His promises. He will always love you. Today's story is called Handwriting on the Wall. Today's memory verse is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7. It says, But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. The message is, I serve God when I help others understand His Word. Have you ever seen words scribbled on a wall? It does not look very nice. How would you feel if you saw writing appear on a wall but could not see who was writing it or understand what was being written? That is just what happened at a king's party. There's going to be a party at the palace! Words spread rapidly through the city. Belshazzar, King Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, was the present-day king of Babylon. He had chosen a day to honor the idols of Babylon with a huge festival. Everyone was ready for a party. For months, Cyrus's army had been winning battles against the Babylonian army. People were worried because the Persian general was camped very near the city of Babylon. Everyone wanted to enjoy themselves and forget about the fighting. Belshazzar's party began in the morning and lasted all day. He probably had dancers and storytellers to entertain his guests. This party was supposed to honor the idols of Babylon, but most people were busy pleasing themselves with wine, food, and entertainment. Belshazzar did not want to follow God. He wanted to do what he wanted. He did not honor God. He was not humble. This must have made God sad. God would have been happy if Belshazzar had changed, but Belshazzar wanted his own way. As Belshazzar grew more and more drunk, his wickedness became greater. He called for the sacred vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He and his guests filled them with wine and made offerings to their gods. Can you imagine that? Those vessels were once used for worship in God's temple. They were dedicated to God. Now they were filled with wine and used to worship idols. Suddenly, there was a stir. Along one wall of the palace, a mysterious hand began to write a hand that wasn't connected to a body. Belshazzar stared with horror. This frightened him. The Bible says his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. What did it mean? He had to find out. He called for his magicians and astrologers. He called for the priest who served the idols Belshazzar had honored. If anyone can tell me what these words mean, I will give him a gold chain, and I will make him the third highest ruler in Babylon, he said. But none of the wise men could interpret the words. Belshazzar trembled. He became even more afraid. Finally, his mother remembered Daniel. Send for Daniel, she said. He interpreted your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Maybe he can help now. So Daniel was brought before the king and shown the mysterious writing. Daniel's words were respectful as he told the king the bad news. You have been too proud, he told Belshazzar. You insulted God, so he sent this message to you. Daniel then read the message, Mini, mini, tekel, you farsen. Daniel interpreted the message, Mini, means that God will soon end your reign. Tekel means that God has judged you and found you guilty of horrible sins. 
Eupharsin means that the Persians will conquer Babylon. Even as Belshazzar put a gold chain around Daniel's neck and promoted him to third highest in Babylon, God's words came true. The Persian army commanded by Cyrus sneaked into the city and conquered it. Belshazzar died that night. Sometimes serving God doesn't make people happy with us. God will make us strong, strong enough to take His message to anyone who needs to hear it. Will you be God's messenger and tell others about Him? Stronger than Egypt's idols. The message is, God is working to reach my heart. The memory verse is from Psalm 86, verse 10. It says, You are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Tara was glad to be on break from school and looked forward to sleeping, playing, and watching TV as much as she wanted. However, shortly after breakfast, Mom called her to clean the bird's cage. Tara didn't want to, but she decided to obey. Throughout the day, Mom gave her various tasks, which gave her many chances to obey or disobey. Our story today is about a man who got many chances to obey God, but who kept disobeying. The cool early morning breeze ruffled Moses' beard as he and his brother Aaron stood quietly by the great river Nile. Here he comes, Moses said softly. What do you two want now? Pharaoh growled as he arrived at the riverside. Moses stepped forward. The Lord, the God of all and also of all the Hebrews, has sent me to say, let my people go. The Lord says, you are going to find out that I am the Lord. I will hit the water of the Nile with this staff, and the river will turn to blood. The fish in it will die, and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink any water from the Nile. It happened just as God had said. Everywhere in Egypt, water turned to blood even water that was stored in pots in people's houses. But Pharaoh would not let God's people go. He did not want to give up his slaves. After all, they had been slaves in Egypt for almost 400 years. Go see Pharaoh again, the Lord said. Tell him I will send millions of frogs to Egypt. Frogs will be everywhere. They will even be in people's bedrooms. They will even be in their beds. Moses told Pharaoh the words of the Lord. It happened just as Moses said. The frogs were everywhere, and they made the Egyptians crazy. Get rid of these frogs, and I will let your people go. Pharaoh shouted at Moses. So the Lord ended the plague, and all the frogs died. But Pharaoh did not let the people go. The Lord spoke to Moses again. Tell Aaron to hit the dust with his staff. The dust will turn into gnats. Aaron did. And suddenly the land of Egypt was filled with a fog of tiny, irritating gnats. The little gnats covered the Egyptians and they covered all their animals. The gnats drove the Egyptians crazy. Pharaoh would still not let God's people go. The Lord spoke to Moses again. Tell Pharaoh if he refuses to let my people go, I will send swarms of flies to Egypt. The houses will be filled with them. The ground will be covered with them. But there will be no flies in Goshen where my people live. I am the Lord. I have power even in the heart of his land. Moses told Pharaoh the words of the Lord, and it happened just as God had said. Get rid of these horrible flies, Pharaoh shrieked. I will let your people go. So the Lord made the flies disappear, but Pharaoh would not let God's people go. The Lord tried to reach Pharaoh's heart five more times. 
he tried to show Pharaoh that he was the true God. The Egyptians worshipped many gods, and the Lord used each plague to show Pharaoh that there was only one true God. All the Egyptians' horses, donkeys, camels, cows, and sheep died. The Egyptians worshipped a bull god and a cow god. The animals of the Israelites did not die. Next, horrible, painful sores appeared on the Egyptians. They worshipped a lion-headed god that was supposed to have power over disease. Then the Lord sent a huge hailstorm. It destroyed all the crops and every tree. The Egyptians worshipped a sky god and a god of storms. The hail did not fall where the Israelites lived. Then the Lord covered all of Egypt with locusts. The locusts ate every little green thing left in the land. They even filled the houses. The Egyptians' god of crops could not save them. Finally, a deep, terrible darkness covered Egypt for three days. Their sun god could not help the Egyptians but there was light where the Israelites lived. The Lord had now given Pharaoh nine opportunities. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine opportunities to see that he was the only true God. He had tried over and over again to speak to Pharaoh in a way he could understand. He would try one more time. Today's story is called Home Again. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 15, verse 24. It says, This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The message for today is people in God's family never stop caring for each other. Has anyone you loved ever gone away or moved away from home? How did you feel when they left? Did they ever come back for a visit? A long time ago, an unhappy son left home. Here's his story. Dad, please. I want my part of the inheritance money now. The young man spoke firmly as he put his hand on his father's arm. He wanted to get away from his family and hard work. Father sighed. You've asked so many times. Please don't leave your home, son. We all love you. Perhaps the father even had tears in his eyes as he spoke. But before long, the inheritance money was divided and the young man packed his bags and headed out. He went to another country, far away from the farm life he had known. He had plenty of money to spend, and that's just what he did. If he wanted something, he bought it. He gave big parties. He wasted money on whatever his heart desired. Because of this, he made new friends who helped him spend his inheritance. But one shocking day, he realized that his money was finished. No more parties. No more buying whatever he wanted. And even all his friends had left him. Everything was gone. He began to look for a job, but it was a time of famine. There was no work and there was no food to be found. Finally, someone gave him a job feeding pigs. It was about as disgusting a job as he could imagine, but at least it was a job. He was so hungry that even the pig's food looked good to him. He suddenly said to himself, What am I doing here? How did I get myself into this mess? Even the people who are servants at my father's house have enough to eat. In fact, they usually have food left over. I know what I can do. I'll go back home 
and ask my father to hire me as a servant. As fast as his legs could carry him, the young man headed toward home. He practiced what he would say when he got there. It always began, Father, I have sinned. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Can it be? thought the father. Can it really be my son? Dashing down the road, he wrapped his boy in a big hug. They laughed and cried together. Then the son began his speech. Father, please forgive me. I've sinned against God and against you. I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. But before he could finish what he had planned to say, his father called to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe for my son. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Run back to the house and get a feast ready. My boy has come home and we are going to celebrate. This is my son who was lost. I thought he was dead, but he's alive. Today, in our own family and in our church family, we want to be just like that father. We want to care about people. We want to accept everyone with love. And we want to celebrate when someone comes home to Jesus. Today's story is called, He is Risen. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 24, verse 6. It says, He is not here. He has risen. The message is, Because He lives again, I can choose to have a future with Jesus. Have you ever been disappointed because you expected something special? Something you were sure would happen, but didn't? The disciples had hoped for all kinds of special things in Jesus' kingdom. Then Jesus died. What would happen next? After suffering greatly, Jesus died on the cross Friday afternoon. Even though he was dead, the priest still worried. So Pilate assigned soldiers to guard the tomb where he lay. Early Sunday morning, an earthquake suddenly shook the ground around the tomb. A mighty angel, as bright as lightning, appeared and rolled the stone away. The soldiers, they stared at Jesus, stepped out of the tomb. Filled with fear, they fell to the ground. They knew that they had crucified the Son of God. Quickly, the soldiers ran to the city and told the chief priests, they described the earthquake. They described how the angel had rolled away the huge stone. They told about seeing Jesus come out of the tomb, alive. The priests were so frightened. The people must not be told that Jesus is alive, they thought. Stunned, Caiaphas the high priest could hardly speak. Wait, wait, he called as the soldiers turned to leave. You must not tell anyone what you have seen. Say that his disciples came by night and took him away while you slept. The soldiers were horrified. If they said that they were asleep at their post, they could be killed. The priest knew what the soldiers were thinking. Quickly, they promised them money. They would ask Pilate to protect the soldiers. Shortly after the soldiers left for the city, Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb. She found it empty and hurried away to tell the disciples. Other women also went to the tomb that morning, but Jesus wasn't there. Gently, the angel who had rolled away the stone spoke to the women. Don't be afraid. He is not here. He has risen just as he said he would. Go quickly. And tell his friends, Jesus will meet you all in Galilee. 
these women hurried away to tell Jesus' disciples. When Mary Magdalene told the disciples that Jesus had been taken away, Peter and John hurried to the tomb. Mary followed them. When they returned to Jerusalem, she stayed behind. Filled with grief, she wept as she looked into the empty tomb. There she saw two angels. Woman, why are you crying? asked one. Because they have taken my Lord away, she replied. Weeping, she turned away. Suddenly, another voice spoke to her. Why are you crying? Tell me, tell me where he is, she pleaded. Mary, the gentle voice spoke again. Suddenly, Mary knew this was not a stranger. It was Jesus himself. Filled with joy, she looked into his face. Go and tell my disciples, he said. And Mary found her way to the disciples with the joyful message, Jesus is alive, he is risen, and I have seen him. Yes, Jesus is alive, he is our risen Savior, and because he lives, you and I can choose to have happiness and eternal life with Jesus. And that happiness can start right now as we give ourselves to Him and accept Him as our Savior. Today's story is called Healing at the Pool of Bethesda. The memory verse is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, For it is by grace that you have been saved. Through faith, it is the gift of God. Today's message is Jesus sees our needs and helps us. Have you ever wanted something very much and had to wait a long time for it? Maybe you wanted a new toy or a watch, or maybe you were sick for a long time and wanted to get well quickly. The man in our story today knew what it was to want something very badly and to have to wait a long time for it. Jesus has come to Jerusalem to attend a feast. Soon he finds himself near a pool, the Pool of Bethesda. Five beautiful covered porches surround the pool. This is the kind of place that should be peaceful. It should be surrounded with lush green plants and colorful flowers. But it is a place of sickness and misery. All around the pool, people are struggling. Sick people lie in all angles or sit hunched over. So many people. Jesus stops. He looks around. He sees the blind, the deaf, the crippled. He sees some with stomach problems and skin diseases. Some suffer from mental health problems. His heart goes out to the elderly, the children, and all those of ages in between. All are here hoping for a miracle. The people wait for the water in the pool to move. Many believe it will be stirred by an angel, and whoever is first in the water afterward will be healed. Jesus knows that isn't true. It is a false hope, but the people wait and watch. And when the ripples appear, the eager people rush forward. Desperate for healing, they trample the smaller or weaker. Jesus looks over this crowd of sick people, and he has compassion on them. He wants to heal all of them. He knows some of the Jewish leaders would be angry if he healed the sick today. Do you know why? It's because it was the Sabbath. They would even try to kill him. But his time has not yet come. His work on earth is not finished. Jesus knows each person's name 
and their sickness. He especially notices one man who has been crippled for 38 years. Jesus knows that this man is sad. He is lonely, and he feels that he is not worthy of God's mercy. Quietly, Jesus kneels beside him and bends over to see his face. Tenderly, he asks, Do you want to be healed? Hope jumps in the man's heart. Of course he wants to be healed. Doesn't everyone hear? He doesn't know who Jesus is. He doesn't know that Jesus can heal him. He believes his only hope is to get into that water. So he tells Jesus, Sir, I don't have anyone to help me. I can't get into the pool fast enough. When I try, someone always gets in before me. Jesus doesn't ask the man to believe in him. He doesn't even tell the man who he is. He knows the man doesn't feel worthy of God's love. But Jesus wants to pour his grace out on this man. So he says to the man, Get up, pick up your bed and walk. The man does not hesitate. He obeys. He wants to be made well. Nerves and muscles that haven't been useful for years are brought to life. The man jumps up. He rolls his rug and blanket. Then he looks around for the one who just healed him. But Jesus has slipped away into the crowd. Later, Jesus meets the man in the temple. The man is overjoyed, and he tells everyone he meets the good news about Jesus. That day, Jesus healed a man's body. Jesus' healing grace also brought him back to God. With love, Jesus says to us, Will you be healed? He wants us to be healthy in body and spirit. He wants to pour out His grace on us too. Will you accept Him today and let Him be your Savior too? The Rock and the Sand The message is, I am joyful when I build my life on Jesus. This week, our memory verse is, My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. Psalm 18, verse 2. Have you ever built a sandcastle on the beach? Even though you build it high and you pat the sand until it is firm, what happens when the foamy waves wash around it? A long time ago, Jesus told a story about that. One day, Jesus sat on the side of a hill, talking to hundreds of people seated on the grass in front of him. Jesus knew about storms and floods. So did the people seated around him. Many of them had lived near the Sea of Galilee all of their lives. When they were children, they probably played at the water's edge. Jesus loved the people so much, he wanted them to understand about God. He wanted them to understand how to be joyful. Maybe a story about building at the water's edge would help them understand. And so Jesus told this story. Once, a man decided to build a house. He chose a high, rocky ledge on which to build it. The water wouldn't flood his house. His house would be safe and the foundation strong. The man worked hard carrying the building materials all the way up onto the rock. After the house was finished, the rains came down, the wind blew and blew, the streams grew bigger and bigger, overflowing their banks. Now there was flooding to worry about, but the house was safe. The man had built it on a strong, firm foundation of solid rock. That makes sense, doesn't it? The people thought so. They all nodded and said, Amen. And Jesus told them, If you listen to God and live for me, you are building your house on the rock. And all the people nodded and said, Amen. Again, because building on rock made sense. 
Then Jesus continued, his story was not done. Another man built himself a house. The man chose to build his house on the sand at the water's edge. He probably built a strong house too, and he probably worked very hard at it. After the house was finished, the rains came and pounded it. The wind blew and blew. The streams rose higher and higher and overflowed their banks. Soon they flooded the house. The waves beat and beat against the house, washing away the sand underneath it. And the house fell in with a mighty crash because there was no deep, firm foundation supporting the walls. What a foolish man! The people may have thought he should have known better, and so he should have. But listen to what Jesus said next. When people listen to my words and do not do anything about them, they are as foolish as that man. They cannot expect to be joyful. The wise person not only listens but is willing to do what I say. The people opened their eyes in amazement as they listened to Jesus. His teaching was very different from the teachers of the law they usually heard. Some of the people may have even remembered what David said in Psalm eighteen, verse two: "My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge." I wonder how many people who heard Jesus that day were willing to build their lives on Jesus. How many wanted to study and live by God's word? How about you? Today's story is called "A Wife for Isaac." The memory verse is from Genesis chapter twenty-four, verse forty. It says, "The Lord will send His angel with you." And make your journey a success. Today's message is: God wants everyone to join His family. Have you ever been on a long journey? What did you take? How did you manage for food? When Abraham sent his servant on a long journey, his servant took ten camels to carry everything he needed. Eliezer woke with a start. The sky was still black, but it was time to go. He had an important job to do. Abraham appeared out of the darkness. He smiled at his old and faithful servant. "The Lord will send His angel ahead of you, my friend," he said. "God will see to it that you find just the woman He has picked for Isaac's bride. She will be a woman from my homeland." We cannot let Isaac marry one of the heathen women who live here. He should marry someone who believes in God. Eliezer thought about his mission as he traveled day after dusty day. Abraham was so sure that the Lord's angel would be traveling ahead of him. He would meet many strangers. Just how would he find the right woman? Which would be the woman the Lord had picked? Finally, Eliezer arrived at the city of Nahor, where Abram's relatives lived. It was almost evening. He was tired of traveling, and he was thirsty. So were the camels. Suddenly, Eliezer had an idea. He raised his head toward heaven and prayed, "Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today. Keep your promise to my master." I am here at the village well. The young women of the city will soon be coming for water. I will say to one, "Please lower your jar and let me have a drink." If she says "drink," and I will also bring water for your camels, may she be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. Before Eliezer had finished praying, a beautiful young girl appeared. She came to the well and filled her water jar. Could this be the one? Eliezer wondered. He ran to meet her. Please give me a drink of water from your jar, he asked. The girl Rebecca quickly lowered the jar from her shoulder. She offered it to Eliezer, and he drank his fill. Then she said the very words Eliezer had prayed for. 
I will also bring water for your camels. Rebecca emptied her jar into the animal's drinking trough. Then she hurried to the well for more water. Eliezer smiled joyfully. God had answered his prayer so quickly, and the girl was so friendly and so kind. When Rebecca returned, Eliezer said to her, Please tell me who your father is. And when she told him, Eliezer knelt down and worshipped God. Praise the Lord, the God of my master Abraham. He has faithfully kept his promise to my master. The Lord has led me straight to my master's relatives. Rebecca went home and told her brother Laban about this servant of Abraham. Laban immediately went to the well and invited Eleazar to their home. Eleazar told them about his mission from Abraham. He told them about his prayer and how God had answered it so quickly. Would Rebecca agree to Abraham's request? Rebecca had listened carefully. She heard how God had led Eliezer to her family. She believed God was leading in this, so she agreed to go with Eliezer. She would leave her family and her homeland. She would become Isaac's wife. Today's story is called "God Wins." The memory verse is from First Samuel chapter fourteen, verse six. It says, "Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving." Today's message is, "God gives me the victory." I can't. I can't. I just can't do it. Have you ever felt that way? When things are too hard. Whom do you ask for help? Jonathan knew who to ask. Here's his story. King Saul's army was camped under a tree near Gibeah. The Philistines were camped nearby in a narrow pass in the mountains. Every day, the Philistines sent out soldiers to harm the Israelites and to steal from them. The Philistines had hundreds of chariots and thousands of well-armed soldiers. The Israelite army of six hundred men was small and afraid. None of the Israelite soldiers had swords or spears. Only Saul and Jonathan had them. The Israelite soldiers had plows, hoes, axes, and sickles for weapons. But you don't win wars with farm tools. Because of this, many of the Israelite soldiers were afraid, so they hid in holes and behind rocks. But not Jonathan, the son of King Saul. He alone thought that God could win the battle. One day, Jonathan whispered to the soldier who carried his heavy shield, "Come with me." The armor bearer knew at once that Jonathan had a secret plan. He quickly dressed and followed Jonathan out of the camp. Nobody heard them leave. We can get to the Philistine lookout if we take the pass between the mountains, Jonathan explained. God will get us past the guards and give us victory. Nothing can stop God from saving us. You lead the way, the armor bearer said. I'll be right behind you. Let's go, Jonathan said, starting down the pass. If, when they see us, they tell us to wait for them to come down, we will wait. But if they say, "Come up to us." We know that this is a sign that the Lord will give us a victory. After a slow, hard hike, Jonathan and his armor bearer reached the pass. Boldly, they stepped forward in full view of the Philistine guards. Look! One of the guards cried out, "The Israelites are crawling out of their holes." Come on up, so we can teach you a lesson," 
another shouted. That's our sign, Jonathan whispered. God has given them into our hands. So the two began climbing up that steep cliff. When they got to the top, Jonathan walked forward. His armor bearer was right behind him. Twenty Philistine guards suddenly attacked in just a small space. But Jonathan and his armor bearer knew God would help them. The Philistines were quickly defeated. Other guards watching from the tops of the cliffs panicked and became confused when they saw what happened. They shouted down to tell the soldiers in the Philistine camp, and then those soldiers panicked. Even the chariot drivers panicked. In their confusion, they began to push and fight one another as they ran in every direction. The ground shook as if a great army with horsemen and chariots were coming. Jonathan, his armor-bearer, and the Philistines knew that God was helping Israel. When King Saul and his six hundred soldiers came upon the scene, Jonathan and his armor-bearer stood quietly watching the Philistines run away. The soldiers of Israel knew they had won because God had won the battle for them. This day the Lord has rescued us, they said. Jonathan and his armor-bearer agreed. The Lord had won a great victory. Nothing had stopped God from saving them. Today's story is called Jars of Clay. The memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. It says, O Lord, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Today's message is God holds me in his hands and molds me. Sammy loved to make things from clay or Play-Doh. It was very soft and it felt so good. He made animals, buildings, cars, people, and cups. The clay in Sammy's hands became whatever Sammy wanted. A man in the Bible enjoyed working with clay, too. Perhaps it happened like this. Lifting the corner of a wet cloth, the skilled artist cut a slab of clay from the large lump. He slapped it down on the potter's wheel and sat down. He pulled his robe up to his knees. Then slowly, he began to turn his wheel and form the clay. Underneath the potter's hands, the clay seemed to take on a life of its own. Once flat, it now had a hollow center and smooth, pale sides. The potter dipped his hands quickly in a basin of water and returned to his work. Almost lovingly, his hands put pressure, and the shape responded instantly. Rounded sides began to narrow to form a long neck. A lip was formed in the front. Then the potter's wheel slowed and came to a stop. The potter braided some smooth pieces of clay together. He fastened them firmly onto one side of the pot to make a handle. With a happy smile, he slid his creation off the wheel, setting it carefully on the drying shelf. What was once a slab of clay had become a beautiful clay pitcher. The potter looked out at the busy street. Customers stood nearby watching him work. Some bought clay pots for water or for flour. But the potter kept working. His fresh batch of clay wouldn't last long. He cut another slab from the batch. As he had done before, he slapped it onto his potter's wheel. Round and round and up and down, as the sides of a water pot rose from his hands, his attention was drawn to a man watching him. The potter looked up and smiled. But in that instant, the sides of the pot fell into the center, and the spinning wheel came to a stop. Oh, I'm so sorry, 
the man said as his hand flew to his mouth. The potter waved his hand in the air. Think nothing of it, he said. I'll fix it in no time. The man introduced himself. My name is Jeremiah. I was sent here by God to watch you work. The potter seemed interested. The beauty of clay, he said, is that if it is too thin in one spot, or if I find mistakes as I go along, I just pinch out the problem or pat down the lump and start over. Sometimes that makes it even stronger than before. I always try to make the clay into what it seems best for. So mistakes can be fixed, Jeremiah suggested. That's right. I can shape and reshape the clay until it's just what it should be. And when I'm happy with it, others will find it beautiful and useful too. Jeremiah nodded. Your work is beautiful, he said. He stood and watched the potter a little longer. Then he admired the objects on display once more. There were small oil lamps for a bedroom, pitchers of all sizes for cream, milk, or water, huge pots for storing olives or grain, or for cooling water. Everything was made from the same material by the same Creator. Yet each was a little different. Each one had a special purpose. This was the lesson God wanted Jeremiah to learn. That is why he sent Jeremiah to watch the potter at work. Now Jeremiah could explain how God shapes each person's life, how he corrects the mistakes that happen and uses them to form something beautiful. In God's hands, every life can be of service to others. Today's story is called Safe at Last. The memory verse is from John chapter 14, verse 2. It says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Today's message is church is a place of refuge where we can worship together. Marla was in trouble. Big trouble. She had accidentally dropped a whole box of eggs. What a mess! Well, there was nothing else to do. She had to tell her mother and clean up the floor. It was an accident, Mom, she began. I didn't mean to drop the eggs. Honest, I didn't. I know that, Marla, responded her mother. I'm just glad it happened in the kitchen where the floor can be cleaned easily. Sometimes accidents just happen, but people don't always understand. That's what happened in our story today. He staggered down the road breathing in short gasps. <gasps> the stabbing pain in his side made him stumble. He looked over his shoulder in terror. There was no one behind him that he could see, but he knew someone would be coming. He faced forward again and tried to run faster. It couldn't be very far away now. The city of Shechem, the city of refuge. The road down which he ran was in good condition. And all the crossroads had signposts that marked the way. Refuge, they read. Refuge! At least he wouldn't get lost. The only question was, would he make it to the city in time? He hadn't meant to harm his neighbor. He hadn't meant to hurt him. But the axe head had flown off and struck his neighbor's face. It was true. He had accidentally killed a man. Yes, he had done it. However, it had been an unfortunate, unplanned accident. Even so, his neighbor's family would come after him. A life for a life. 
That was the law. But if he could get to the city of refuge, he would be safe. He would explain it all to the elders, everything that happened. And they would keep him safe until a trial could be held. He looked back again. Someone was running along the road behind him, far back in the distance. <gasps> he sobbed and turned and tried to run even faster. He had to make it to Shechem. The city gates were just ahead. Elders were waiting there to see if he would be permitted in. He ran faster. He would make it. He had made it. God was good. Having cities of refuge was God's idea. He knew that sometimes people get accused of something they did not do, and sometimes bad things happened by accident. So God told Moses to set aside cities here and there throughout the nation of Israel, cities where people could run for safety and be given a fair trial. But the cities of refuge could only keep people safe if they stayed inside the city. If they went outside the city walls, they could be caught and hurt. Sometimes the people seeking safety had to live there the rest of their lives unless the high priest died. If that happened, all was forgiven and they could go free. We need a place of refuge today too, and God has provided one for us. Church is a place of refuge where we worship together. Today's story is called Hidden Treasure. The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 119, verse 105. It says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. The message is God leads us as we study and obey His word. Have you ever looked forward to something and then everything seemed to go wrong? Josiah was so excited when Shepan came with the scroll from the temple. Shepan returned to King Josiah and reported about the work on the temple. The builders have done their work well. They used the money as directed for rebuilding the temple. They have bought materials and paid the workers. Then he added, And Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. Shaphan showed a scroll to the king. What's on this scroll? asked King Josiah. It is the book of the law that was lost during your grandfather's reign, said Shaphan. King Josiah sat up in his chair. He opened his eyes really wide. Really? he said with a big smile. This is wonderful. Please read it to me. King Josiah listened very carefully. As Chapin read, King Josiah's smile turned into a frown. He moaned and cried. Then he jumped up and tore his clothes. He couldn't believe what he had heard. The book said the Israelites would be punished for their sins. I have tried so hard to help the people to do right, he thought. We must ask the Lord about the words, he said to Shepan. I know the Lord is angry because of what my father and grandfather did. They led the people to do wrong. Find out what will happen to the people who are alive today. Shepan and some other men went to see the prophet Huldah. When they got to her house, they read to her what the king had heard. Huldah, please, explain this to us. What do these words mean? they asked. Tell the king this is what the Lord God is saying, said Huldah. I will do everything that is written in this book. The people disobeyed me. They worshipped other gods. They have done a lot of bad things. They will be punished so that they will know that sin causes trouble. But tell King Josiah that God has a special message for him, Huldah continued. God says to Josiah, 
You have listened to my words about what will happen to your people. You are sorry for what they have done. You even tore your clothes to show how troubled you were. I have heard your sorrow. I will let you die in peace. You won't have to see all the trouble that will come to your people. Shaphan took Huldah's message back to King Josiah. King Josiah knew now that he couldn't save the people from their punishment, but he could keep it from happening right away. He would help them follow God, and they could teach their families to do the same. He decided to do all he could to help prepare the people to obey God. He called all the people together, including the older leaders of the kingdom and the priest. Together they went to the temple. There he read to them from the book of the law. My people, I want to follow the Lord and obey all his commands, King Josiah said. Will you promise me that you will do the same? And the people said, We will! We will obey the Lord our God! God wants us to make that same promise, and He will lead us as we study and obey His Word. Today's story is called Breakfast with the Birds. The memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. It says, I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. Today's message is God knows my needs. He cares about me. Have you ever watched birds eating? What do they eat? If God told you that birds would bring your food, what would you expect? Bird seed? Worms? Some fruit? A long time ago, God sent birds to feed a man. Elijah's bird story is not what you might expect. Long ago, wicked King Ahab ruled the land of Israel. Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any other king. King Ahab and his queen Jezebel worshipped idols. They led all of Israel to worship idols too. They encouraged the people to disobey the Lord's commands. Jezebel and the prophets of Baal boldly killed the Lord's prophets. God had a prophet whose name was Elijah. He was from Tishbe in the land of Gilead on the other side of the Jordan River. Elijah served God and taught others to worship him. God was troubled by the idol worship he saw in the land. He knew it encouraged wickedness in Israel. The priests of Baal taught the people that Baal sent the rain and dew. They believed Baal also controlled the rivers and the streams. Elijah knew that it was God who controlled nature and not Baal. So God asked Elijah to deliver a message to King Ahab. Elijah knew that Ahab didn't want a message from the Lord. He knew that the palace guards would recognize him as a prophet of God. They might try to arrest him. They might even turn Elijah over to Jezebel and her wicked priests of Baal. But in spite of the dangers, Elijah didn't hesitate. He went to Samaria and, without stopping for the guards, marched right into the palace. He walked right up to the king and delivered God's message. As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word, Elijah proclaimed, and then he quickly turned and left. Elijah was not alone when he marched in to see Ahab. Without God's protection, he surely would have been stopped by the guards and put to death. But God was with him when he went in. 
and God was with him as he left. Leave here at once, God told Elijah. Go eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine. You will find water in the brook there, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you. And that's exactly what happened. Elijah found a safe, quiet place on a hillside above the brook. Every morning and evening, the birds brought food to Elijah. And for many months, Elijah drank water from the brook. As long as the brook flowed, he had water to drink. Elijah felt safe in God's care. Every time the ravens swooped down bringing food, Elijah knew that God was giving him the gift of life, and Elijah knew that his life was precious to God. Today's story is called More Than Meets the Eye. The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 34, verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Today's message is God helps us when we are in trouble. Can you remember a time when you were really afraid of something or someone? Was it a noise, a person, or maybe a situation? In our Bible story for today, Elisha's servant was very frightened. Let's find out why. Israel and Aram were at war, and God was helping Israel. Whenever the Aramean king would plan to attack the king of Israel, God would tell Elisha. Then Elisha would warn the king of Israel, Don't travel to the east today, because the Arameans are going to be there. And sure enough, the king of Aram would be hiding just where Elisha said. This happened time after time, and it made the king of Aram very, very angry. Who is a spy for Israel? He growled at his generals. Only one general knew the truth. None of us are spies, he said. But Elisha, the prophet, he knows everything we are about to do. He even knows what you say in your bedroom. Where is this man? The king of Aram roared. Go find out where he is so I can send men to capture him. The report came back. He is staying in Dothan. Then we will attack Dothan and get rid of this nuisance, the king announced. He called his fighting men and sent them off to capture one lone prophet. The king was sure that if his army could capture Elisha, they could defeat Israel. What a foolish idea. Elisha hadn't been spying. God, who knew everything, was protecting his people. One of the first people to wake up in the morning was Elisha's servant. He saw the large Aramean army camped around the city. He saw horses. He saw chariots. He saw armor glistening in the first rays of the rising sun. Oh, what will we do? He cried. Elisha's servant was afraid. He had forgotten whose side God was on. Elisha hadn't. Those that are with us are more than those that are with them, he explained to his servant. Then he asked God to open his servant's eyes. When the servant looked again, he saw another army. It covered the hills around Dothan, and its chariots shone like fire. It was God's army, and his army wasn't going to let anything happen to Elisha and his servants. Elisha prayed again, Strike the enemy army with blindness, Lord. So God made the whole enemy army blind. Then Elisha went out of the city. He marched right up to the blind general. This isn't the road you want, 
he said. Follow me and I will lead you to the one you are looking for. Elisha led the blind enemy army right to the king of Israel. Then God opened the enemy soldiers' eyes. They were trapped inside Israel's capital city. Shall I kill them? asked the king of Israel. No, Elisha responded, thinking of God's grace. Feed them and then send them home. That's exactly what the king of Israel did. God had conquered the enemy with blindness, a good meal, and grace. God helped Elisha when he was in trouble. He will do the same for you because he loves you very much. Today's story is called Time to Pray. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. The message is, I worship God in my daily, quiet prayer time. How often do you talk to someone you love and who loves you? Once or twice every day? Jesus talked with God every day because He loved God and knew God loved Him. The man called out, Unclean! Unclean! It had been a long time since he had noticed the first pale spot. When more spots appeared, he had gone to the priest, and he heard those awful words, You have leprosy. He had to leave his family and home. Whenever he came near people, he had to cry, Unclean! One day the leper heard that Jesus healed people. He wondered about that. Could Jesus heal him? Maybe Jesus could cure him. The leper did not know how to find Jesus, but he would try. He could not go near the cities, so he looked for Jesus in the small towns. He traveled on mountain trails where no one else went. Finally, the leper found Jesus, teaching people by a lake. He stood away from the crowd and watched. He saw Jesus heal people. He listened to Jesus' kind words. His hope became faith. He believed Jesus could help him. So that man began to move closer to the crowd. He forgot that he wasn't supposed to be near people. He thought only about being healed. When people saw him, some ran away. Others shouted at him. Others tried to stop him from getting close to Jesus. They did everything but touch him. But the leper had not come this far to give up. He fell to his knees, saying, Lord, I know you can heal me and make me clean if you choose to. I will, said Jesus, as he touched the man. Be healed. He touched me, thought the man. No one has ever touched me in a long, long time. He looked at his arm. The white patches had disappeared. All over his body, the sores had disappeared. His skin had returned to a normal color, just like that of the people watching him. Go now and see the priests, said Jesus. Let them say you are clean and give your thank offering but don't tell anyone what I did for you. The man did as Jesus said, except for one thing. He told everyone he met, and more people than ever began looking for Jesus. They followed him everywhere. Jesus needed some quiet time to talk with God. He often slipped away from the people for a while so he could have time to pray, time to talk with his father. It was hard to talk when people were crowding about him. So Jesus found quiet places where he would not be disturbed. Often Jesus would get up when it was still dark to talk to his father, or he would pray all night. His favorite quiet place was the Garden of Gethsemane. 
So many people wanted so much from him. He knew he needed power and wisdom from God, so he prayed every day. Every day, he slipped away from people to have some quiet time with God. We can get power and wisdom from God, too. We need daily prayer time, too. When we pray and worship God every day, He is with us. Today's story is called The Great Escape. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 12, verse 5. It says, Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Today's message is very important. God hears and answers our prayers according to what is best for us. Have you ever tried to open a door and found it was locked? Peter was in prison behind locked doors. Would he ever leave that cold, dark place? At first, Peter could not sleep. He lay on the cold, hard ground in the dark. His hands were chained to two guards. He hurt all over. His only comfort was knowing that the other believers were praying for him. Fourteen other soldiers stood outside the cell guarding him. To escape was humanly impossible. All the excitement of being arrested made him very tired. Soon he fell into a deep sleep. Peter felt something, or someone, touch him. He woke up to a bright light. An angel reached out to him. Quickly, get up, the angel said. Peter thought he was dreaming until the chains fell off his wrists. Put on your clothes and sandals, said the angel. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter obeyed. He felt as if he were still dreaming. Quietly, the angel led Peter past all 14 guards. When they reached the prison gate, it opened by itself. As they walked down the street, the angel disappeared. Peter knew then that this was not a dream. He was awake. I know the Lord sent his angel to rescue me from Herod, he said to himself. Peter walked to John Mark's mother's house. He knew the believers had gathered there to pray. Peter knocked softly on the outer door. Rhoda, a servant girl, answered. Who is it? She asked through the closed door. Rhoda, Rhoda, Peter whispered. It's Peter. Peter, she shouted joyfully. He's at the door. Then, without opening the door, she ran back to tell the others. Peter stood there surprised that she hadn't let him in. He put his ear to the door. He could hear a voice inside saying, Rhoda, you're out of your mind. No, it's true, Rhoda cried. Peter knocked again. Peter's in jail, said another voice. But I heard him, said Rhoda. Peter knocked again. He's got four squads of soldiers guarding him, said someone else. I know it's his voice, insisted Rhoda. Peter knocked harder. It is Peter, Rhoda said in a tearful voice. Peter didn't want to wake up the whole neighborhood, but he knocked loudly once more. Everyone rushed toward the door. They yanked it open and almost shouted when they saw Peter. He motioned for them to be quiet. Their voices dropped to a whisper as they pulled him inside the house. Everyone began talking at once, saying, Praise God! Peter, you're safe! We've been praying for you all night! Then Peter told them how the Lord's angel had helped him escape. When he finished, he said, I've got to go somewhere that is safer. Tell James and the others what happened. Thank you for your prayers. 
I know that's why the angel came to set me free. Crossing the Runaway River The message is God gives us leaders to help us do great things for Him. Our memory verse this week is Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. The Lord will do amazing things among you. How do you feel when you wake up on a day when you know something exciting is going to happen? What if it's something you've never done before? Let's imagine how an Israelite boy may have experienced a very exciting day. Sunlight streamed through the tent flap, waking Heber. He stretched lazily for a moment before he remembered. Joshua said today was the day. Today the Lord would do something amazing. What would it be? Heber wondered. God had done amazing things for the Israelites. He'd heard hundreds of times about how God had parted the Red Sea and led the people out of Egypt. He had eaten manna every day of his life. It was amazing. Food every day without fail. And then, not long ago, an Israelite army had defeated those two kings, Sihon and Og. Yes, God had done some amazing things, Heber decided. But those things had all happened when Moses had been leading. Moses was dead now, and Joshua was their new leader. Was Joshua as good a leader as Moses? Heber wondered. Would God still do amazing things for the Israelites? Heber got up and stepped outside. It had rained a lot lately, and the days were getting warmer. The melting snow in the mountains raced toward the river. The Jordan River was a muddy, angry torrent high over its banks. Canaan, the promised land, was on the other side of it, and they had been camped here for three days. His thoughts were interrupted by his father's urgent voice. Joshua is giving instructions, he said. Come quickly. Joshua was already speaking when Heber and his father arrived. The Ark of the Covenant will go into the Jordan ahead of you, he was saying. You are to move out from your positions and follow it. As soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up like a wall. The priests will remain in the middle of the river while the entire Israelite camp crosses. So break camp now and get ready. We have no time to waste, Heber's father said. Heber gulped down some manna as he helped to pack. They soon heard the order to line up. Up ahead, he could see the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Moving forward, they were leading the entire Israelite camp straight towards the rushing, roaring river. The priests didn't hesitate for a moment as they stepped right into the rapids. As soon as their feet touched the water, it stopped. The water came to a complete halt, piling up just as Joshua had said it would. The water downstream of the priests kept flowing away from them. In a matter of seconds, the water had disappeared around a bend. The priests moved to the middle of the river. A great shout went up from the Israelites. Yay! The line of people moved quickly to the riverbank. They began to pick their way across the rocky riverbed and up the other side. Heber couldn't take his eyes off the priests. His own family moved across the riverbed, over and around rocks. They tried to avoid the little puddles the river left behind. The priest still stood in the middle of the riverbed, still holding the ark high. The next thing Heber knew, he was scrambling up the bank into Canaan. Then he turned to watch while the last of the Israelites stepped into the promised land. Finally, the priests crossed. The instant the last priest cleared the banks, 
the waters broke loose. With a fearsome thunder, they resumed their mighty journey. It was over. As easily as that, their long journey was over. Heber sat down on the riverbank. He looked up at the fluffy clouds overhead. There's no doubt, he thought. God is with Joshua, just as he was with Moses. And I believe even more amazing things are still to come. Today's story is called The Parable of the Great Beast. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 14, verse 15. It says, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Today's message is Jesus invites us to be with him in heaven. Jesus told a story once about someone who had prepared a great feast. When the feast was ready, he sent to call the guest. Find out what happened and what it could mean for us. Once, Jesus and his disciples were having a meal at someone's house, and Jesus told this story. A man gave a big banquet and invited many people, Jesus began. When it was time to eat, the man sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, everything is ready. But all the guests said that they could not come. Each man made an excuse. The first one said, I have just bought a land, and I must go look at it. Please excuse me. Another man said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen. I must go try them. Please excuse me. A third man said, I just got married. I can't come. So the servant returned. He told his master what had happened. Then the master became angry and said, Go at once into the streets and the alleys of the town. Bring in the poor, the cripple, the blind, and the lame. Later the servant said to him, Master, I did what you told me to do, but we still have places for more people. The master said to the servant, Go out into the roads and country lanes. Tell the people there to come. I want my house to be full. None of those men that I invited first will ever eat with me. Jesus was talking about himself in this parable. He is like the man who planned the party and invited many people. Jesus has invited everyone to accept his salvation, which leads to eternal life. And he's giving you an invitation. Many people in the story had excuses for not coming to the party. They let other things become more important than being with their friend. They weren't really true friends at all. Because they were too busy with things, they turned down the invitation and missed the great feast. In this parable, the invitation to the banquet is Jesus' invitation for us to accept his salvation. Accepting salvation means that we ask Jesus to forgive our sins and choose to do the things he wants us to do. We have a choice. We can decide to accept his invitation or to let other things become more important in our lives. How about you? Right now, will you say yes to the invitation Jesus has given you? Do you want to be with him in heaven and experience the joy of being in his presence forever? Today's story is called The Golden Rule. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. It says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Today's message is Jesus helps me treat others as I want to be treated. Sarah frowned. The other girls in the lunchroom were pointing at her and laughing. 
Why were they always so unkind? Then the thought came to her, What would Jesus do? And she looked right at those girls and smiled. Jesus taught that we should treat others as we want to be treated. Imagine that a young boy named Ephraim is listening to Jesus speak. Ephraim got up just before daylight. Would he be pulling weeds in the garden today? Then his father spoke. Today, we are going to listen to Jesus. Ephraim was happy. He had heard that Jesus was the Messiah, and he really wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. Jesus was healing people by the seashore, and the beach was filling up with people. Ephraim and his family hurried to find a place. They watched as some rulers arrived. The rulers frowned at the crowd. Jesus began to climb the hill away from the beach. The people pushed along behind him until they came to a quiet meadow. Jesus sat down near a tree. His disciples pressed through the crowd to be near him. All around him, people sat quietly as he began to speak. The rulers stood in the shade of a nearby tree. Jesus spoke calmly, but so all could hear. Make the kingdom of God first in your life. Ephraim thought, The kingdom of God? What does that mean? Don't judge other people, and you won't be judged yourself. Ephraim thought of the rulers who believed they were better than others. He wondered, Could it be possible that God cares about humble people? Is there any place in Jesus' kingdom for me and my family? Then Jesus taught a lesson about finding fault and judging people. Jesus said, Why do you look at the speck of a sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take out the speck, when all the time there is a plank in your own? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Ephraim grinned as he imagined how it would look to have a big plank of wood in his eye. Everyone was laughing, except some of the rulers. Jesus spoke of God's love. Then he announced a rule of his kingdom. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Now Ephraim understood. In Jesus' kingdom, everyone would treat everyone else fairly. They would not find fault with each other. Instead, they would want Jesus to remove their faults. People would live to serve others. God wins again. The message is, when God wins, we are winners. This week, our memory verse is, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23, verse 6. I won! I won! Mikhail shouted. I made the final point! His teammates frowned and turned away. Recess was over. It was time for Bible class. Here's the story they studied. What do you think Mikkel might have learned? David and his 600 men marched from the city of Ziklag to help Achish, the Philistine king, fight a battle. But the Philistine princes would not let David and his men help, so they had to turn around and march all the way back to Ziklag. As Ziklag appeared in the distance, the men were shocked to see the smoke rising. While they were gone, the Amalekites had attacked and burned their city to the ground. Their wives, children, and cattle were all gone. All that was left was smoke and ashes. It's all your fault, David, the men accused. You should have left soldiers here to take care of our families. David was upset, too. He had lost some of his own family. Now the men were blaming him. What should he do? David's first thought was to turn to God. He knew God would show him what to do. Bring the ephod, he told Abathar the priest. 
Shall we go after the Amalekites? David asked the Lord. Will we reach them and get our families back? The ephod had two large gemstones on it. When the priest asked a question of God, one of the stones would glow as if the answer was yes. And that is what happened. Go, the priest said. You will reach them and get everything back again. So David and his 600 soldiers set out to find the Amalekites. But when they reached the Besar Ravine, they stopped. 200 soldiers were just too tired to go any farther. So David left them to rest and guard the supplies. A little farther on, David and his men found an Egyptian lying in the field, a slave to one of the Amalekites. He had been abandoned because of illness. He was weak from hunger and thirst. David and his men gave him some water and food and then asked the man to help them find the Amalekites. So the Egyptian led David to the Amalekite camp. From a distance, they watched the Amalekites eating and drinking, celebrating their victory. David and his men attacked the Amalekites at sunset. The battle lasted all night and the next day. When it was over, the Amalekites were defeated. Only 400 men escaped on their camels. David and his men rescued everything and every person that had been stolen from Ziklag. David and the soldiers collected their families, their possessions, and their animals. They gathered things that they had captured from the Amalekites and began the long walk home. As they neared Besar Ravine, the 200 men who had stayed behind came out to meet them. But some of David's weary soldiers were not glad to see how rested their friends looked. We'll give these men back their wives and their children, they grumbled, but nothing else. They didn't help us win, so they shouldn't share the goods. Wait, David said, who won this battle? We didn't win, the Lord did. He gave us this victory, he protected us so all will share alike. And that's the good news of God's grace. When God wins the battle, he shares the victory. We are all winners because Jesus won the victory over sin and Satan. Today's story is called Too Many Offerings. The memory verse is from Psalm 54, verse 6. It says, I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. Today's message is, I worship God with my offerings. Enough! Enough! laughed Dad. I have enough on my plate already. Mother smiled. What about you, Josh? Do you have enough on your plate? Josh grinned. He knew what his mother was thinking. He would eat everything on his plate and ask for more. And she would tease him about eating like a horse. When is enough enough? A long time ago, Moses told the Israelites, Don't bring any more. We have more than enough. Here's how it happened. Quick, called Father, breathlessly as he stuck his head inside the tent. Moses has an important announcement to make. The entire Israelite community is gathering. Mother dropped what she was doing and grabbed the baby. Leah was close on her heels, followed by her younger brothers, Zibion and Gershon. The family was quickly joined by other Israelite families all gathering to hear what Moses had to say. Soon Moses stood up to speak. The low murmur of the crowd stopped. God has given me instructions for a tent of meeting, Moses began. A special place where God will meet with us and where we will worship him. We need a lot of fine materials. Only those who want to should contribute, continued Moses. 
We will need gold, silver, and bronze. We will need yarn in blue, purple, and scarlet. We need fine linen. We need animal skins, acacia wood, olive oil, spices, and gemstones. You should donate only if your heart has been moved by God. Your gifts will be an offering to Him. We will also need skilled craftsmen of every kind, spinners and weavers to help us prepare the materials. People who can work in gold, silver, and bronze. We need people who know how to cut and set stones, carpenters to work with wood, spinners to spin goat hair and linen, and weavers to make curtains and the special garments the priests will wear. Bezael of the tribe of Judah. And Oholiab of the tribe of Dan will be in charge of the workers and their work. God's spirit has filled them with skill and knowledge, and the ability to teach others to do this special work. As soon as Moses stopped talking, a buzz of excitement spread through the crowd. Mother, Leah began excitedly. We can help in lots of ways. You're one of the best spinners and weavers in the whole camp. I'll watch the baby so you can spin. And we have a bronze mirror and comb. Chimed in Zibion. Moses said they need bronze. And Leah and Mother have gold jewelry. Added Gershon. We do have gold earrings and bracelets. Agreed Leah. Her best friend in Egypt had given her the bracelets the night they had left. The next day, the family excitedly gathered their items. Together, they took them to the place where the building materials were being collected. Piles were beginning to form: gold jewelry here, silver over there, bronze bowls, and other utensils a little farther on. Animal skins, acacia wood. Goat hair and linen each had their own stack. Excitement filled the air, making it feel like a joyous holiday. Every day, Leah and Zibion and Gershon walked past the growing piles of materials. Then one day, the builders told Moses, "We don't need any more materials. We have more than enough now." So Moses told the people to stop donating. The people of Israel had come through. They loved God very much. They wanted to see the tabernacle built too. Today's story is called "Heavy Enough to Float." The memory verse is from Matthew chapter seven, verse seven. It says. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Today's message is God cares all about my problems. Pedro needed a calculator to do part of his math homework, but he did not own one. Jose let him borrow his calculator until tomorrow. When Pedro arrived home from school, he opened his backpack. He took out his math book and looked for Jose's calculator. It was gone. He called his friends, but no one knew where it was. Oh man, what a problem! What was he going to tell Jose? A young man in our Bible story today lost something that he borrowed, and he was very worried too. One day, some young men who studied at a special school for the prophets heard good news. The prophet Elisha was coming to visit them. They were happy about that. They could tell Elisha anything, and he would listen. The young men knew that the building where they stayed was too small, and they wanted to build another place. They talked it over with Elisha. He agreed, and they decided to build a bigger building. So they set aside a special day to go to the banks of the Jordan River. 
There, they would cut logs for the new school. Elisha agreed to go with them. One young man had borrowed an axe. He wanted to help build the new school building. Happily, he joined the group working at the river that day. Some chopped down trees, others cut the trees into boards. The prophet Elisha worked right along with them. As they worked, they talked about God's love and care. Then, with one swing of the axe, whoosh, everything changed. The young man with the borrowed axe lifted it into the air. The iron axe head flew off. With a splash, it landed in the river. Oh, master! The student cried out. The axe was borrowed, and I have no money to pay for it. His friends came running. They all stared into the dark water. Elisha hurried to the river bank too, but he couldn't see the lost axe head either. Where in the water did it go? Elisha asked. All the young man could do was point. Elisha turned and looked around at the trees. Finding just the right tree, he cut off a small branch. Then he carried it to the river's edge. He threw the stick into the water where the young man had pointed. The stick made a little splash. Then, ever so slowly, the stick and the axe head came to the surface. They floated together in the water. A gasp went up from all the students. <gasps> the biggest gasp of all came from the young man who had lost the axe head. Just moments before, he had thought that his life was ruined. God, through Elisha, had turned the young man's accident into a miracle. He had taken an ordinary workday and turned it into a day to remember forever. The tired but excited young men walked back to the school that evening. They talked with Elisha about what had happened. They were even more sure that God loved them and cared for them. They knew that no problem was too big or too small to take to God. Today's story is called The Face of an Angel. The memory verse is from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says, Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. Today's message is believers encourage one another to grow in faith. One Sabbath, the pastor told the church that Brother Santana's wife was in the hospital. Pedro and Sarita wanted to encourage Brother and Sister Santana, so they made a pretty card. Mother helped them write a note in the card. They helped make some food to take to the Santana's home. The Santanas were so happy. Pedro and Sarita were happy, too. They had encouraged their friends. A long time ago, another church had people who needed help. Today's Bible story tells how they were encouraged. The apostles were very, very busy. Many believers were joining the new church. Some of the believers were widows. Others were elderly. All needed food and care. The apostles couldn't preach and teach and give out food, too. So the believers chose seven men to help. They called these men deacons. Stephen was one of those deacons. Richly blessed by God, he comforted and encouraged the people. He made them think of Jesus. And God gave him power to do great miracles. Everyone in the church loved Stephen. However, some leaders in the church didn't love him. They hated his teachings about Jesus. Stephen's words were so powerful that these men couldn't argue with him. They decided that they had to stop him. What could they do? They decided to pay some men to tell lies about Stephen. The lies upset everybody, 
the ordinary people, and some teachers of the law. The leader sent men to bring Stephen to a meeting, and they had the liars come too, so they could accuse him. The leaders watched Stephen carefully. They expected him to be nervous or worried. Instead, Stephen's face glowed. The Bible says his face looked like the face of an angel. The high priest glared at Stephen. Are these things true? He growled. He was speaking of the lies that had been told about Stephen. Stephen didn't answer yes or no. Instead, he began to tell the story of the Jewish people. He told about God's plan for sending a Savior to the world. First, Stephen reminded them of God's promise to Abraham. Then he talked about Abraham's son, Isaac, and Isaac's son, Jacob, and Jacob's son, Joseph, who, through God's power, became a ruler in Egypt. Stephen reminded the leaders how God had used Joseph to protect Jacob's family during the terrible famine. Then Stephen reminded them of Moses. Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, but our ancestors turned against Moses. You stubborn Jewish leaders, he said. You have not given your hearts to God. You won't even listen to him. You do not hear what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. Your ancestors were like this, and you are just like them. Your fathers tried to hurt every prophet who ever lived. Those prophets said long ago that the righteous one would come, but your fathers killed them. And now you have turned against the righteous one and killed him. That did it. Everyone started shouting at once, but Stephen stayed calm. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he was looking up. He saw something that no one else could see. Look, I see heaven open, and I see the Son of Man standing at God's right side. The leaders covered their ears with their hands and ran for Stephen. They dragged him through the streets all the way outside the city. There they tore off their coats and they threw stones at Stephen. Stephen died calmly, just as Jesus did. He didn't fight against the Jewish leaders. He fell on his knees and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. After this prayer of mercy, he died. Stephen encouraged the believers as he cared for their needs. The Holy Spirit filled him with love for others. The Holy Spirit wants us to help and encourage others as Stephen did. Today's story is called, Who Cheated? The memory verse is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. It says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Today's message is God helps us serve others faithfully and patiently. Have you ever worked hard and long for someone you love? Maybe it was helping your dad stack wood or repair the house. Or maybe you helped your mom in the garden all day. You were glad when it was over, but because you loved that person, it was worth it. Jacob had been at Laban's house for a month. One day Laban said, Jacob, you are my relative. It doesn't seem right for you to keep working for me without pay. Tell me, what wages would you like? Jacob was glad to be at his uncle's house. He didn't mind the work, and he also had been admiring Uncle Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel. Uncle Laban, what I would really like is to marry Rachel. I will work seven years for you if you will let Rachel become my wife. Laban agreed. That sounds like a fine arrangement to me. Yes, stay here and work for me. In those days, a man gave money to the father of the woman he wanted to marry. 
After the wedding, the father was to give the money to his daughter. It became her own to keep. Some men didn't have money for the bride price or dowry, as it was called. So if the father agreed, the man could work for him for a certain amount of time. And that's what Jacob had to do. So Jacob began seven years of work to make Rachel his wife. Day after day, he faithfully and patiently did all that Laban asked. And the time seemed to pass quickly because of his love for Rachel. Finally, the seven years were up. It was time to make Rachel his bride. But Laban was not honest or fair with Jacob. He liked having Jacob work without pay. He knew that Jacob worked hard without complaining. It was clear that God was helping Jacob to become a faithful worker, and he didn't cost Laban anything. So Laban decided to do something very wrong. He would trick Jacob to get more free labor from him. In those days, the bride wore a heavy veil during the wedding celebration. No one was to see her face. That night, Jacob took his veiled bride to his tent. He couldn't see that it was Leah, not Rachel. In the morning, Jacob made a terrible discovery. He had married the wrong sister. He was shocked and angry. How could his uncle have done such a thing? Uncle Laban, why have you done this? Jacob asked. I worked hard for you so I could marry Rachel. Why did you trick me? It is our custom, Laban lied, for the older sister to marry before the younger. But I'll make a bargain with you. You may also marry Rachel if you work for me for another seven years. In those days, in that country, many men had more than one wife. So at the end of the week of Leah's wedding celebration, Jacob and Rachel were also married. Then Jacob began to work seven more years for Laban. Jacob worked without pay for 14 years, a long time, to marry Rachel. Patiently, he served Laban all that time. He truly believed that having Rachel for his wife was worth it, and God helped him to serve faithfully even when the work was hard. When we really love someone, we will serve faithfully and with patience, too. Today's story is called Put Out to Pasture. Today's memory verse is from Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Let your speech always be with grace, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. The message is, I can serve God wherever I am. Would you like to live in a field with cows and eat grass? A king once spent seven years living among the animals. This is how it happened. King Nebuchadnezzar was bothered by the dream of the great image. He was flattered and pleased that Babylon was first but it worried him that other kingdoms came after his kingdom. Then he had another strange dream. Nebuchadnezzar's wise men could not interpret the dream. So once again, Nebuchadnezzar sent for Daniel. He told Daniel about his dream. This is what he told Daniel. I dreamed a large tree in the middle of a plain. It was enormous, and it seemed to reach up to heaven. The leaves were beautiful and the fruit plentiful. The birds made their home in its branches and the animals sheltered under it. Then suddenly I saw a holy one. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, cut down the tree, trim off the branches. 
Tell the animals to run away and the birds to find another home. But leave the stump in the field and put a brass and iron band around it. Then the voice continued. Let him be drenched with dew. Let him live with the animals. Let his mind be like an animal until seven times pass. I have made this decision so that the living may know that God is the ruler of all the kingdoms, and he gives them to whom he wants to. When Daniel heard the dream, he was troubled. The meaning was plain to him, and it was not a pleasant message to deliver to the king. The king might become angry, but Nebuchadnezzar tried to reassure him he just wanted to know what the dream meant. Daniel knew that God wanted him to speak the truth, so he told the king that his dream was a warning from God. He explained that Nebuchadnezzar was the tree. He had become great, strong, and powerful. He ruled over many places. However, God saw his pride. If Nebuchadnezzar did not acknowledge him as Lord, something strange and terrible would happen. He would become insane and live in the fields like an animal for seven years. At the end of that time, he would become king again. Daniel encouraged Nebuchadnezzar to turn away from his sins and his pride. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar he should do what was right. He urged the king to be kind to those in need then maybe this vision wouldn't happen. A year later, Nebuchadnezzar was walking on the roof of the royal palace. He looked at all the wonderful things around him. He swelled with pride and smiled to himself. Is this not great Babylon that I have built by my power and for the glory of my majesty? No sooner had he said these words than he heard a voice from heaven. Nebuchadnezzar, you will become like an animal. You will live out in the fields for seven years. At the end of that time, you will acknowledge me as Lord. Then you will become king again. It was just as God had said. He lived outside in the field like an animal for seven years. At the end of the seven years, Nebuchadnezzar became sane again. He praised God as the ruler of the earth. His advisors and nobles came to talk with him, and he was made king once more. It was hard for Daniel to deliver God's message to Nebuchadnezzar. But God was with him, and God will be with you as you serve him wherever you are. Today's story is called Power. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke of the Word of God boldly. Today's message is, At church, we learn of God's power in our lives. Sven and Karina lived in Sweden many years ago. While still children, they learned that Jesus is coming soon. Their mother and father began to share this good news with others. But it was against the law in Sweden for grown-ups to preach that Jesus is coming soon, so they were put into prison for breaking that law. The people who believed that Jesus is coming soon prayed for courage. God's Holy Spirit filled Sven and Karina. Even though they were children, they preached God's message boldly. The Holy Spirit gave them courage to do so but they were not the first. Our Bible story today is about some early church members who prayed together for courage to preach Jesus' message. Peter and John squinted their eyes against the bright sunlight. Deep breaths of fresh air felt good as they were led from the prison. They looked at each other and smiled. It was good to be outdoors again, even for a short time. A special meeting of the most important men in the country would take place that day, and Peter and John had been ordered to be there. Who knew what would happen? 
But they were not afraid. They knew that God would be with them. Everyone hushed as Peter and John entered the room. Robes rustled. Men shifted to get a better view. Then one of the leaders cleared his throat and began. How do you do this? What power do you have? Whose name do you use? The leader was talking about the miracle that Peter and John had done in Jesus' name the day before. A well-known lame man had been healed, and everybody was talking about it. Many people who heard the miracle also heard Peter and John's message. They now believed in Jesus. Because of this, the Jewish leaders were not happy. Peter quietly looked around at the rulers. He was a different man from the Peter who had denied knowing Jesus just a few days ago. Now he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He began to speak. We are being called to account today for an act of kindness to a man who could not walk. You ask us how this happened. Know this, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that he was healed. Yes, Jesus, the one whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead. Peter continued boldly on. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name by which we must be saved. The rulers looked amazed. Why, the man spoke without fear, clearly and boldly. Those leaders soon decided that Peter and John had been changed because they had been with Jesus. What should they do? They couldn't say that the miracle hadn't happened. The man who had been lame was standing right there, and he certainly wasn't lame anymore. There was a bounce in his step and a smile on his face. He knew he had been healed. The rulers finally decided to order Peter and John not to talk about it. But Peter and John stood firm and said, Is it right to obey you rather than God? Once again, Peter and John were warned even more strongly. Then they were set free. The rulers were afraid to punish them. Too many people in the city were praising God for what had happened. Peter and John returned to the place where the believers were gathered. They all joined together in prayer, asking for power to speak out boldly and for more miracles through the name of Jesus. And God heard and answered their prayers. At once, the meeting place shook like an earthquake. But it wasn't an earthquake. It was the Holy Spirit filling everyone there. And after that, they all began to preach God's message with great courage. Today's story is called An Unusual Competition. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The message is, God can use my life to influence others for good. Have you ever entered a competition? Did you win? Today's story is about a beauty competition with a very special prize. It may have happened like this. Cousin Mordecai, said Esther, did you hear? King Xerxes is sending his men to bring unmarried girls to the palace. He's looking for a new queen. I heard, said Esther's cousin Mordecai. But he's not sending for all the unmarried girls, just the pretty ones. I'm sure you'll be chosen. He smiled. Oh, cousin Mordecai, said Esther. I can't leave you. You've taken such good care of me since my parents died. Don't worry about me, Esther, said Cousin Mordecai. It will be a good opportunity for you. Remember everything I've taught you. But no matter what happens, don't let anyone know you are a Jew or that you are my cousin. But why, Cousin Mordecai? asked Esther, looking puzzled. 
because this is not our home. We are Hebrews. Although our people have lived in Persia for a long time, a lot of people don't like us. They want to get rid of us, said Cousin Mordecai quietly. I will do as you say, Esther nodded. Don't look so sad, Esther, said Cousin Mordecai. A lot of other beautiful girls will be at the palace, but remember, beauty is as beauty does. Be kind to everyone. That's the best kind of beauty. When Esther was taken to King Xerxes' palace, she remembered what her cousin Mordecai had told her. There were a lot of beautiful girls at the palace. Some of them were not very nice, but Esther was kind to everyone. The king's helper, Haggai, noticed Esther. Haggai noticed Esther's kindness to others. He quickly chose her to begin beauty treatments. He also gave her special food. Then he gave her seven servant girls and moved them all to the best part of the women's quarters. For a whole year, Esther received beauty treatments at the palace. She was bathed, oiled, and perfumed every day. Beauticians fixed her hair. The designers made new clothes and shoes for her. Haggai gave her anything she asked for. Meanwhile, Esther's cousin, Mordecai, walked back and forth near her rooms every day. He couldn't talk to Esther, and she couldn't talk to him. But they could see each other from far away. Cousin Mordecai wanted to make sure she was all right, but he didn't want anyone to know that they were related. If they did, they would know Esther was a Jew. One day, Haggai came to Esther smiling. Esther, he said, the king wants to see you. Really? What should I do? asked Esther. Just be yourself, said Haggai, smiling. I'm so nervous, said Esther excitedly. I can't even think right now. Esther, don't worry, said Haggai. I think the palace people and the king are really going to like you. Haggai was right. Everyone liked Esther, especially the king. He liked Esther more than any of the other young women he had seen. So he made her his queen. Today's story is called A Rainbow Promise. The memory verse is from Genesis chapter 9, verse 15. It says, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Today's message is God's people rejoice because He cares for them. Has it ever rained for many days where you live? Were you getting tired of playing indoors? How did you feel when you finally saw the sun come out? Could you go out again? If so, you will understand how Noah and his family felt when they finally left the ark. After more than a year in the ark, it must have been wonderful to leave it. Noah's family stepped out into the clean, sweet air. They stood and smiled in the warm, welcoming sunshine. It was probably a bit scary, too. The world looked so different, and it was so quiet. The eight people who walked off the ark were the only people left on the entire earth. They were starting over, alone and together. Soon the animals were freed. Noah's family must have seen their joy and excitement. They must have laughed as the animals pranced and danced. When the ark was empty, the first thing Noah did was build an altar and have family worship. God was pleased by their worship and blessed the family. He said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. Then God gave Noah, his sons, and every generation yet to come a promise. 
Brilliant colors splashed across the sky in what was surely the most perfect rainbow ever. That first arch of color in the heavens must have filled the tiny family with awe and wonder. But it was more than just a beautiful display of color. It was a rainbow promise. For God said to Noah, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. God knew the sight of clouds might frighten Noah's family in the days ahead. The splatter of the first raindrops might fill these survivors with fear. Would it be the start of another flood? Would they too be wiped off the earth? No, they didn't need to worry. God had given them his promise. This one special family had been through a lot together. For more than a year, they had worked together on the ark. For long days and nights, they had drifted together on an endless ocean. They had worked hard to care for all those animals, and now they were to resettle the earth and start over. God had given them something precious. He had given them the experience of the rainbow to share. It would be a blessing and a promise to treasure forever for them and for us. We, too, belong to a special family. Our family of believers includes those in our churches and schools, as well as our families at home. And we, too, have been given a special work to do. We will go through a lot together over the years, and the experiences we share will bring us closer together. And God has given us our own rainbows, blessings, and promises. He will help us do what he has asked. Noah's family was well cared for inside and outside the ark. They were thankful to God for his love and protection. When you see a rainbow, think of God's love for you and thank him for keeping his rainbow promise and all his promises. Today's story is called Jesus makes new friends. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. It says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Today's message is God invites everyone to join his family. Have you ever felt very lonely? As if no one cares about you? And that you don't have any friends? That was just how Matthew felt until he met Jesus. Then everything changed. It probably happened like this. When the Romans conquered Judea, they demanded that all the Jews pay taxes. No one likes giving money away, especially to an occupying army. Most people were angry about it. Many tried to think of ways to avoid paying the taxes. The Romans hired Jewish people to help collect the taxes, and that's how Matthew got a job as a tax collector. His job was to make sure that people paid. Soon, many of his old friends stopped speaking to him. The Romans did not really like him either. They treated him like a servant and usually ignored him. All they wanted was their money. Usually, the only people who would talk to him were other tax collectors. People used to say that all tax collectors were liars, cheats, and thieves. But there were good tax collectors and bad ones. The Romans did not pay them for collecting the taxes. They just assumed that the tax collectors would charge people a bit more. The extra money they collected was theirs to keep. So most tax collectors charged people more than they should. For some time, Matthew had heard about a man called Jesus. Even if the people didn't talk to him, 
they talked to each other. And while they were waiting to pay, Matthew listened to them talk. That's how he learned what was going on in the city. Jesus sounded amazing. He healed people who had never been able to walk or see. Matthew sometimes saw them running and leaping just for fun. People said that Jesus forgave sins. Matthew wondered about that. He knew he did wrong things. Could Jesus forgive his sins? Would Jesus even want to talk to him? Then something wonderful happened. Jesus was standing in front of Matthew, speaking to him. Jesus said, Matthew, come, follow me. Matthew did not hesitate. He got up, left everything to the other tax collectors, and followed Jesus. Matthew decided to follow Jesus to be one of his helpers. He wanted others to know, so he gave them a big party for all his friends. He wanted them to meet Jesus, too. The scribes and Pharisees came to see what was happening. They saw that Jesus was Matthew's guest. They saw him eating with the tax collectors, and they were shocked. Jesus, they said, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus looked up and smiled. People who are healthy do not need a doctor, he said. Only the sick need a doctor. I have not come to tell the righteous to repent. I have come to help sinners repent. Jesus' answer gave everyone hope. No one is to be left out of God's family. Everyone is welcome to join. What about you? Have you joined Jesus' family? Today's story is called Into the Clouds and Back Again. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 1, verse 11. It says, The same Jesus will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The message is, I want to be with Jesus when he comes back for me. Have you ever gone to an airport? Have you ever seen a plane take off? Did you see it grow smaller and smaller until it disappeared? Something like that happens in our story. After Jesus was crucified and came back to life again, he spent 40 days with his disciples. During that time, he encouraged them. He helped them believe that he really was alive again, and he prepared them for the work they were to do. On his last day on earth, Jesus and his disciples visited together on one of their favorite spots, the Mount of Olives. From there, they could look down on the city of Jerusalem. The beautiful marble temple gleamed in the sun. Only Jesus knew he would be leaving soon. The disciples had just asked him if he would overthrow the ruling king. Would he take his place on the king's throne? They still didn't understand. Jesus wasn't going to be an earthly king. He would be the king of their lives. Gently, Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit would be with them. They were to take his message to all the world. Everyone must know about his death and resurrection. After he said this, Jesus began to rise slowly into the air, past the treetops, straight up into the sky. The disciples must have wondered what was happening. Maybe they watched with their mouths hanging open. Silently, he disappeared into the clouds. They strained their eyes as Jesus disappeared from their sight. As they stood staring into the sky, two men in white robes joined them. These two angels had stayed behind to help the surprised disciples understand what had just happened. The angel spoke, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? 
This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The disciples began immediately to spread the good news about Jesus all over the world. Their work was the beginning of Christianity, a new religion based on three special beliefs. Number one, Jesus, God's Son, is alive. Number two, Jesus came to live on earth and die for us, showing us that God loves us. Number three, Jesus is coming back to earth to take us to live with him in heaven. The disciples missed Jesus. They wanted him to come back. How about you? Do you want Jesus to come again? Do you want to be with Jesus forever? He will help you to get ready. Just ask him. Today's story is called Gallant Gideon. The memory verse is from Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. It's one of my favorites. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. The message is God can use me when I trust him. Have you ever been confused or afraid and not sure what to do? When Gideon learned to trust God rather than be afraid, exciting things began to happen. Forty years after Deborah and Barak defeated Sisera, Israel forgot God and began worshiping idols again. Because the Israelites left God's protection, for seven years, Midianites and Amalekites caused problems for the Israelites. They stole their food and destroyed their homes. Many of the Israelites lived in caves just to survive. God looked around for a leader, someone who would trust him. He found Gideon. Gideon was hiding from the Midianites while he was grinding wheat. Suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon was startled. He was no mighty warrior. His family was the smallest in the tribe of Manasseh. He was certainly not feeling very brave. I will be with you, God told Gideon. We will destroy the enemy together. Gideon was not sure. He asked the angel to wait while he made a meal for the angel. He put the meal on a rock, and almost immediately it was burned up by fire. Gideon asked God for two more signs. He wanted to be certain that God was with him. He held a fleece in his hand and spoke quietly, If you are going to help Israel defeat Midian, let this fleece be wet tomorrow morning and the ground under it be dry. The next morning it was just as Gideon had asked. No dew had touched the ground, but the fleece was soaked. Gideon tested God again. This time, let the fleece be dry and the ground be wet, he asked. The next morning his request was granted. Gideon called an army to fight Midian and 32,000 men joined him. Now God tested Gideon. There are too many men, God said. Send some home. Gideon knew that the Midianites and Amalekites had a huge army, but he obeyed God and sent 22,000 men who were afraid home. God tested Gideon again. Take your men to the river to drink. Look for the ones who drink standing up. Send all the rest home. Only 300 men passed the second test. God finally had a small enough army. That night, Gideon divided his army into three companies. Armed only with clay jars, trumpets, and torches, they hid on three sides of the Midianite camp. 
All at once, they blew their trumpets, smashed their jars, lit their torches, and shouted, For the Lord and Gideon! God did the rest. Awakened by the shouting, the Midianites and Amalekites rushed from their tents and began to fight each other. They were confused. Many ran away. And as they ran, Gideon's soldiers chased them. The Midianites and the Amalekites no longer bothered the Israelites. The Israelites could live with no fear because they chose to stay with God. God wants to help us with our most difficult problems. It is easy for Him to destroy our fears. It will be easy for us to trust Him when we remember all that He can do and all that He is willing to do for us. God won the victory for the Israelites. God will win the victory for you too. A beautiful house. The message for this week is, I worship God when I show respect and reverence for His house. The memory verse is from Psalm 84, verse 1. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty! Come, daughter, said Vamala's mother. We will go see the most beautiful place in India, the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal was beautiful. However, it was not as beautiful as the house Solomon built for God. King Solomon sent for a servant. It's time to begin building God's house, he announced. I've given a lot of thought to this project, and now it's time to start. All the Israelites knew about this wonderful plan. King David, Solomon's father, had wanted to build a special house for God, but God told him no. David's son, the next king, would build the temple. Now King David was dead, and Solomon had been the king of Israel for four years and he was finally ready to begin building the temple. I want to send a letter to Hiram, the king of Tyre, Solomon said. He paced up and down the room. Finally, he began to say what he wanted to write to Hiram. You were a good friend of my father, David, Solomon began. He was not able to build a temple to honor the Lord as he wanted to. Now I am going to do it. Please cut tall cedar trees from your mountains for me. I will send men to help your servants with the work, and I will pay whatever you ask. King Hiram was pleased to receive Solomon's letter. He sent word that he would indeed provide lumber for the temple, and he promised to send Haram Abi, a great artist, to help Solomon's workers. Haram Abi knew how to work with gold and silver and bronze and wood. He also knew all about stonework and carpentry. He also could teach about weaving and dyeing beautiful fabrics. It took thousands of people to work on the huge temple project. King Solomon sent 30,000 men to King Hiram to help cut down trees and bring them home. 80,000 other men cut beautiful stone out of the mountainsides and shaped them into blocks. When taken to the temple, the blocks fit together like pieces in a puzzle. There was no sound of hammers or axes or any iron tools at the building site. This was one way the workers showed reverence for the Lord. Solomon's temple was probably the most beautiful building ever built on the earth at the time. On the inside, the stone walls were completely covered with wood. The wood was decorated with carvings of angels, palm trees, and flowers. And then it was completely covered with gold. Even the floor and the ceiling were covered in gold. Artists carved two great angels from olive wood. They overlaid the angels with gold, too. The angels were placed in the most holy place where the Ark of God would rest. Their lovely wings stretched across the entire room. All of the furniture in the temple was beautiful and carefully made as possible. 
the Israelites wanted to honor the Lord in the very best way. Who can really build the Lord a worthy home? Solomon asked. Not even the highest heaven can contain him. Building and taking care of a church are acts of worship for us just as they were when Solomon built God's beautiful temple. And the things we do and say inside our church are also to be acts of worship. Miraculous Rescue The message is God has a plan to take care of me. Our memory verse this week is one of my favorites. It's from Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. It says, Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Brianna and her sister were so excited. Their parents were taking them and their little brother on a long trip across the country to visit relatives. They had never been to that place before, but Dad said that if they followed the directions from the GPS, they would be all right. A long time ago, God's people, the Israelites, went on a journey to a place they had not been before. They had God's GPS, God's powerful spirit, to guide them. The evening breeze off the Red Sea was refreshing. Asher welcomed the chance to rest his aching legs. What a whirlwind the last few days had been, killing the lamb, sprinkling its blood on the doorpost, then roasting it and eating it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. It was the last meal he had eaten in the home he had ever known. He remembered the rest of that night. God's angel had swept through the land of Egypt and killed the firstborn in Egyptian homes. Pharaoh had been furious. He had ordered the Israelites out of the country immediately. Asher had felt excited but anxious at the same time about leaving in the middle of the night, not knowing where they were going. Then he realized that God himself was leading them by a pillar of fire at night that turned into a pillar of cloud as the sun rose and the day dawned. Now that cloud had stopped by the Red Sea, and the Israelites were enjoying the rest. Asher wondered what might happen next. He didn't have to wait long. Look, out on the horizon. C can you see it? Can you hear it? A messenger ran through the camp. The Egyptians are coming. Asher and the others jumped to their feet. Way out on the edge of the desert, they could see a cloud of dust. They could hear the roar of a mighty army. Asher's heart jumped into his throat. Pharaoh must have changed his mind. The army was coming to take them back to Egypt. Panic swept through the crowd. Where's Moses? Where's Moses? The people wailed. Why did he bring us out here to die? Was it because there were no graves in Egypt? It would have been better for us to be slaves in Egypt than to die out here in the desert. Do not be afraid, Moses said firmly. The sound of his voice quieted the crowd. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see them again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need be still. Asher watched as the cloud that had been resting by the Red Sea moved. It passed over the Israelite people and out into the desert. It finally rested between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Moses walked to the edge of the Red Sea and held his staff over the water. Gently at first, and then more strongly, Asher felt a wind blowing towards the water. With astonishment, he watched the wind blow the water aside. It was leaving a dry path through the Red Sea. Come, ordered Moses. The Lord is preparing a way of escape for you. He will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his horsemen. Joyfully, the people rushed forward. The wind continued to blow a dry path as thousands of Israelites 
stepped into the dry seabed. Asher hurried to follow the others across the dry seafloor. A wall of water stood on either side of him. The pillar of fire illuminated the way. All night, the huge crowd of Israelites hurried through the sea. As the last of the crowd reached the far side, they could hear the Egyptian army pursuing. Asher looked back to see the army rushing towards them. But something amazing was happening. Wheels were coming off of their chariots. There was confusion, and it looked like they were trying to turn around and go back to Egypt. Just then, Moses stepped to the bank of the Red Sea. As dawn broke, he once again stretched his hand over the sea. The waters flowed back together. In an instant, the sound of the Egyptian army was quieted. The soldiers and their chariots were all gone under the waves. The Israelite community just stared. They were too stunned to say a word. Then a roar erupted. Sing to the Lord, the people shouted. The Lord is my strength and my song. Asher joined them, shouting with all of his might. God had saved them. Today's story is called A Little Man with a Big Heart. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 19, verse 8. It says, Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. Today's message is I show others Jesus' love when I put wrongs right. Have you ever been to a parade or ball game and not been able to see very well? Maybe your father carried you on his shoulders. If so, you will understand how Zacchaeus felt when he got stuck at the back of a crowd. Zacchaeus lived in Jericho. He had one of the biggest and best houses in town. He was a very rich man, but no one liked him because everyone believed that he cheated people and kept their money. Everyone knew about it, but no one could do anything. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector for the Romans. The Romans didn't care what he did as long as he gave them the right tax money. So Zacchaeus probably told people that their taxes had gone up. He collected more than he should and he kept the extra money for himself. One day, Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to Jericho. He had heard a lot about Jesus. He had heard how Jesus had healed the sick, the lame, and the blind. And some said that he had raised someone from the dead. All these things made Jesus special and made Zacchaeus want to meet him. Zacchaeus had heard about the tax collector Levi Matthew. Matthew had left everything to become one of Jesus' closest followers. People talked about it everywhere. Zacchaeus wondered, maybe Jesus has something to say to me. Yes, it was the talk of the town. Jesus was really coming to Jericho. Zacchaeus decided to try to catch a glimpse of the master. He left his tax station and went out into the street. The street was so crowded, and the crowds were getting thicker. It was hopeless. Zacchaeus tried jumping up to see over their heads, but that was useless. He was so short, and no one would let him through. But he was determined. He would not give up. He must see Jesus. Zacchaeus looked up and down the street. He saw a big tree. Climbing trees was not the sort of thing grown men did, but there was no other way he could see Jesus. So up he climbed. He sat on a big branch and looked down the road. Jesus was coming his way. When Jesus reached the tree, he stopped and looked up. He saw Zacchaeus and smiled. 
everyone in the crowd stopped too. They looked up and saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today, Jesus said so everyone could hear. Zacchaeus could hardly believe his ears. Jesus going to his house? He climbed down the tree and led the way. The crowd moved aside, but people began to mutter. How can Jesus be the guest of a sinner? They wondered out loud. Zacchaeus said, Lord, I will give half of everything I own to the poor. If I have cheated anyone, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus looked at Zacchaeus. Then he looked at the people who were muttering and criticizing him. Jesus said, Today, salvation has come to this house. This is the reason the Son of Man came, to seek and save the lost. Before Zacchaeus saw Jesus, he had begun to show that he was sorry for cheating people. Now he confessed this before the crowd. He showed that loving Jesus helped him to make things right. Jesus can help you make things right, too. For all people. The message for this week is, I worship God with my worldwide church family. The memory verse is from Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. All nations will come and worship before you. Have you ever had a special guest come to your church? Was that person a well-known preacher or singer? The Israelites invited an extra special guest to their new church, God. He even promised to live in their temple. Solomon's eyes sparkled. It was finished. All the furniture was in the right place. Every detail was complete. It was time now to dedicate the temple to the Lord. Solomon called the leaders of all the tribes and families of Israel to come to Jerusalem. The first part of the dedication involved bringing the ark to its new home in the temple. Everyone watched as the priests, they carried it slowly with great respect and joy to the temple. King Solomon and the people sacrificed sheep and oxen along the way. In their joy, they sacrificed so many sheep and oxen to the Lord that no one could keep count. The priests carried the ark containing the law of God into the most holy place of the temple. They set it carefully beneath the wings of the two great carved golden-covered angels. Then all the Levites, who were musicians, stood near the altar playing their instruments, cymbals and harps and lyres. The musicians sang and played loudly and powerfully together. They praised and thanked the Lord. He is so good, they sang. His faithful love endures forever. At that moment, the most amazing thing happened. A great cloud filled the temple. The cloud held the glorious presence of the Lord. The priests could not continue their work. They had to leave the temple because of God's glory. Solomon saw the cloud and his heart swelled with thankfulness. The temple was finished and the Lord had moved in. He turned around and looked at all the Israelites standing before him. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, he shouted. Then Solomon knelt down. He lifted his hands toward heaven in front of all the people. He began to pray. O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in all of heaven or earth. You keep your promises and show unfailing love to all who obey you. May you watch over this temple both day and night. May you always hear the prayers I make towards this place. 
If your people are ever defeated by their enemies because they have sinned against you, and if they turn to you and call on your name and pray to you here in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive their sins. Forgive your people who have sinned against you, for they are your people, your special possession, whom you brought out of Egypt. When Solomon finished praying, he stood up and shouted a blessing over all the people of Israel. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he give us the desire to obey his commands. May people all over the earth know that the Lord is God. Then the king and all the children of Israel offered sacrifices to the Lord. Solomon and the Israelites celebrated together for 14 days. No one would ever forget it. They would tell it over and over again. Finally, someone would write down the story so people could read it forever. Today's story is called, Do You Love Me? The memory verse is from John chapter 21, verse 16. It says, Again Jesus said, Do you truly love me? Take care of my sheep. Today's message is we serve God when we take care of others. Asante, do you have your hat? Mom called. I think so, Asante responded. A few minutes later, Mom called out the same question. I thought I told her yes, he thought as he answered again. As he headed through the door, Mom asked Asante if he had his hat once again. Trying not to let his impatience show, he once again told her that he had it. Has someone asked you the same question over and over? They may have been trying to show the importance of what they were asking. In this story, Jesus asked Peter the same question three times. Peter was restless. I'm going fishing, he told the other disciples. At least fishing was doing something. It had been a while since Jesus had been crucified. He had appeared to them twice since his resurrection. It had been wonderful to see him and to know that he was alive. Jesus hadn't mentioned that Peter had denied him three times. Peter was still so embarrassed. He was ashamed of what he had done. He may have asked God to forgive him. He may have thought that Jesus would no longer trust him. How much did the other disciples know about it? He may have wondered. Did they know how sorry he was? Some of the other disciples decided to go fishing with Peter. So just as the sun was going down, they stepped into Peter's boat. The wind soon swept across the water. They stayed out all night, but they caught nothing. What a waste of a night's work, Peter probably thought. Early in the morning, just as the sun was coming up, They returned to shore without any fish. As their boat drew closer to shore, they noticed a man standing on the beach. The man called out, Have you caught any fish? The disciples called back, No, none at all. The man called out again, Throw your net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. Perhaps they just wanted to please the man. Perhaps they wanted to try once more. Whatever the reason, they did what the man said. Immediately, their nets were full of fish. They couldn't even haul their nets into the boat. Suddenly, John recognized the man and called to Peter. It is the Lord! Peter was very happy to see Jesus again. Jesus was waiting for them. The boat was so very close to shore that Peter decided not to wait. He jumped out of the boat and hurried through the water to Jesus. The others followed in the boat. 
When they reached the shore, they found that Jesus had made a fire. He was cooking fish for their breakfast. They soon enjoyed fish and some bread. After breakfast, Jesus turned to Peter. Do you truly love me more than these? He asked. Peter immediately answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus looked into Peter's eyes and said quietly, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked, Peter, do you truly love me? And again, Peter replied, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus replied, Take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter didn't know what to think. Perhaps he wondered if Jesus didn't believe him. And why did Jesus ask three times? Was it because Peter denied Jesus three times? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him three times. With a heavy heart, Peter answered, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said again, Take care of my sheep. Finally, Jesus said to Peter, Follow me. Peter realized then Jesus had forgiven him. Jesus still wanted Peter to follow him. Why did Jesus ask Peter these questions in front of the other disciples? Perhaps it was so that they would know that he had forgiven Peter. Jesus also wanted to teach Peter a lesson in patience, sympathy, and forgiveness. Peter would need all of that in the future. He had a work to do for Jesus. He would lead and care for many new believers of Jesus during the rest of his life. Jesus also wants us to know something special. There is only one thing we must do to follow and serve him. Love him with all our hearts. And when we really do, we will want to take care. Today's story is called A Bitter Choice. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 22, verse 42. It says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. The message is, I thank Jesus for choosing to save me. Have you ever been punished for something you did not do? If you were, how did you feel? In our Bible story today, we will learn about a choice Jesus made, a choice to be punished for something He didn't do. The Last Supper was over. Jesus and His disciples walked to the Mount of Olives. They climbed to the Garden of Gethsemane, a place where Jesus often prayed. Jesus led the disciples a little way into the garden. Wait here, he said. Then Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to go further into the garden with him. Watch and pray, Jesus told them. Jesus moved on a little further. Quietly, he prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. He longed for someone to share his sorrow. He returned to the three men, but they slept. Three times he prayed that same prayer. Three times he sought comfort from the three disciples. A bright light shone from Jesus' direction. A shining angel cradled Jesus in his arms, talking quietly. Jesus became calm and serene. He had been strengthened to meet the cross. Get up, said Jesus to Peter, James, and John. It is time to go. My enemies are coming. They hardly reached the other disciples when lights of a mob approached. Many soldiers, people, and some leaders of Israel were led into the garden by Judas. Judas greeted Jesus with a kiss. Whom do you seek? 
Jesus asked the mob. Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am he, Jesus replied. Jesus could have escaped, but he chose to stand before the mob. The disciples watched, silent with wonder. The mob quickly gathered around Jesus. He spoke again. If you seek me, let these others go their way, he said, pointing to the disciples. Then the soldiers used ropes to tie Jesus' hands together. The disciples couldn't believe their eyes. They thought Jesus would just walk away. He had done that before. But this was different. The mob began to move back down into the valley. They were taking Jesus towards the high priest's palace. This was unbelievable. The disciples turned and ran away. They couldn't understand why Jesus would let himself suffer like this. It was amazing love that led Jesus to choose to suffer. Love for all those he and his Father had created. Love for you and me. Today's story is called Miracle at Midnight. Today's message is I Serve God by Helping People in Urgent Situations. The memory verse is from Psalm 91, verse 11. It says, For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. It was Friday afternoon, and Juan was in his front yard picking up toys. Next door, his friend's little sister, Tina, was practicing riding her bicycle. She had only learned how a week before. Suddenly, Juan heard a crash. He turned around and saw that Tina had hit her mailbox and fallen off her bike. Immediately, he ran over to help her up. In a few minutes, she was back on her bike. The emergency was over. Here's a story about a more serious emergency and someone who helped. This is how it may have happened. Eutychus swatted at a fly buzzing in his ear. Phew, it's hot in here, he thought. I wish there was a little more of a breeze. The third floor meeting room was crowded, and it seemed as if everyone in Troas had come to say goodbye to Paul. Tonight was his last night with them, but no one wanted him to leave. After eating together, they asked Paul to preach one more time. Be strong in Jesus, Paul encouraged. The time passed quickly as Paul spoke, and before long it was midnight. Sitting on the ledge of an open window, Eutychus began to yawn. It had been a long day, and the heat made him feel sleepy. He shifted a little bit on the windowsill. He had arrived late. Since the room was so crowded, it had seemed like a good seat and perhaps it would be a little cooler. He yawned again. Oh. Suddenly, a friend who was sitting close to Eutychus gasped. Eutychus! He yelled. Oh no! Eutychus fell out the window! The man sprang through the doorway leading to the stairs and raced down to the street. Paul followed close behind him. Everyone else in the room was shocked into action. Many people ran down to see if there was anything they could do. They rushed to Eutychus, but he was so still. There was no doubt he was dead. The people were stunned. They didn't know what to say. Bending down, Paul lifted Eutychus and held him in his arms. Quietly, he prayed. Finally, Paul looked up at his friends. Don't worry, Eutychus is alive. Eutychus opened his eyes and looked around. He saw tears on the faces of his friends. W what happened? He asked. Why are you crying? The night wasn't quiet anymore. Everyone was wide awake and full of joy. Eutychus! Eutychus, you're alive! Oh, thank God! They cried. Back up the stairs they went into the warm room. No one was sleepy now. Paul continued to preach to a wide-awake crowd. He spoke with his friends until early in the morning. 
Even though Paul was talking to his friends about Jesus, he stopped right away to help Eutychus. That is what God wants us to do. Ask Jesus right now to help you to help others at any time. Serving Jesus means being ready and willing to help others, especially in emergencies. Today's story is called Dead or Alive. The memory verse is from John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Today's message is we worship a God who gives eternal life. Have you ever been really, really sick? So sick that you were too weak to get out of bed? Maybe the doctor gave you medicine or a shot or hooked you up to machines to help you breathe. We're going to read about a girl who needed more than a doctor to make her well. Jairus' 12-year-old daughter had been sick for some time. Her parents did everything they could think of to help their daughter get well, but she only grew weaker. Good parents love their children and will do anything to help them get well. So imagine how upset Jairus felt when his only child was so sick. He didn't want to leave her side. Again and again he sent for doctors and other people known to help sick children. But nobody could help. Then Jairus thought of Jesus, the master teacher from Galilee. Everyone was talking about his miracles. Jesus was Jairus' last hope. Jairus whispered to his daughter, I'm going to find help. Then Jairus left home and hurried fast as he could to Matthew's house. He knew that he would find Jesus there. My only daughter is sick. She may be dying. You must come to my house to help her. Then she will get well, Jairus told Jesus. Jairus' faith pleased Jesus. At once, he started to leave with Jairus. But a large crowd had gathered, waiting for Jesus to come out of Matthew's house. The people crowded Jesus as he walked along. Everyone was anxious to be near him, They pushed and shoved one another. Often they bumped against Jesus as well. Suddenly, Jesus stopped. Who touched me? He asked. With all these people, Lord, you are asking who touched you? Peter couldn't believe Jesus had asked such a question. Jesus continued to look around. Finally, a woman stepped up to him. I touched you, she said, weeping softly. I have been sick a very long time. For twelve years I have been trying to get well. I thought that if I could only touch you, I would be healed. Jesus felt happy because the woman had such strong faith in him. He couldn't just rush away. Be happy. Jesus told her, You are healed because you had faith in me. Go and enjoy your life. Before Jesus and Jairus could continue, one of Jairus' servants pushed through the crowd. It's no use to bother the teacher any more, he told Jairus. Your little girl is dead. Oh, poor Poor Jairus! His loving father's heart must have been heavy with sadness. But Jesus turned to Jairus. Don't be afraid, he said. Just believe. Jesus called Peter, James, and John to follow him. Together they hurried to Jairus' home. Jairus' house was 
full of people all wailing and crying loudly. Some of them did not even know Jairus, but they showed their sympathy by crying together. Send the mourners away, Jesus commanded. Your daughter isn't dead. She's only sleeping. When the people heard this, they laughed at him. Jesus told all the people to leave. Then he took the three disciples into the house along with Jairus and his wife. In the little girl's room, Jesus stood by the bed and reached for her hand. Child, get up, he said. The little girl opened her eyes and sat up. Imagine how she must have felt when she looked into Jesus' happy eyes. Give her something to eat, Jesus told her joyful parents. Jairus' daughter was well and strong. Not only did Jesus love to heal sick people, he was delighted to give people life again. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. He came to earth to save us too, from death and to give us life. We worship a God who gives eternal life. Don't you love him? The Silent Battle The message is, in God's family, we all work together. Our memory verse this week is from Psalm 133, verse 1. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Did you ever feel so excited you couldn't sleep? Or have you ever woken up extra early on an extra special day? That's how it may have been the day that the army of Israel marched for the first time around Jericho. Long before daybreak, the Israelite soldiers and priests arose. After a hurried breakfast, the soldiers dressed for battle. Soon they lined up behind the golden Ark of the Covenant. Four priests in spotless white robes stood ready to lift the poles of the Ark to their shoulders. When Joshua, the leader of Israel, appeared, he encouraged all the people. Do not give a war cry, Joshua directed. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. A war cry always helped the soldiers feel brave, and it scared the enemy. But Joshua wanted the soldiers to rely only on God. Soon the long parade marched away. A small group of armed soldiers led the way. Behind them came seven priests blowing ram horns trumpets. Then four more priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The rest of the army followed. As the Israelites approached Jericho, they saw that the city gates were tightly closed. Soldiers lined the top of the city walls. Their weapons were ready. But before reaching the walls, the Israelites turned and began marching around the city. When the priests rested their trumpets for a few minutes, the only sound was the tramp of hundreds of feet. The Israelite parade marched all the way around Jericho. Then they headed back to camp. The soldiers on the walls lowered their weapons, completely puzzled. What was going on? The next day, the same parade left the Israelite camp and marched toward Jericho. First, soldiers. Then, seven priests playing trumpets. Next, priests carrying the ark. And finally, more soldiers. Trumpets blared. The soldiers marched. No one said a word. Each soldier knew that he was helping just by marching and not saying a word. Again the parade circled the city. Again they marched back to camp, leaving the people in Jericho bewildered. What kind of war was this? The same parade wound its way around Jericho the third day, and the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day. 
the people locked in the city could hardly stand it. At sunrise on the seventh day, the long parade of soldiers and priests formed once more. They left the Israelite camp and moved toward Jericho. The walls of the great city again lined with soldiers. The parade circled the city once more. But it did not return to camp as it had before. Instead, the soldiers and priests took a second turn around the city. Then they marched it around a third time. Then the Israelite army marched all the way around Jericho four times, five times, six times, seven times. Then the parade stopped. The priests put the trumpets to their lips and sounded a mighty blast. Shout, Joshua commanded. The Lord has given you the city. The soldiers threw back their heads and shouted with all their might. Yeah! That's when the completely unexpected happened. The absolutely, positively impossible happened. With a deafening rumble, the walls of Jericho gave way and fell down. The Israelites rushed into Jericho and took the city. God had given Jericho into Israel's hands. The victory was God's, but the Israelites had played their part. They had worked together as Joshua instructed. Today's story is called Finally Forgiven. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 6, verse 37. It says, Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Today's message is God helps me to forgive others. Has anyone you love ever done something that has caused you pain or hurt your feelings? Sari stole from her best friend Misha and then lied about it. She thought no one would ever know. But Sari was caught and Misha and her family felt very hurt and betrayed. Years later, Sari asked for forgiveness and Misha forgave her. They became good friends again. Today's story is very similar. Many people were cruel to Joseph. His brothers had sold him into slavery. Potiphar had sent him to prison. But God blessed him. In fact, Pharaoh put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Just as Joseph had predicted, according to what God had told him, Egypt had plenty of food for seven years. Each year, Joseph carefully stored the extra grain. He knew that a terrible famine was coming. When the dry years came, Joseph had plenty of grain to sell to the starving people. One day, ten men arrived from a foreign land to buy food. They bowed before Joseph, and as they stood up, he recognized his ten older brothers. He had not seen them since they had sold him into slavery many years before. Joseph wanted to be sure they were different now, so he decided to test them. You are spies, he said. You have come to see how strong we are. Oh, no, sir, we are not, his brothers replied. We have come to buy food for our families. We are all the sons of one man. There were 12 of us. One is still at home and one is dead. But Joseph was not dead. Bring back your other brother to me or I will know you are spies, Joseph commanded. Your brother, Simeon, will stay here in prison while you are gone. The worried brothers began their journey home. On the way back, one of them opened his sack and found money. What is this? He called to the others. The money that I paid for this grain, it is in my sack. What will the governor do now? When the brothers reached home, they told their father what had happened. We must take Benjamin back with us, they pleaded. 
It is the only way to prove that we are not spies, and we need to get Simeon back from Egypt. No, never, their father responded. Joseph is lost to me. I cannot lose another son. A few months later, the brothers went to their father again. Our children will starve, they pleaded. We have no more food. We must go back to Egypt. Their father didn't want to let Benjamin go, but he knew they needed food and they needed it soon. He finally agreed and the brothers went back to Egypt. When Joseph saw his younger brother Benjamin, he rushed to his private room to cry. But Joseph had one more test for his brothers. Were they still jealous? Would they be eager to get rid of Benjamin? Fill their sacks, he told his steward, and put my silver cup in Benjamin's sack. Soon the brothers were ready to go home. Joseph's steward did as Joseph said, and the brothers started on their way. A few miles from the palace, Joseph Stewart stopped the caravan. He searched the men's sack and found Joseph's cup. Benjamin must return with me to the governor, he declared. The brothers were worried. How could this be happening? What will the governor do? We, we can't leave Benjamin here. What will we tell our father? Your brother Benjamin must stay here, Joseph declared. He will become my slave. Joseph's brother Judah begged that Benjamin be released. I cannot go back to my father without Benjamin, he said. Please, let me stay in his place. Joseph could hide no more. He broke into tears and told his brothers who he really was. He told them about Potiphar's house and the years in prison. He described Pharaoh's dreams and how he had come to be the second most powerful man in Egypt. It was not you who sent me here, he said, forgiving his brothers. It was God. God was with Joseph. God truly wants to be with us too. All you have to do is ask him. Today's story is called God's Special Gift. Today's message is I Worship God When I Enjoy His Weekly Gift, The Sabbath. The memory verse is from Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. When do you start planning for your birthday? Is it the day of your birthday? Or do you start thinking about it weeks ahead of time? Isn't it fun to look forward to special days? On those days, we can do special things, eat special foods, and even wear special clothes. Let's see what we can learn about God's holiday. It's a special holiday, a holy holiday. I can't wait for Christmas, Tyler announced. Mom looked up and laughed. But it's only May. I'd say you have a while to wait. I know, Tyler groaned. So tell me why you can't wait until Christmas, Mom said. Okay, but may I play Christmas music? As Tyler put the CD into the player, he said, I wish it was Christmas because I love being together with our whole family. Grandpas, grandmas, cousins, everybody. I like having time to play games and do things we don't always get to do. Of course, I love the presents, but I really liked giving that food basket to the Johnsons last year. And I've been starving for some of your famous Christmas rolls. You've been thinking a lot about this, haven't you? Mom said. Yeah, I guess so. Tyler plopped down beside Mom on the couch. I've got news for you. She watched Tyler's face light up. Jesus knows how you feel. In fact, that's exactly why he created the Sabbath for us. Mom laughed again, seeing Tyler's confused look. 
<laughs> okay, son, think about it. God made the Sabbath day after His busy work of creation. He created a day just to spend with the people He created. It's His favorite day of the week. He wants the Sabbath to be a kind of holiday every single week. He wants us to forget about all of the regular things we do all week and have a special day with Him. All of the things you mentioned about Christmas are things we enjoy about Sabbath, too. We get to be with people we love. We do special things that don't happen every day. And we love to do things that help make others happy. We even love having special food. And Mom grinned and reached over to hug Tyler. I guess I never thought about Sabbath being like a holiday, Tyler responded. He was really thinking about what Mom had just said. You know, Mom added, Jesus really looks forward to spending Sabbath with us. His love for us is so big. When He gave us the Ten Commandments, He said, Remember the Sabbath day. Work hard with me all week and then have a holiday with me every Sabbath. That time with Him at the end of our busy week is so special. We can enjoy the beautiful things He's made for us. We can study His Word and learn more about His love. All of these are ways we tell Jesus that we love Him too. Tyler seemed to have forgotten how far away Christmas was. You're right, Mom. Tyler spoke thoughtfully. Sabbath really is a special day. It's even better than Christmas because God gave it to us as a gift and it's every week. Let's ask Grandma and Grandpa to be with us this Sabbath. It will make God's special day even more special. How about you? Sabbath is God's gift to you each week. When God finished creating the world in six days, He rested on the seventh day. He blessed it and made it holy. Ever since creation, the Sabbath holiday has been a special day to worship God, to enjoy the world He created, to tell Him how much we love Him. It's a holy holiday. This Sabbath, Jesus is looking forward to that special time with you. Today's story is called Praise Him. The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 100, verses 1 and 2. It reads, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Today's message is we will sing songs of praise to God now and throughout eternity. What is your favorite song that tells about God's love? How do you feel when you sing it? When we get to heaven, we will sing our favorite songs to praise God. What song will you sing? And who will sing with you? Heaven is full of happiness and songs of praise to God. Everyone loves God so much, they just want to praise Him. The angels love Him. The people Jesus brought back from the earth are so happy to be there, and the people from other worlds all join their voices in praise. One special group praises God more than any other. They are called the remnant. Remnant means the rest or the part that remains. These are the people who were alive and waiting for Jesus when He came to earth the second time. The remnant is special because God's enemies, Satan and his followers on earth, tried to make them stop worshiping God. But the remnant remained faithful. Just before Jesus came to take them to heaven, they felt very lonely. But like Jesus, the remnant believed God loved them, so they continued to wait for Jesus to come. Now they're in heaven. The remnant gives special praises to Jesus. 
They stand in front of His throne so they can praise Him. They praise Him with their harps and other instruments. They sing praise songs. The Bible promises that God will teach them a new song, a song that only they will be able to sing because they were faithful until Jesus came. Just think, God has written a special song for those who are faithful to Him. The remnant praise Him because they know bad things won't happen anymore. They praise Him because they know how good God is. They praise Him because He sent Jesus to die for their sins. They praise Jesus because He lived and died for them. They join with all of creation to sing, Let everything praise the Lord. Yes, we can praise God on earth today. The Bible tells us that we are not alone in praising God. Thousands of angels worship God all the time. Their favorite praise is about Jesus, God's gift of grace to the world. They say with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who died for people's sins. He receives power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. The angels and others are waiting for us to get to heaven. They want us to join in their praise, but we don't have to wait until we get there. We can praise God now. We can praise Him because Jesus died for our sins. We can praise Him because Jesus is coming back to take us home to heaven. We can praise Him for our parents, teachers, friends, and relatives. We can praise Him for our homes, food, and clothing. Think of other reasons to praise God and sing your favorite praise song right now. His name is John. The message is we prepare the way for Jesus when we serve others. Our memory verse this week is from Luke chapter 1, verse 76. It says, You will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for Him. Jackie was excited. She had just received a message from her grandmother. Jackie read the message again and again. I'm coming to visit you next month, and I will have a surprise for you. Ooh, such excitement! I must help Mother get things ready, Jackie thought. Jackie ran to the kitchen. Mother, she begged, I want to help get ready for Grandma's visit. Please say I can help. Tell me what to do. Another day and another time, an angel delivered a message to an old man, a message that would help change the world. Elizabeth and Zachariah longed for a baby for many years, but when they grew old, they gave up hope. Zachariah was one of many temple priests. They took turns serving for a week at a time in the temple at Jerusalem. Only once in his life was a priest likely to go into the holy place. It was an honor to burn incense on the golden altar there. There he would pray for the forgiveness of sin for all the people, and he prayed earnestly for the soon coming of the Messiah. Zechariah looked forward to this day all his life. Now an old man, he was thrilled when his turn came. Zechariah solemnly sprinkled the powdered incense on the glowing coals. A cloud of sweet-smelling smoke rose and filled the holy place. Suddenly, Zachariah sensed he was not alone. He opened his eyes, and there stood an angel at the right side of the altar. Zachariah trembled in fear. Don't be afraid, Zachariah. God has heard your prayer, the angel said. Your wife, Elizabeth, will have a son. You will call him John. He will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. A baby at his old age? 
Zechariah doubted the angel's words, so the angel gave him a sign. Because you did not believe my words, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day this happens. Then the angel vanished. Zechariah opened his mouth to begin the prayer for the people, but nothing came out. He couldn't say a word. By now, Zechariah had been in the holy place a long time. The people outside were beginning to wonder what had happened to him. Finally, he came out. His face was strangely glowing. Quietly, Zechariah motioned to them that he had seen an angel. Zechariah hurried home. He tried to tell Elizabeth what had happened, but he could not speak. He had to write and use hand signals. They would have a child, a boy, to be named John. An angel had told him so. Months later, their baby was born. Elizabeth's friends gathered around. His name will be John, Elizabeth announced. John? No one in your family is named John. Why not call him Zachariah? The women urged. Elizabeth turned to her husband. Zachariah shook his head. Quickly he wrote so all could see. His name is John. Immediately the old priest's voice returned. He spoke to the people and praised God for this blessing. John grew up in the desert where he learned to serve. Often Zechariah told John about the angel at the altar. God has a special work for you. You will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him, Zechariah said. When John grew up, he invited people to repent of their sins and be baptized. He helped many people get ready to meet Jesus. God has a special place in his plan for you, too. We can prepare the way for Jesus by serving others and meeting their needs. Then they will be more willing to learn about Jesus. Today's story is called Friends Find a Way. The memory verse is from Romans chapter 12, verse 10. It says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. The message is, I serve Jesus when I bring others to Him. Do you know someone who has a very serious disease? If they needed to see a doctor, would you rip off the hospital roof to get them inside? One sick man's friends did something like that. If you had taken a walk in the town of Capernaum one certain day, you probably would have heard, Jesus is in town. Jesus is in town. A crowd of people hurried to a house where Jesus was healing and teaching. And what a crowd it was. There was no room inside the house. There was no room in the yard either. All kinds of people were in that house with Jesus. Pharisees, teachers of the law, ordinary people, and many, many sick people. There was a very sick man in that town, and oh, how he wanted to meet Jesus. But he had a problem. He was paralyzed. How could he get to Jesus? He couldn't move. All he could do was lie on his bed and think about how sick he was. If only he could meet Jesus. He just knew that Jesus would make him well. The paralyzed man was fortunate in at least one way. He had four very good friends who were happy to carry him to Jesus. Each took a corner of his mat and off they went. But when they found the house where Jesus was healing, they couldn't reach Jesus. There were people everywhere. No one would let them through the crowd. So near and yet so far. The sick man was worried that he wouldn't see Jesus after all. What could he and his four friends do? There had to be a way to get through that crowd. His friends took him up to the roof of the house. How strange! Have you ever entered a house from the roof? It isn't easy. 
Do you know what the four friends did next? They made a hole in the roof, big enough for their sick friend and his mat to fit through. Then, with ropes, they let the sick man on his bed down, down, down. He landed right in front of Jesus. Jesus' eyes were so kind. He said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven? I'm forgiven, the man said to himself. What a happy day! The Pharisees and teachers of the law were not happy about this. They had already refused to help this man because of his sins. They thought to themselves, How dare Jesus try to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus could read their minds. He spoke strongly to them. Why are you thinking these things? People need to be helped. Which is easier, to say you are forgiven or to say you are healed? You will soon know that I can forgive sins on earth. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Rise up, take your bed and go back to your house. Suddenly, the man could move his legs and his arms. He was healed all over. He got up, rolled up his bat, and carried it out the room and headed home. This time, the crowd let him through. Everyone was amazed and praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The four friends were really happy that they had brought their friend to Jesus. How about you? Do you want to bring someone to Jesus? A gift for me? The message is God gives perfect gifts, and His best gift is Jesus. Our memory verse this week is from James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. Maria was so happy that she could not stop smiling. She loved babies, and her mother was coming home soon with a new baby boy. Last Christmas, she had received a beautiful baby doll for a gift. Now she would have a real baby to love and play with. What a perfect gift! Much better than a baby doll gift. Many years ago, another family rejoiced because of a special gift baby. Who do you think it was? Mary smiled to herself. She just couldn't help it. She would soon have a very special baby, Christ the Lord. Since the angel had told her about that, she had wondered. First, she wondered why God had chosen her. True, she and Joseph came from the family of David. God's word had said that the Messiah would come from that family. However, they lived in the wrong town. The prophet Micah had foretold that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem, the city of David. However, Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth. Then important news had reached the village. Emperor Augustus had decided to take a census. He wanted to know how many people lived in his kingdom. This meant that every family would be counted, and they had to be counted in the town of the father's ancestors. That meant Joseph would have to go to Bethlehem. It was almost time for her baby to be born, and God had arranged everything. Her baby would be born in Bethlehem, just as the prophet Micah had foretold. At just the right time, the government was requiring them to go to Bethlehem. The trip was slow and tiresome. The roads were crowded with travelers. Mary may have been uncomfortable riding on the donkey for so long. Tired and weary, they finally reached Bethlehem. But Joseph couldn't find any place for them to stay. No one had an empty room. 
Even the covered porches of the inns were packed with tired travelers. Joseph was discouraged. Mary was worn out. Finally, an innkeeper took pity on them. He saw Mary and knew she would soon have her baby. I'm sorry. Every room is taken, but there's a stable out back. If you will take it, Joseph replied. We're glad to have a place. Animals shuffled restlessly in the stalls. They crunched and munched their food and snorted and snuffled. But there was plenty of straw, and it was clean and dry. That night, baby Jesus was born. Mary wrapped him carefully in the soft cloths she had brought from home. She cuddled him, filled with wonder all the while. Finally, she placed him in the manger that Joseph had filled with clean, sweet hay. Mary sank down on the soft straw bed that Joseph had prepared for her. She had never been so tired in her whole life. However, she was also happy and content. God had kept his word. He had given her the perfect gift. Jesus is God's perfect gift to us, too. Today's story is called The Make Believe Christian. The memory verse is from 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 17. It says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Today's message is, Knowing God Changes My Life. Pierre and Marie caught a creepy, crawly caterpillar and put it in a big glass jar. Marie added a little stick for it to crawl on. Each day, Pierre and Marie brought in leaves to feed it. One day, they watched the caterpillar wrap itself in silky threads. After a while, it was all covered up and hanging from the stick. Mother told them that the caterpillar was in a cocoon. After many days, Pierre and Marie saw something very special. The cocoon opened and out came a beautiful butterfly. What a change from the creepy, crawly caterpillar. Our Bible story today tells about people, some people who changed, but one man who did not. Philip took a deep breath of the fresh, early morning air. It was good to be alive. It was good to be working for the Lord. He looked around. The merchants were setting up in their stalls in the marketplace. Soon the women would begin shopping for the day. Men and women smiled at Philip and greeted him as they passed. He smiled back. The city was a different place now. The people had listened carefully to the message Philip had preached. They had listened, believed, and were baptized. They had seen miracles done in the name of Jesus. Many, many evil spirits had been driven out of people and many weak and crippled people had been healed. The town was different, all right. People now had hope and joy and a reason for living. Philip glanced up and saw Simon approaching. Simon had lived in the city for a long time. He had been a magician, amazing the people of Samaria with his tricks. If Samaria had been television, Simon would have been the star. Simon had joined the crowds listening to Philip. He had seen the miracles. He wanted to be a part of this, too. So Simon was baptized and stayed close to Philip. He was amazed at the great wonders and miracles that Philip did in Jesus' name. Earlier that day, Peter and John arrived from Jerusalem. Philip greeted them with big hugs. It was so good to see his brothers in the Lord. Peter and John joined Philip in his work. Together, they asked the Holy Spirit to come to the new believers just as he had the believers in Jerusalem. Then Peter and John laid their hands on the believers, and the Holy Spirit came upon everyone except Simon. 
Simon thought this was the neatest trick he had ever seen. He wanted to lay hands on people like that. He pulled Peter and John aside and showed them his fat purse. He whispered, I can pay. Give this power to me too. Peter's face turned red. You have no part or share in this ministry, he exclaimed. Your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought. The Bible does not tell us what Simon did, but we know that Simon did not understand the free gift of God's grace. He knew about God, but he really didn't know God. That is why he wasn't changed. Knowing God changes lives. Today's story is called Ready or Not. The memory verse is from Matthew 25, verse 13. It says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The message says people and God's family can always be ready for Jesus to come. Have you ever waited a long time for something you really wanted to happen? Have you waited for your birthday or summer vacation? Did you count the days until the excitement begins? Do you plan and dream of what it's going to be like? In our Bible story, ten young women are waiting for a wedding to begin. They have to wait a long time. I wish he'd hurry up and come, yawned a young woman. We've been waiting for hours. I'm sure it won't be much longer, encouraged another girl. Maybe we should sit down and rest a while. Ten young women sat down and tried to get comfortable. They knew that the wedding party was supposed to pass this way. They wanted to join the group and walk with the other guests to the wedding, but none of them had expected that it would be such a long wait. Five of the girls had thought it would be good to take along some extra oil. They really did not know when the bridegroom would come but the other five had probably thought, it won't be that long before the bridegroom comes. So they didn't put any extra oil in the containers everyone carried at night. Their lamps were full when they left home. They were sure that would be enough. So five of the women took extra oil, but five did not. It was getting late, and there was no sign of the bridegroom. The young women talked and laughed together for a long time, but one by one they nodded, yawned, oh, and fell asleep. After a time, a call woke them up. Make way for the wedding party. Come and join us. Make way for the wedding party. The bridegroom comes. Quickly, the women reached for their lamps and stood up. Hurry, we must add oil to our lamps or we will miss the wedding, cried one. The five girls who had extra oil quickly used it all to fill their lamps. But the five who had no extra oil just as quickly realized that they had no extra oil to keep their lamps from going out. Give us some of your oil, they begged. We don't want to miss the wedding but the five prepared young women couldn't help them. We wish we could give you some, but we have used all of our oil to refill our lamps. We have none left. Go quickly. Maybe you can buy oil somewhere. Five young women in need of oil hurried off into the night. Their friends joined the wedding party and went to the wedding feast. It wasn't easy to find anyone who was willing to sell oil in the middle of the night. By the time oil was purchased and they arrived at the wedding, the door was closed and locked. Let us in! Please let us in, they begged. 
knocking loudly. The bridegroom himself came to the door. I'm sorry, but I don't know you, he said. My friends all came in with me. He turned around and closed the door. Five disappointed women stood outside. Like the young women waiting for the bridegroom, we cannot rely on the choices of another person. Each one has to choose to say yes to Jesus and stay ready for His coming. We stay ready by making wise choices every day, by studying the Bible and praying, by choosing every day to be best friends with Him. And when Jesus comes, we will be ready. Today's story is called Waiting Patiently. The memory verse is one of my favorites. It's from Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. It says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Have you ever had to stay inside because of rain? Days and days of rain? And when it stopped, was the ground muddy? Perhaps you've heard the phrase, cabin fever. That's what happens to people who are stuck indoors for a long time. They become anxious and uneasy. They become irritable. They want to see and do something, anything. Noah and his family must have had the worst case ever. The waiting started the day Noah, his family, and all the animals went into the ark. God sent an angel to close the door. They waited in the ark for seven days before anything happened. When it finally did, it happened big. The Bible says the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of heaven were opened. Water poured down from heaven and shot up from the earth. Things were busy in the ark. Mostly, there were animals to calm down, feed, and clean up after. Some of that wasn't easy in a big boat tossing up and down on angry floodwaters. It wasn't too clean either, and it probably didn't smell very good. God had promised Noah that he would protect the ark during the flood, and he did. His angels kept the ark from capsizing. That means tipping over and going under. Finally, after 40 days, the rain stopped. Noah and his family must have wondered when they could safely leave the ark. But the wind still blew and the waves still tossed the boat around for five months. Then the Lord made the ark float into a protected spot in the Ararat Mountains. He made a wind blow to dry up the rest of the floodwaters. Two and a half months later, Noah and his family could see the tops of the mountains near the ark. By now, they had been in the ark for about eight months. They must have been tired of feeding animals and shoveling manure day after day. But they still did their work and they waited. When do you think we'll be able to get out onto dry land? They must have asked each other. God will show us, Noah probably said over and over. Finally, to find out how dry the earth was, Noah let a raven fly out of the window. The raven flew back and forth. Later, Noah sent out a dove. It too came back to the ark when it couldn't find a place to land. A week later, Noah sent the dove out again. This time, it returned with a fresh olive leaf in its mouth. After one more week, Noah sent the dove out again. This time it didn't come back. Surely they must be getting out of the ark soon. But even though the dove had found a resting place, the earth was still too wet for people. God knew that. So he didn't send the angel to open the ark's door yet. Noah and his family waited another two months. 
It was a busy time with all the chores they still had to do. There wasn't any room to spare in the ark. There was a lot of work. Noah and his family were so glad they had listened to God and entered the ark. They were glad they were together and had each other to depend on. Noah and his family waited a long time to see God's promise fulfilled. We, too, are waiting for God's promise to us to be fulfilled. Philippians 3.20 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. It seems we've been waiting a long time, doesn't it? God has given us family and Christian friends to help us with the waiting. He has also given us a work to do while we wait. He wants us to share that good news. Let's encourage one another and work together while we wait for that wonderful promise to be fulfilled. Today's story is called Forgotten Dream. The memory verse is from Daniel chapter 2, verse 23. It says, God, you have given me wisdom and power. The message is, I serve God when I help people in need. Have you ever awakened in the morning knowing that you had a dream, but were unable to remember it? Or maybe you could remember it, but it seemed very silly. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that he could not remember. It happened like this. God blessed Daniel and his friends. He gave them wisdom to understand the hardest assignments. The king himself tested them at the end of their three years of training. He was pleased. They were ten times better in everything than all the wise men in the kingdom. King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians worshipped idols. They made idols of wood and stone, and they believed that their dreams were messages from their idols. One night, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. When he awoke the next morning, he was very disturbed. He knew he had dreamed about something important, but he was even more upset because he could not remember the dream. The king called his wisest advisors and interpreters before him. I had a dream last night, he said. Tell me what it means. But we don't know what you dreamed, they replied. Tell us your dream, then we can tell you what it means. Otherwise, how could we interpret it? The king became very angry. If you were really the wisest men in Babylon, you would know what I dreamed, he said. Twice the wise men asked about the dream, but the king could not remember. He became so angry that he ordered that all the wise men in the empire were to be killed. Daniel and his friends were not among the men who had been called before the king, but they were among those who would be killed. When they heard about it, Daniel talked to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard. Daniel asked Arioch to explain what was wrong. Then Daniel went before the king. He asked Nebuchadnezzar for time to discover the dream and what it meant. Daniel and his friends spent that night in prayer. As they prayed, God gave Daniel a vision. He showed Daniel the king's dream and told Daniel the meaning. The next morning, Daniel hurried to Nebuchadnezzar's palace. He told the king exactly what he had seen. A huge statue with a head of gold, a chest of silver, thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron mixed with clay. A rock from heaven fell and crushed the feet. The whole statue fell over and was destroyed. Then Daniel explained the meaning to Nebuchadnezzar. The dream had predicted the future. King Nebuchadnezzar was a strong king, but someday his kingdom would fall from power. The king of another country would take over. 
Later, still another kingdom would take over. Each kingdom that came into power would be weaker. Finally, God would set up His kingdom, a kingdom that would never end. None of the idol-worshipping advisors had been able to tell the king his dream. Only Daniel's God could do that. Your God is the true God, Nebuchadnezzar told Daniel. Finally, the king made Daniel governor over Babylon. In this position, Daniel could help others know about the God of heaven. Of all the wise men of Babylon, only Daniel and his friends had asked God for help. God heard them, and He told them everything they needed to know. God will hear you, too. When you need answers to difficult questions, He is always ready to help you. Broken Stones The message for this week is, God is always ready to forgive me. The memory verse is from Psalms 86, 5. You are forgiving and good, O Lord. Yamil walked timidly to Mom. I'm sorry, Mom, he whispered. I should have obeyed you and done my homework instead of playing my video game. Please forgive me. Of course I forgive you, Yamil. Mom gave him a hug. However, you now have a late assignment. Isn't it better to obey? The Israelites really hurt God. They had a big reason to say they were sorry. What did God do? After God spoke the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, He called Moses to the mountain. God had many instructions to give Moses. He wanted to help the Israelites live the Ten Commandments in their everyday lives. God talked to Moses for a long time. He explained His Ten Commandments in more detail. God wrote His commandments on two large stone tablets with His own finger. Moses was gone for a long time, 40 days, almost six weeks, so long that the people thought He wasn't coming back. So they went to his brother Aaron. Aaron, they said. Moses has been gone a long time. We don't know where he is or what's happened to him. He may have brought us out of Egypt, but now he has left us. We want gods that we can see, just like the gods the Egyptians had. Aaron knew what they were asking was wrong, but he was afraid of the people. So Aaron said, Go home and tell everyone to bring their gold to me. Aaron melted the gold and molded it into a golden calf. The Israelites celebrated. This is our God, they shouted. This is the God who brought us out of slavery. Our new God will lead us into our new land. Aaron knew he had done wrong. He knew he and the people were disobeying God's second commandment. Even so, he tried to keep the people from turning entirely from God. He built an altar in front of the golden calf. He announced to the crowd, Tomorrow we will have a festival to the Lord. But that only made things worse. The next day the people got up early. They brought many offerings to their new God. Everyone began dancing and singing, eating and drinking. Aaron had said we will have a festival to the Lord. But the people were clearly having a party for their idol. Moses was still on the mountain talking with God. Suddenly God said to him, Go down quickly, Moses. The people have been quick to turn from what I have commanded. They have made an idol cast in the shape of a calf, and they have offered sacrifices and bowed down to it. Moses hurried down the mountain. He carried the two special stones which God had written with his own finger. Halfway down the mountain, Moses met one of his helpers, Joshua. Moses and Joshua heard loud noises. It sounds like a battle in the camp. Has someone attacked the Israelites? Joshua asked. No, said Moses. That's not the sound of battle. It's not the sound of people crying. It's the sound of people singing. 
They hurried on. When they finally reached the camp, Moses saw the golden calf. He saw God's people dancing around it. Angrily, he took the Ten Commandment stones and threw them to the ground, smashing them into pieces. Moses begged God to forgive the Israelites. God did forgive them. He loved them even though they had done wrong. It's just the same today. If we are truly sorry, God forgives us when we do wrong. All we have to do is ask Him. If we stay close to Him, we will know His love and forgiveness too. The Night the Angel Sang The message is, Jesus Gives Us Joy. Our memory verse this week is from Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Have you ever wanted something very, very much? You prayed for it every day? You dreamed about it every night? Then someone surprises you with what you wanted when you least expected? Many, many years ago, some shepherds wanted something very much. They got their wish in a surprising way. The shepherds huddled in the fragrant grass. The sheep rested nearby, pale, rounded shapes in the darkness. The moon was only a sliver in the sky. The stars twinkled and glittered with the special sparkle they have on clear nights. The shepherds murmured in low voices. They were discussing their very favorite topic. It was something they talked about almost every night, the coming of the Messiah. Yes, they were tired from the work of the day, but just thinking about and talking about and praying for the Messiah filled their hearts with longing. The shepherds sat quietly together in the deep silence of the night. An occasional bleat of the sheep broke the stillness. Suddenly, a bright star flared in the sky. It came rocketing towards them. As the light grew larger and brighter, the whole countryside glowed like noontime. The shepherds blinked, frozen with fright. Some jumped to their feet. Others protected their faces with their arms. Before them stood a dazzling person. Could it be an angel? Don't be afraid, a pleasant voice said. I bring you good news of great joy. The joy will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign that will prove it to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Immediately, the angel messenger was joined by a great choir of joyous angels. Angels filled the sky, and they were all singing. Glory to God in the highest, they sang, and on earth, peace to all on whom God's favor rests. The shepherds watched the angels and wonder, hardly daring to believe they were real. The bright, happy music swelled and filled the night. Bright colors swirled through the sky and dazzled the shepherds' eyes. The angels' joy filled the shepherds' hearts until they felt as if they would burst. Finally, the music drifted slowly away. The angels flew higher and higher, returning to heaven. The shepherds strained to hear the very last notes of the music as the light faded. Then it was quiet. Heart pounding quiet. Did you see that? One shepherd gasped. They were real, weren't they? Asked another. 
I've never heard or seen anything like it. Let's go. Go where? To Bethlehem. The angel said the Messiah was born this very day. This very day. One joyous shepherd grabbed his staff and began racing down the hill toward town. All the others followed. That's how it is with God's free gift of grace. It gave the shepherds great joy. It still gives people joy. Jesus gives us joy. Today's story is called Better Than Gold. The memory verse is from John chapter 12, verse 21. It says, we would like to see Jesus. Today's message is, when I help others, I show them Jesus. Mom! Mom! shouted Jamie. This is a great game. We played it at school one day. Can, can we get it? Please! Mother wanted to buy the game for Jamie, but other things came first. I just don't think we can afford it right now. I know you're disappointed, Jamie, added Mother. But we have each other, and God has blessed us in many other ways as well. That's okay, smiled Jamie. I'm glad we have each other, and many other blessings from God. That's better than money. In today's story, Peter and John shared something better than money with a beggar. How do you think the beggar felt? The afternoon sun warmed them as they hurried through the streets toward the temple. It was almost time for the evening sacrifice. Peter and John approached the beautiful gate. They smiled at the man sitting at the gate. He sat with his twisted ankles bent underneath him. Day after day, helpful friends carried him to the same spot. There, he could beg for money from the worshippers. As Peter and John walked by, the man held out his hand. Perhaps these two smiling men would give him a little money. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit stirred Peter and John. They should do something. They stopped and turned to the beggar. Look at us, Peter said. Hope began to rise within the beggar. The men were going to give him money. But Peter's next words dashed the hope completely. I don't have any silver or gold, he said. The man looked wearily away. But Peter was not through talking. I do have something else that I can give you, he continued. By the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. The man with the twisted legs stared at Peter. Because of his bent legs, he had never learned to walk. Peter leaned over, gently took the man's hand, and lifted him up. Immediately, his feet and ankles became strong. He could barely believe it. The beggar walked. He jumped. He jumped some more, and he began to praise God loudly. His smile stretched from one ear to the other. The beggar went into the temple with Peter and John. Everybody recognized him. People had seen him begging for a long time. And now he was not only walking, he was jumping. He followed Peter and John to Solomon's porch, a part of the temple. A crowd followed. Peter saw the people gathering, questioning, shouting excitedly. He looked from their astonished faces to the beaming face of the beggar. Peter chuckled to himself. <laughs> he knew why the Holy Spirit had healed the crippled man. The Spirit wanted to give Peter another opportunity to talk about the Lord, and Peter took it. Men of Israel, he began, why are you so surprised? You are looking at us as if it were our own power that made this man walk. No, it was the power of Jesus that made this man well. You can see this man, and you know him. He was made completely well because of trust in Jesus. Peter told them that Jesus was the Messiah they had been waiting for. He told them they needed to follow Jesus and that he forgives sins. 
Many, many people believed. They believed because God had used Peter and John to heal the man. Today's story is called The Best Day. The memory verse is from Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. It says, God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. The message is, the Sabbath is God's special gift to us. Have you ever looked at a gift you once received and couldn't remember who gave it to you? When God created the world, He knew that there were so many exciting things to do that people might forget who gave them all this wonderful creation. They might even forget Him. So He gave them one more special gift. This is how it may have happened as God told Adam and Eve about it for the first time. It was near the end of the sixth day of creation. Adam and Eve met with God under the shade of the tree of life. See the sun setting? God may have asked. I love the way the sky turns pink and orange and red when the sun sets, don't you? As they watched the sun set on their first day of life, Adam and Eve listened to God. When the sun sets, another day begins, God explained. This sunset begins the most special day of all. Everything made in this earth is a present for you. There are so many beautiful and interesting things. It will take a long time for you to discover them all. But the best present has been saved until now. It is the present of a day, the seventh day. It will be called Sabbath, a day named Sabbath. Adam and Eve wanted to know more. God explained how happy He and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were with everything. As you have children, and your children have children, and learn more about this world, things will get very busy. We want to be sure that you will have enough time to spend with us. We want you to remember that we made this whole world just for you. We put a special day at the end of every week. It is a holy day that will be different from all the other days. It will be a time to stop thinking about all the things that will keep you busy on six days every week. You will be able to spend a whole day with us. We can only imagine what happened on the first Sabbath morning. Maybe God called Adam and Eve to the shade of the tree of life. Maybe they heard God say, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the very first time He ever said it. Maybe the angel sang for them and played wonderful musical instruments. Maybe God told Adam and Eve about how much He had enjoyed planning this beautiful world. What a wonderful day! Adam and Eve spent every minute with the wonderful God who had created them. They enjoyed the beautiful earth they could see in every direction. God must love us very much, Adam and Eve probably said to each other. Only someone who loves us could make everything so perfect. His love just fills us with love for Him. Every Sabbath in Eden, Adam and Eve visited with God. Every Sabbath, they remembered again how He had made the world for them. They remembered how He had made them and how much He loved them. We can be with God for a whole day each Sabbath too. God wants us to enjoy this special day He made for us. He wants us to enjoy being with Him and learning more of His love. Today's story is called Snake Bite. The memory verse is from Mark chapter 11, verse 22. It says, Have faith in God. Today's message is we worship God when we have faith in Him. Have your parents ever asked you to do something that you didn't want to do? Maybe you couldn't understand why they wanted you to do it. 
but you obeyed them because you have faith in them. You believe they want what's best for you. Something like that happened to the Israelites. Let's read more. God's people had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. The Israelites had once been on the edge of the Promised Land, but because they chose to disobey God and not believe Him, they wandered through the wilderness. But He didn't abandon them. Every day of those 40 years, they had manna to eat. They had water to drink. Now once again, the Israelites were near the Promised Land. So near, they could see the cool valleys and green fields. And they thought it was unfair that they had spent 40 years in the desert. They grumbled to one another. Then they began to grumble to Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? They complained. There's no water. There's no bread. And we're tired of eating manna. They did not appreciate what God had done to keep them safe. They weren't happy about spending all that time in the hot, dusty desert learning more about God and knowing His ways are always good. Once again, they accused God of causing their hardships. Poor Moses. He had heard it all before. He tried to point out God's leading. He tried to show them the many ways God had cared for them. But they wouldn't listen. It seemed that all they could do was complain. Finally, God decided to take away his protection and let them see what would happen. The poisonous snakes that lived in the desert soon overran the camp, and many of the Israelites were bitten. In almost every tent, someone was dead or dying. No one was safe from the fiery snake venom. Once bitten, they soon died. It didn't take the people long to see how wrong they had been. We sinned when we grumbled against you and God, they told Moses. Please, they begged, pray that God will take away the snakes. Moses prayed, and the Lord heard him. God told him to make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. If those who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake, they would live. Moses made the snake just as he was told, and the people who looked at it were healed by God. But some people did not have faith in God. They chose not to follow his directions, not to look at the pole. Because they did not obey, God could not heal them, so they died. The snake in the desert was a symbol of Jesus dying for our sins. The metal snake itself had no power to heal. It was faith in God that led him to heal them. Years later, Jesus referred to his own death. The Bible tells us what he said. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, who is Jesus, must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Our faith in Jesus, lifted up on the cross, helps us know that Jesus died so we can live with Him forever. So have faith in God and believe what the Bible says. Today's story is called Angels on a Ladder. The memory verse is from Genesis chapter 28, verse 15. It says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. Today's message is I belong to God's family no matter what happens. Have you ever felt lonely, really alone, or felt that there was no one you could talk to? That's how Jacob felt when he had to leave home. Then God shared a special time with him. After that, Jacob never felt lonely. Isaac and Rebekah's twins, Esau and Jacob, had never liked each other very much. But now the situation was much worse. Jacob had tricked their father into giving him a special blessing. It was a blessing that Esau should have received. 
Esau was so angry at Jacob that he wanted to kill him. So their mother, Rebecca, decided to send Jacob to his uncle Laban. Stay with your uncle for a while, Jacob. Give your brother time to cool his anger, she said sadly. Little did she know that she would never see Jacob again. So Jacob started out on the long trip to Laban's home, his mother's brother. His uncle Laban lived a long way from Jacob's parents. It was almost five hundred miles through strange and dangerous country. Jacob was all alone, and he was frightened. He had no one to protect him from wild beasts or robbers, and he wasn't used to sleeping on the hard ground. He traveled as fast as he could. He knew he was running for his life. He knew his brother wanted to kill him. In a day or two, Jacob arrived at a special place. His grandfather, Abraham, had once built an altar there to worship God. Jacob was so tired that night. He may not have even known he was in such a special place. He just wrapped up in his blanket and went to sleep with his head on a rock. That night, Jacob had an unusual dream. Not an ordinary dream at all, but a special dream from God. In his dream, Jacob saw a huge ladder or staircase. It reached all the way from the earth to heaven. Jacob saw angels going up and down the ladder. God spoke to him, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac. I will be with you and protect you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you. Jacob sat up and looked around. The Lord is here, he exclaimed. He is in this place, and I didn't know it. Jacob got up early the next morning. The stars were just beginning to fade away, and the sun was just beginning to light the eastern sky. Jacob wanted to do something to mark this special place. The Lord himself had spoken to him there. So he used the stone he had used for a pillow and set it upright in the ground. He poured oil all over it and dedicated it to God. And then he named this special place Bethel, the house of God. So Jacob continued on his journey. He was no longer afraid of his brother. He was not afraid of wild beasts or robbers. He knew for sure that the Lord was with him. The Lord was protecting him. God had told him so. Today's story is called Favorite Son. The memory verse is from John chapter 15, verse 12. It says, Love each other as I have loved you. Today's message is God Helps Me Love My Christian Family. Is there anything that you really wish you had? Have you ever wanted it so badly that it made you angry because someone else had it and you didn't? Ten boys wanted what their brother had. They were so jealous of him that they planned something terrible. Joseph had eleven brothers, ten older brothers, and one younger brother. The older brothers did not like him at all. They probably left him out of the games they played. They didn't take him with them when they went somewhere. They didn't want to be around him. The Bible says they hated him. Joseph was Father Jacob's favorite son. Their father always gave him the best presents. When Father Jacob made Joseph a colorful new coat, all the brothers were jealous. They didn't think Joseph deserved nicer things than they got. Joseph's brothers also thought he was proud, which made them even angrier. 
Once God gave Joseph a dream that he and his brothers had been cutting stalks of grain and tying them into sheaves. Suddenly, all of his brother's sheaves bowed to his. Another time, he dreamed that the sun, moon, and eleven stars had bowed down to him. Father Jacob asked, Does this mean that you will rule over your mother and me someday? They enjoyed being out on their own with no little brother to annoy them. But one day, Father Jacob asked Joseph to find them and to see how they were. Joseph, wearing his bright new coat, went in search of his brothers, and they saw him coming. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Let's kill him. And throw his body into a well. They were all alone with the sheep. No one would know what they had done. The oldest brother, Reuben, disagreed. Don't kill him, he argued. Let's not shed any blood. Throw him into this dry well, but don't hurt him. Reuben knew that Joseph wouldn't be able to get out. The brothers could scare Joseph by leaving him in the well. Reuben didn't want to kill Joseph. He secretly planned to take Joseph out of the well later. Then he would take him back to their father. So when Joseph arrived, what a shock was waiting. His brothers didn't welcome him. They grabbed him and threw him into the well. Then Reuben left for a while. Before Reuben returned, a caravan of traders passed by, and the nine brothers sold Joseph to them. He would become a slave. When Reuben returned, he looked for Joseph in the well, but didn't find him. He tore his clothes to show how upset he was and went to his brothers. The boy is gone! What shall I do? he cried. So the brothers killed a goat and soaked Joseph's beautiful coat in its blood. They would tell their father that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. Joseph was actually on his way to Egypt. He would be far away from his father, his brothers, and his lovely coat. What would become of him? Jesus asks us to love our brothers and sisters. He says this for a reason. Our families fall apart when we don't love one another. Jesus doesn't want our family, the church, to fall apart. He will help you love your home and your church family. Ask Him to help you be loving. Today's story is called Don't Let Go. The memory verse is from Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Today's message is when I obey God, I make the right choices in my community. Can you remember the last time someone wanted you to do something that you knew was wrong? What did you do? Did you remember what you had been taught at home or at church about living for Jesus? Did that help you make the right choice? Joseph remembered that his family's God was with him and would help him. Let's read about it. When Joseph was sold by his brothers, he might have been tempted to give up on God. He might have thought that God should not have let him be sent far away. But then his thoughts turned to his home and what his father had taught him about God. He had told Joseph that God always keeps his promises. Joseph decided to always obey God. In return, God blessed him. The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. When Joseph was sold to a man named Potiphar, God was with him and blessed Potiphar too. 
Soon Potiphar gave Joseph responsibility for his entire house. God blessed Joseph, and many people liked him. Potiphar's wife noticed what a good job Joseph did. She also saw that he was very handsome. Satan used her to tempt Joseph. One day, Potiphar's wife asked Joseph to do something he knew was wrong. Since Joseph had decided to obey God, he said no. Actually, he said more than that. He said, How can I sin against God? Joseph knew that doing what this woman asked him to do would be wrong. And it would be a sin, and it would make God sad. But Potiphar's wife didn't give up. Every day she asked Joseph to come to her, and each day he refused. When she realized Joseph wasn't going to do what she wanted, she decided to get Joseph into trouble. I want to be alone with you, she told Joseph. Again, Joseph said no. As he turned to go, she grabbed his coat, pulling it off. Help! She called to the other servants. Joseph tried to attack me. It wasn't true. Joseph had been faithful to God and loyal to his master Potiphar. But Potiphar's wife showed him Joseph's coat. She told Potiphar that Joseph had attacked her and left his coat behind. So Potiphar sent Joseph to prison. Poor Joseph! He had lost his job even though he had done nothing wrong. Yet, even though Joseph was in prison, he knew that God was still with him. He believed that God would continue to bless him. God wants to be with you, too. When he is with you, it is much easier to live for Jesus. It is easier to say no to Satan. Joseph learned about God from his family. He probably decided to trust and obey God from seeing some of the mistakes his father had made. When you decide to obey God, you will make the right choices in your home. And in your community and wherever you go. And you don't have to worry about what will happen to you. Today's story is called Bible Detectives. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 17, verse 11. It says, The Bereans received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. The message is I worship God when I study my Bible every day. Would you like to be a Bible detective? To discover new ideas and information? Let's learn about some Bible detectives who searched the scriptures to see if Paul was right. Jesus had given Paul a special mission. He called Paul to be an apostle. His work was to tell the story of Jesus, first to the Jews, then to everyone else. Paul traveled a lot. Whenever he went to a new city, he went to the synagogue first. He would show the Jews from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Then Paul would tell them how he became a Christian. When Paul went to the city of Thessalonica, some of the Jews and a lot of the Gentiles believed what he had said. Many people became Christians. Some Jews who did not believe were jealous. They wanted to get rid of Paul, but they needed help to do that. The Jewish leaders went to the marketplace where people who did not have jobs gathered. Here they found some people who liked to make trouble. Paul and his traveling partner Silas were staying at the home of a man named Jason. The troublemakers, led by the Jewish leaders, went to Jason's house, but Paul and Silas weren't there. So they dragged Jason and some other Christians to court. 
the Jewish leaders said that Paul and Silas were disobeying Roman law by saying that Jesus was king. They said that Jason should be punished because Paul and Silas were staying with him. The court believed the crowd and forced Jason to pay money. The crowd never did find Paul and Silas. That night, the other Christians sent them to a town called Berea. As usual, Paul and Silas went directly to the synagogue. The people in Berea, called Bereans, were kinder than the people in Thessalonica. The Bereans listened carefully to what Paul was saying. After they listened, they searched the scriptures for themselves. They wanted to be sure that what he said was true. After they studied, many believed and became Christians. And after they became Christians, they still studied every day. They did not study because they were curious. They studied because they wanted to learn more about Jesus. Angels stood beside them to help them understand what they were reading. When some of the Jewish leaders in Thessalonica found out that Paul and Silas were in Berea, they followed them. They found the same kind of troublemakers in Berea and started another riot. But the Berean Christians sent Paul to the city of Athens. There he would be safe. Silas and Timothy stayed behind to help the Bereans learn more about Jesus. Some of the new Berean believers went with Paul. When they arrived in Athens, Paul sent them back to Berea. He asked them to take a message to his friends. He wanted Timothy and Silas to join him when their work was done. The Bereans continued to search the scriptures. They wanted to know more about God. They wanted to learn more about Jesus. Jesus invites us to study the Bible every day. He wants us to learn more of His Word. As you read the scriptures, He will help you understand them. Just ask Him. He wants you to know Him better. Today's story is called Women Take the Lead. The memory verse is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. It says, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God honor the emperor. The message is we respect leaders God has placed in authority. Have you any special jobs you do at home? Does your mom or dad ask you to do things? God has special work for each of us. Let's discover more about one person whom God gave a special work. God gave Deborah a special responsibility to lead Israel. It was hard work. The people did not obey God. They worshipped idols instead. Twenty years earlier, King Jabin had attacked Israel. He won the battle and made the Israelites his slaves. Now everyone lived in fear of the king and his general, Sisera, who had 900 chariots of iron. Deborah was called a judge. She did not have an office in a courthouse as judges do today. She sat outside, under a palm tree. When people had a problem, they came to her to help them find a solution. They asked her for advice. Again and again she heard how the people were sorry for turning away from God and for worshiping idols. They asked her to teach them to worship the true God. One day God spoke to Deborah. I have heard the prayers of my people. I will deliver them from slavery. Deborah listened to God's instructions. She passed on the instructions to Barak, an army commander. God commands you to take 10,000 men to Mount Tabor. He will lead Sisera into your hands. Barak was afraid. He knew how cruel Sisera's army was. They had attacked his town. But Barak respected Deborah. He knew that God spoke through her. If you will go with me and my army, I will go, Barak replied. 
When Deborah agreed to go with him, God gave her a second message for Barak. Because you want me to go with you, you will not have the honor of winning the battle. That victory will go to a woman. Deborah, Barak, and the 10,000 soldiers did very little fighting. As Barak and his men went out to meet Sisera, God intervened. Sisera and his army left their chariots and ran away. Barak and his men caught them and destroyed the army. But in all the confusion, Sisera escaped. Sisera traveled until he came to Jael's tent. Jael's husband was one of his friends. So Sisera thought he would be safe there for a while. Sisera asked Jael for something to eat and a place to hide while he rested. Jael knew that Sisera was a wicked man. While he slept, she killed him. And that is how Deborah's prophecy came true. A woman, Jael, killed Sisera. Barak didn't. God uses a variety of people as leaders in His church, men and women, old and young, rich and poor. Children can be God's leaders too. God will help all who love and follow Him to be good leaders. We need to listen to God's chosen leaders so we can learn from their experiences and better understand God's plan for our lives. When God asks us to do something, we want to be ready to obey Him. Today's story is called A Great Family Reunion. The memory verse is one of my favorites. It's from Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It says, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Today's message is Jesus wants us to live with Him forever in a happy, safe place. Have you ever seen a lion in the zoo? Would you like to get in the same cage? When we get to heaven, lions will be as tame as kittens and will sleep with the sheep and the lambs. What will it be like there? When the chariot cloud with Jesus, the angels, and the redeemed from earth arrives in heaven, it stops in front of the gates of pearl. Before entering the gates, Jesus gives everyone a crown. Written on the crown is each person's new heavenly name and the words, Holiness to the Lord. Jesus also gives each person a palm branch and a harp. One of the angels leads everyone in a praise song, and the people play this song on their harps. Then Jesus opens the gate. He says, The battle is over. You are blessed by my Father. I've prepared this place for you from the beginning. Enjoy. It's yours. Everyone streams in through the gates. They see people they haven't seen in years. They see people they have only heard or read about. They shout happily to each other, I'm glad you're here. Look who's over there. I knew you would be here. People hug each other. Jesus sits on his throne, smiling at all the happy people. Then they turn to him, take off their crowns, and lay them at his feet. Suddenly, another happy shout rings out. Adam enters the city. Jesus stands and stretches out his arms to him. Adam sees the scars on Jesus' hands. Instead of going into Jesus' arms, Adam falls down at his feet. He cries, Worthy, worthy is the lamb that was killed for my sins. Jesus lifts him up and says, Look around you, Adam. Adam recognizes the place right away. He sees his old home, the Garden of Eden. But it is even more beautiful than when he lived there. 
Adam walks among the trees where he used to gather fruit. He smells the flowers he used to pick. He touches the vines he used to train. Animals come up to him. He sees wolves and lambs playing together. All the animals are so gentle, even little children play with them. Goats and leopards, calves and colts, and lions and bear cubs nap together. They all eat the same kind of food. No more eating each other. Jesus leads Adam to the tree of life. He picks a piece of fruit and says, This is for you to eat, Adam. Adam looks at all the people in the crowd standing in the new Eden. They are his children, grandchildren, and great, 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 great grandchildren. They all belong to his family. He's so happy that Jesus has saved all these people. He places his crown at Jesus' feet. Finally, he enters Jesus' arms. Then Adam picks up his harp. He leads his family in singing his favorite praise song. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that died for my sins and lives again. All the people take off their crowns and lay them at Jesus' feet. They bow deeply before him. When they rise, they wave their palm branches in praise and shout, Alleluia! The angels join in their song of praise, Alleluia, Alleluia, rings throughout heaven. Everyone is happy to be with Jesus. A Home for God The message for this week is, I worship God when I bring my gifts to Him. The memory verse is from Exodus, chapter 25, verse 8. Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. What is the most precious thing that you own? Is it a toy, or a book, or perhaps a pet? How would you feel if you had to share that with someone? How would you feel if our pastor asked you to bring it next week and give it to God? The Israelites could see God's presence every day. They looked at the cloud that led them through the day and remembered that God was with them. They saw the pillar of fire every night and felt the warmth of God's presence. However, that was not enough. They needed a special place where they could meet with God, and God wanted to meet with them. He wanted His special people to know that He was with them all the time and that they could come and worship Him. God wanted to have a home in the Israelite camp. God knew exactly what His home should be like. He gave the building plan to Moses. Moses knew exactly what to do. God talked to Moses. Tell everyone that they can have a part in making my house. Whoever wants to can bring an offering to you. No one must feel that they have to give. They should give only what they want to give and what they can afford. I don't want anyone to give unless they really want to. What is important to me is not what people give, but that they are happy to give it. The people will ask you what they should bring. Tell them special things are needed. Gold and silver and bronze are important. These metals are to be used when making the furniture. All the wood must be of acacia wood. This wood is strong, and it will last in the heat of the desert by day and the cold at night. My home will be colorful. People bringing wool from their sheep should spin it and dye it blue, purple, and scarlet. You will need cloth and skin to make walls of my holy place. Have the people bring fine linen, goat skins, ram skins dyed red, and sea cow hides. My home must have lights. Use olive oil to light them. For some of the services, you will need spices for the anointing oil and sweet-smelling incense. 
I will explain to you how to use these things. You will also need onyx stones and other precious stones for the priest's special clothing. Many people gladly brought jewelry and other beautiful things the Egyptians gave them when they left Egypt. A lovely place to worship God was better than keeping the jewelry for themselves. The most valuable things they had were given to God. He would have the best and the most beautiful place in camp. The Israelites had seen God's power. They knew His plan, and they wanted to be able to praise and worship God in a special way, in a special place. We can praise and worship Him in the same way today. God still gives His people opportunities to give to Him. He wants us to give with a happy and cheerful heart, just as the Israelites gave. Today's story is called Into the Clouds and Back Again. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 1, verse 11. It says, This same Jesus will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The message is, I want to be with Jesus when he comes back for me. Have you ever gone to an airport? Have you ever seen a plane take off? Did you see it grow smaller and smaller until it disappeared? Something like that happens in our story. After Jesus was crucified and came back to life again, He spent 40 days with His disciples. During that time, He encouraged them. He helped them believe that He really was alive again, and He prepared them for the work they were to do. On His last day on earth, Jesus and His disciples visited together on one of their favorite spots, the Mount of Olives. From there, they could look down on the city of Jerusalem. The beautiful marble temple gleamed in the sun. Only Jesus knew he would be leaving soon. The disciples had just asked him if he would overthrow the ruling king. Would he take his place on the king's throne? They still didn't understand. Jesus wasn't going to be an earthly king. He would be the king of their lives. Gently, Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit would be with them. They were to take His message to all the world. Everyone must know about His death and resurrection. After He said this, Jesus began to rise slowly into the air, past the treetops, straight up into the sky. The disciples must have wondered what was happening. Maybe they watched with their mouths hanging open. Silently, he disappeared into the clouds. They strained their eyes as Jesus disappeared from their sight. As they stood staring into the sky, two men in white robes joined them. These two angels had stayed behind to help the surprised disciples understand what had just happened. The angel spoke. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The disciples began immediately to spread the good news about Jesus all over the world. Their work was the beginning of Christianity, a new religion based on three special beliefs. Number one, Jesus, God's Son, is alive. Number two, Jesus came to live on earth and die for us, showing us that God loves us. Number three, Jesus is coming back to earth to take us to live with Him in heaven. The disciples missed Jesus. They wanted Him to come back. How about you? Do you want Jesus to come again? Do you want to be with Jesus forever? He will help you to get ready. 
Just ask him. Today's story is called The Floating Zoo. The memory verse is from Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, Work together as a team for the faith. Today's message is the people in God's family work together. Do you like to visit the zoo? I do. Have you ever watched zoo animals being fed or their cages being cleaned? Noah and his family had a lot of work to do on their floating zoo. The ark was finally finished. Although it was done, there was still a lot of work to do. Along with Noah's family, there were to be other occupants on the ark. Take with you seven pairs, each male with its female, of every kind of clean animal, and take one pair of each male with its female of every kind of unclean animal. The male and female of all living creatures and seven of clean animals would enter the ark. Every kind of bird and animal, every bug and snake and spider were to be kept alive. All would enter the ark. Noah was also to stock the ark with food for himself and his family. Other food would be needed for all the animals. The people and the animals would be on the ark for quite some time. So Noah and his family packed the pantries. They heaped the haylofts and filled the granaries. They stuffed the cabinets and stocked the storerooms. Soon the ark was ready for its cargo of animals, and it happened just as God said it would. The animals came to Noah out of the forest, walking, lumbering, hopping, slithering, crawling, two by two, they came. What an unusual parade that must have been. An unseen hand led the animals to the ark. There, Noah and his family led them to their places. Soon they were prepared for the long days ahead. And now Noah had a new job. As the animals entered the ark, he became the chief zookeeper. For long months, Noah and his family were responsible for those animals. What a job! Caring for one or two pets sometimes can seem like a lot of work. Just imagine how much work it must have been to care for the hundreds of animals. A building longer than a soccer or football field and three stories high stuffed full of animals? They all needed food, they all needed water, and they all needed to be kept clean. This was no luxury cruise for Noah and his family. They worked long, hard hours caring for the animals, and they worked together to care for their floating home and the creatures God had put in their care. God still needs us to work together as a family of believers. Our homes, schools, and churches still need care. Some members of the family need special attention. There is still work that needs to be done, and God calls on those who love Him to do it. Cleaning windows, sweeping floors, and washing dishes may not seem like exciting work. Noah's family probably didn't think that shoveling manure or pitching hay was very exciting either. But those jobs, too, were God's work, and they did them together. Working together is often easier than working alone. We show our love to God when we cheerfully finish the work we've been given. Let's work together to do His work. Today's story is called Promised Babies. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 1, verse 49. It says, The Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. The message is, God's gifts of love fill me with hope and love. Has your mom or dad promised you something special? Something that you have wanted for a long time? How did you feel when it happened? That might have been how Zachariah felt when God sent Gabriel to give him a promise. 
Zechariah, a priest, was serving in the temple. The priest took turns, and it was his week to serve. Every day that week, he was to enter the holy place. There he would burn incense and lift up the prayers of the people to God. One day he entered the holy place as usual, but this was not to be a usual day. A strange and wonderful thing happened. Zachariah was standing before the golden altar. The cloud of incense was rising up before God. Suddenly, an angel appeared on the right side of the altar. Zachariah was startled and filled with fear. Then the angel spoke. Don't be afraid, Zachariah. God has heard your prayers. Your wife will have a baby boy. You are to name him John. The Holy Spirit will be with him. He will lead many people to change their lives to be ready to meet the Lord. Zachariah couldn't believe what he was hearing. He and his wife Elizabeth did not have any children. For many years they had prayed for a child, but they were too old now. People of their age did not have children. How do I know what you say is true? he asked. My wife and I are old, too old to have a baby. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. God sent me with this special message for you. Because you did not believe, you will not speak until your son is born. That will be the sign that what I have said is true. Then the angel disappeared. People in the temple courtyard were wondering what had happened to Zechariah. When he left the holy place, he tried to tell the people what he had seen. But just as the angel had said, he could not speak. He could only write and to try and use sign language. Soon after the angel's visit, Elizabeth became pregnant. God had kept his promise. And when the baby was born, everybody wanted to name the boy after his father. But Zachariah could speak again. His name shall be John, he told their friends and neighbors. Six months after visiting Zachariah, Gabriel brought good news to another person. Elizabeth's young cousin, Mary. Rejoice! God is with you, Gabriel said to the young woman. Mary was startled. She wondered about this stranger. Why did he say, God is with you? She felt nervous and a bit afraid. Gabriel continued, Don't be afraid. God is going to give you a son. You must name him Jesus. He will be known as the Son of God, and He will reign over a kingdom that will never end. Mary was very young, and she wondered how this could be. How could she have a baby? Your child will be created by God, Gabriel said. Your cousin Elizabeth is also having a baby. Nothing is impossible for God. Mary believed Gabriel. I am God's servant, she said. Let it be as you have said. Gabriel then went to visit Joseph, the man Mary was to marry. He told Joseph that Mary would have a baby, the Son of God, and Joseph believed his message he would be the earthly father of the Son of God. This is grace, a promise that God gives for something that seems impossible. He promised a son to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and he kept his word. He promised a son to Mary and Joseph, and again he kept his word. God has promised to send Jesus to us again that we might live with him forever. God keeps his promises, and Jesus will come again. No More Wine The message is we make friends for God when we serve others. Our memory verse this week is from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Have you ever been to a wedding? 
What do you remember? The beautiful clothes? The nice people? The flowers? The lovely music? The yummy food and drink? Did you enjoy yourself? Jesus went to a wedding too. The wedding guests filled the house at Cana in Galilee. People overflowed into the yard. The air was full of cheerful voices, music, and laughter. It was a perfect evening. Mary looked around, enjoying the scene. How contented her friends, the bridegroom's parents, looked. While Mary watched her friends, an unhappy servant scurried up to her. He bent low and whispered in her ear, The wine has run out. Mary's smile vanished. Her forehead wrinkled in concern. Quickly, she looked around. The large containers that should have held plenty of grape juice were empty. Running out of grape juice would bring the party to a quick end. The guests would go home. Mary's heart felt heavy. She knew the disappointment and disgrace this would bring to the groom's family. What's more, she had helped plan the party. Mary felt responsible, but what could she do? The marketplace was closed. There was no way to buy more juice. There was nothing she could do. Or was there? Then Mary thought of the perfect way to solve the problem. Jesus. He and his disciples were also guests at the wedding. Mary hurried to Jesus. They're out of wine, she told him anxiously. Jesus understood the seriousness of the situation, but what could he do? Dear woman, why are you trying to bring me into this? Jesus asked kindly. My time has not yet come. Mary felt desperate. Here was an urgent need. Jesus could help. She was certain. Pushing the servants forward, she commanded them, Do whatever he tells you. Jesus looked around and saw six large stone water jars sitting nearby. Each jar could hold about 20 gallons. Fill these jars with water, he quietly told the servants. They hurried to obey. Soon they had filled the six jars all the way to the brim. Now draw out some water and take it to the man in charge of the feast, Jesus directed. So the servants filled a jug. As they did, they noticed something strange. This did not look like water. It did not smell like water. Quickly they took it into the feast and filled the glass belonging to the man in charge. He didn't know what happened. He just lifted his glass and drank. Smiling, he called to the bridegroom. Everyone serves the best wine first, he said. And after the guests have drunk a lot, he serves the ordinary wine. But you have saved the best till now. This was Jesus' first miracle. His disciples saw what happened when Jesus served others. They determined more than ever to put their faith in him. They would become his closest friends. We make friends for God when we serve others too. Today's story is called Struck by the Light. The memory verse is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Today's message is God's love is like a light in darkness. You may have seen a bully in action at school or in your neighborhood. You may have even been bullied. Bullies try to make others feel afraid. Saul in the Bible, he was a bully. He got the priests to give him power to arrest new Christians, but God had other plans for Saul. Saul's voice boomed like thunder, and lightning almost seemed to sizzle around him. He was as dangerous as lightning, too. His only goal in life was to search out and stamp out the new Christians. 
Saul and his assistants strode purposefully down the road. They were headed for the famous old city of Damascus. Official letters they carried gave them permission to capture Christians. Then they would take them back to Jerusalem, where they would be put to death. The hot noonday sun blazed down on the travelers, but they marched steadily on. They were intent on their mission, even though they were tired. They had traveled almost a hundred and fifty miles in the past few days. Now Damascus was almost within sight. Then, with no warning at all, in the middle of this very ordinary day, it happened. A beam of light flashed down from heaven. It was far, far brighter than the noonday sun. The travelers fell to the ground in shock. Saul stared into the astonishing brightness. Then Jesus spoke to him. Saul, Saul, Jesus said, why do you persecute me? Saul could only stare and whisper, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you persecute, Jesus answered. Jesus really was God. He really was. And he really had risen from the dead, just as the Christians believed. And Saul understood what Jesus was saying to him. When you persecute my followers, Saul, you are really persecuting me. Saul then asked, Lord, what do you want me to do? Jesus answered, Get up and go into the city. There you will be told what you must do. And then the light was gone. The men traveling with Saul were speechless. They had certainly seen the light, but they had not seen Jesus. They had heard a noise, but they had not understood Jesus' words. They struggled to their feet, looking at each other and wondering what had just happened. Saul looked around too, but he couldn't see a thing. He was blind, absolutely, totally blind. He turned his head from side to side. I, I can't see, he whispered. Saul's friends took him by the hand. They led him down the road to the city. What a strange procession! Only a few minutes before, Saul had been a mighty hunter, eager to hunt down and capture every Christian. And now he was being led down the road like a little child. Saul's feet scuffed along through the dust, but he wasn't paying any attention to where he was being led. There was only one thought in his mind, and that was Jesus. A Night to Remember Our message is Celebrations Help Us Remember What God Has Done For Us. The memory verse for this week is from Psalm 77, verse 11. It says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Birthdays are usually fun celebrations. How do you celebrate your birthday? Are there any special days that you celebrate in your town or country? Perhaps you have a national day where you celebrate some big event in your country's history. These celebrations help us remember important things. Moses turned his back on Pharaoh's palace and began the walk back to Goshen, the part of Egypt where the Israelites lived. Pharaoh's voice still thundered in Moses' ears. Get out of my sight, Pharaoh had bellowed. I never want to see you again. Moses knew that the time had finally come. He pulled his robes a little higher and walked a little faster. He thought about all that had happened since the time God had first appeared to him. He had performed miracles in Pharaoh's court and asked Pharaoh to let the Israelites go free. Pharaoh had not been impressed. All Pharaoh could think about was what would happen if Egypt lost all of its slave labor. There had been nine plagues, the Nile River turning to blood, the frogs, the gnats, the flies, 
and all the rest. Pharaoh had come close to letting the Israelites go a time or two, but in the end, he always refused. Now, this would be the end. They would be leaving Egypt soon, very soon. Moses quickly called the Israelites together to give them God's latest message. Listen, said Moses, and follow these directions very carefully. Each family must select a perfect lamb, a one-year-old male. Four days from now, at twilight, the father in each family is to sacrifice the lamb and save some of its blood. Each father is to dip a hyssop branch into the blood and use the branch to put some of the blood on the sides and top of the door frame of his house. After the blood is on the doorpost, no one, absolutely no one, is to go outside again until morning. It is very, very important that you do this, said Moses. At midnight, the Lord will pass through the land of Egypt. He will strike dead the firstborn in every house that doesn't have the blood on the doorstop, from Pharaoh's palace to the prisoner in the dungeon. But the Lord will pass over the houses that have blood on the doorpost. Do you understand? A murmur of understanding rumbled through the crowd. Then take the lamb into the house and roast it whole, continued Moses. Eat it with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. If anything is left over, burn it in the fire. Do not try to save leftovers. If your family is too small to eat a whole lamb, get together with a neighbor and share it. But both of you must put blood over your door frames. Again, the crowd murmured its understanding. There's one more thing, instructed Moses. Eat. Standing up with your coat and your shoes on and your staff in your hand, eat quickly. It will be the last meal you eat in Egypt. The Lord will set us free. Moses watched as the families headed home to select a lamb for the meal. This is the first Passover, Moses thought. We will celebrate what God is about to do for us, but we will celebrate the Passover again next year and then we will be celebrating what God has done for us. We will be free. Then that year and every year after that, we will remember God's goodness in leading us out of slavery. Today's story is called More Time on the Clock. The memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 38, Verse 7, it says, The Lord will do what He has promised. Today's message is God keeps His promises. Kari was sick, so sick she didn't think she could ever get well. Day after day she felt awful, and day after day she prayed that God would make her well. God heard her prayers, and she got better. Kari learned that God answers prayer. King Hezekiah learned that, too. King Hezekiah was helpless. He didn't like the feeling. He was used to being in charge of his life, but now he was very sick. In his bedroom, King Hezekiah tossed and turned feverishly. His head ached, and his body probably felt sore all over. He thought about his life. He had been a good king. He had obeyed God and been faithful. He had done what the prophets had told him to do. What would happen to him now? God knew that the king was a good man. He knew that the king had some questions. So he sent the prophet Isaiah to talk to him. Isaiah had news that the king did not want to hear. He told the king as gently as he could, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order, because you are going to die. You will not recover. And then Isaiah left. Being a messenger of God wasn't always pleasant. 
King Hezekiah turned his face away from his servants and faced his bedroom wall. He began to cry with loud sobs. Everyone nearby could hear him. Clearly, his heart was broken and he was afraid. The servants, too, were frightened. They wanted to help, but they didn't know how. In his most helpless moment, the king turned to God and reviewed his life. Remember how I have followed you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion, Hezekiah said. I have done what is good in your eyes. He started crying again. God took pity on Hezekiah. He sent Isaiah back to the king with a new message. Isaiah said, This is what the Lord says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add fifteen years to your life. This is the Lord's sign to you that He will do what He has promised. He will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway at Ahaz. The shadow would move backward. Then Isaiah told the servants how to care for Hezekiah, and they did as Isaiah said. Hezekiah lived another fifteen years and continued to serve God. Hezekiah wrote about this miracle. You can read his words in Isaiah chapter 38. He praised God for being healed and promised to tell his story to his children. He promised to praise God for his faithfulness. He said with confidence, The Lord will save me, and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Not everyone experiences a miracle as King Hezekiah did. People still die from being sick. But there is hope. God has promised to send Jesus to take us to heaven. When He comes, those who have been faithful will be resurrected. In heaven, we will live forever with Jesus, and no one will get sick or die. We can believe that promise because God keeps all His promises, just as He did for Hezekiah. Today's story is called, When Jesus Comes Again. The memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 38, verse 20. It says, The Lord will save me, and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Today's message is when Jesus comes again, we will live with Him and worship Him forever. Can you imagine worshiping God forever and ever? Forever means never ending. Well, maybe it's hard to imagine it now, but that is what we will do in heaven. Let's look in on a family who is eager for Jesus to come. Benjamin smiled as he watched the clouds move while he ate his picnic lunch. He turned to his father. Wow, Dad, he said. Those clouds make me think of Jesus' coming. Me too, Dad agreed. The family had been hiking in the mountains. Now they were sitting on a huge rock by the river eating lunch. I want Jesus to come and take us to heaven right now, little sister Benita shouted. Me too, Mom replied with a smile. Later, during worship, they read from Revelation chapters 7, 21, and 22. The Bible says that Jesus will make a new heaven and a new earth, Dad began. And when Jesus comes again, we will live with him and praise him forever. And there won't be any tears or death or pain either, Mom added. Just imagine it, Dad continued. The new Jerusalem will be like a big square. It will have twelve gates and twelve foundations. Wow! 
Look at all the jewels that will make up the foundations, Benjamin exclaimed. Green jasper, blue sapphire, yellow crystallite. He read on through the 12 different stones and a huge gate will be made of a single pearl. Think how beautiful it will be, said mom. There won't be a temple or a church there. Jesus is the temple. Jesus will always be with us. Nothing can keep us from being with him. I like this part, dad added. We won't need any lamps or lights. The glory of God's presence is the light, and there will never be night again. No more naps for me, little Benita chimed in. Mother smiled. She knew Benita didn't like to take naps. People from every nation on earth will be there, Benjamin added. Those who loved and obeyed Jesus. Dad read more in Revelation chapter 7. There they learned what John tells about the people in heaven. They will wear white robes and wave palm branches as they sing to praise God. Everyone will thank him as they bow down before his throne. They will say, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Oh, Mom added, chapter 22 says the river of life flows from God's throne and runs right through the city. The tree of life is in the very middle of the city. Part of its trunk is on both sides of the river. The tree gives 12 different kinds of fruits, a different one for each month of the year. Mmm, I can't wait. Dad continued, There won't be any more sin. We'll see God's face and have his name, and we will live with Jesus always. I want Jesus to come, Benjamin shouted. That's just what John said, Dad pointed out. Yes, Jesus, come. Yes, Jesus, come, little Benita echoed. How about you? Jesus says to you, come, Drink of the water of life. Come live with me forever. God offers us the gift of heaven and a life with Jesus forever. It will be more wonderful than we can imagine. And we will want to thank God and Jesus for it often. Yes, we will worship and praise them forever and we'll never get tired of doing that. Today's story is called Human Gods. Today's message is we serve God when we help others. The memory verse is from Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, Carry each other's burdens, and you will fulfill the law of Christ. Denise and Cameron were new to the country. Everyone looked so different, and many of them spoke a different language. It was a strange experience, but they shared their toys and helped others. Pretty soon they made friends, but they also had some kids who did not like them. Just like Denise and Cameron, Paul and Barnabas traveled to a new place where they didn't know anyone. They traveled to share the good news of Jesus' love. Here's the story of what happened next. Paul and Barnabas stopped to rest by the roadside. They looked at the city before them. Most of the people of Lystra don't know anything at all about the God of heaven, Paul sighed. Not for long, Barnabas smiled. The two apostles prayed, Show us, Lord, 
how to let the people of Lystra know the good news about Jesus. They walked on and soon entered the city. The two friends began to talk to people. Soon, several of the townspeople had gathered to listen. As he spoke, Paul noticed a man who had never been able to walk. Paul may have silently prayed, He believes you, Jesus. You can make him well. Then Paul said to the man, Stand up on your feet. And the man jumped up and walked. Amazing! Unbelievable! People began to shout, How could this be? Someone in the crowd shouted, The gods! The gods have come down to visit us! Others agreed. They believed that their gods sometimes came to help them in miraculous ways. After seeing the lame man healed, they were sure that Paul and Barnabas were gods too. The people became so excited, they shouted, Let's have a celebration! We can offer sacrifices to these gods and give them gifts! Paul and Barnabas moved among the crowd. No, 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 they said. You don't understand. We're people just like you. We have come to tell you the good news about the real God, the true and living God. He is the one who made the sky, the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. But the people were determined to worship Paul and Barnabas. About that time, some Jews heard about the excitement. They came to see it for themselves. These men wanted to stop the work of Paul and Barnabas. They saw that the townspeople were upset because Paul and Barnabas had stopped their celebration so it wasn't hard to make them turn against God's men. Very quickly, the same people who had wanted to worship the apostles now wanted to kill them. In fact, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. The Christian believers of Lystra sadly gathered around Paul. He was bruised and bleeding, but he got up. They helped him back to the city where they could care for him. But Paul and Barnabas decided to leave that place. We will travel to Derby for a little while, but we will come back soon to help you and to encourage you. Paul and Barnabas were willing to show God's love to others. Their words and kind actions led others to know Jesus. How about you? How can your actions say, Jesus loves you? to someone this week. Today's story is called Challenging Choices. The memory verse is from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 7. It says, People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. The message is, God helps me accept everyone. Have you ever been in a situation in which you did not know what to do? Queen Esther was. Read on to find out what she did. Mordecai was happy that Esther became queen, but he still did not want her to tell others that she was a Jew. One day when he was sitting at the palace gate, Mordecai heard two guards talking. They were angry with the king and were planning to kill him. Mordecai told Esther, who told the king. King Xerxes investigated Mordecai's report. It was true. The guards were arrested and hanged. All of this was written in the daily court record. About the same time, King Xerxes made Haman his second-in-command. King Xerxes ordered that everyone should bow down to Haman when they saw him. And everyone did, except Mordecai. One day, Haman noticed that Mordecai did not bow to him. He became very angry. Haman knew Mordecai was a Jew. He began thinking about ways to destroy Mordecai and all the other Jews. Haman decided to tell the king that a certain group of people were causing trouble and that they should be destroyed. He said that he would pay the people who destroyed them. He did not tell the king that the people were Jews. Keep your money, 
the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. When Mordecai heard the order, he put on rough clothes. He covered himself with ashes and cried at the city gate. Esther's servants told her how Mordecai was dressed. She sent good clothes for him to wear, but he refused to put them on. Esther sent Hathak, her servant, to talk to Mordecai. Mordecai told him everything that had happened. He even gave Hathak a copy of the order for Esther. Mordecai told him to ask Esther to go to the king and beg for mercy. Hathak hurried to give Esther the message. Esther sent a message back to Mordecai. No one may go to the king's throne room without being called. If anyone goes and the king holds out his gold scepter, that person may live. But if the king doesn't, that person dies. And I haven't been called to the king for thirty days. Mordecai answered, Just because you live in the king's palace, don't think that the people won't soon know you are a Jew. You can't escape. If you remain silent, help will come from another place. But you and the rest of our family will die. And who knows, you may have been chosen to be queen to save us at this terrible time. Esther sent one final message to Mordecai. Get all the Jews in Susa together. Tell them not to eat or drink anything for three days and three nights. My servants and I will do the same. Then, even though it's against the law, I will go to the king. And if I die, I die. What will happen to Esther? Will she die? We'll learn more next week. Today's story is called Too Precious to Lose. The memory verse is from Luke chapter 19, verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The message is Jesus looks for me because I am precious to him. Kristen's best friend, Kaylin, gave her a special book for her birthday. One day, Kristen lost the book. She looked all over for it. In our story today, Jesus tells about a woman who lost something important. Perhaps it happened like this. The morning sun warmed the back of the busy women. Laughter rippled through the crowd as they shared stories. Laundry day meant hard work, but happy visiting. As the women scrubbed and rinsed, they had something new to talk about. Have you heard the stories Jesus tells? asked one. They are so interesting, said another. He understands how we live. Back and forth they talked about seeing the sick people healed and about the kind things Jesus said. I hope to take the children to listen to him tomorrow, smiled a young mother. Oh, I would love to go along, agreed another. Soon, several of the women were making plans for the next day. Happy children skipped along beside their mothers the next day. Excitement was in the air. Soon, all the people sat down and Jesus began to speak. He told them a story about a shepherd losing one of his sheep and how happy the shepherd felt when he found it. Then Jesus began to tell a story that the little group of laundry ladies leaned forward in to hear. There once was a woman who had ten silver coins. One day, the woman lost one of her silver coins. Oh no! The woman thought about the poor woman in the story. That was about the most awful thing that could happen to a wife. What would her husband say? What would her neighbors and friends say? The lady lit a lamp and began to sweep her house, Jesus went on. She looked everywhere for her lost coin. Jesus watched the faces of the people listening to his story. He knew what their homes were like. Because they had small windows or no windows at all, it was dark inside, 
even in the daytime, it would be hard to find a coin. She kept searching. She would just not give up. On the table, under the table, behind the heavy water pot, she looked and looked. She searched the dirt floor. Suddenly, she saw it. I found it! She cried, quickly picking up the smooth coin. Dashing outside, she ran to her neighbors and friends. Come, celebrate with me! I lost one of my coins, and now I found it. Many in the crowd laughed with relief. Jesus laughed with them. With a twinkle in his eye, he added, "There is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents." Today's story is called "God Leads the Way." The memory verse is from John chapter fourteen, verse three. It says, "If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am." Today's message is thanks to God, we will live with Him and worship Him forever. Everyone in Mrs. Singh's class was looking forward to the class trip. This is going to be so much fun," Devon whispered to his friend Daryl. "I know," Daryl responded excitedly. "But did you get your permission slip signed? Remember, Mrs. Singh said you won't be able to go if it isn't signed." The day of the trip came, and all the students gathered in the room. This was the last chance for students to hand in their permission slips. And just then, Devon realized that he didn't have his. He had to stay in another classroom while his classmates went on the trip. How disappointed he was! Something like that happened to Moses at the end of his life. With God's leading, Moses had safely guided the children of Israel for many years. They had traveled all the way from Egypt to the edge of the Promised Land. Now they were about to enter the land. Moses wanted to go with them, but God told Moses he could not. He must tell his people goodbye. So Moses wrote a message for them. It's the Bible book of Deuteronomy today. In it, he reminded the people of all the wonderful things God had done for them. He reminded them that God still had a wonderful plan for their lives. Remember God and worship Him. You will live long, Moses wrote. But if your heart turns away and you worship other gods, you will not live long in the land. Moses put down his pen at last and went out to speak to the people. I am a hundred and twenty years old, he told them. I am no longer able to be your leader. The Lord has told me that I will not cross the Jordan; I will not go into Canaan. The people looked at one another in dismay. Surely Moses didn't mean it. What would happen to them without him? What would they do? The Lord your God will go before you. Joshua will be your leader, as the Lord has said. Moses went on. Be determined and confident. Do not be afraid. Then Moses called Joshua to stand beside him. He placed his hands on Joshua. You are the one who will lead these people into Canaan. You will see them live in the land that the Lord has promised, he said. The Lord Himself will lead you and be with you. He will not fail you, or leave you. So do not lose courage or be afraid. Then Moses turned to the priest. He gave them the copy of the law that God had told him to write, the Ten Commandments. The priest must learn it well. At the end of every seven years, he said, read this law aloud at the Feast of Tabernacles. Read it so everyone may hear it 
and remember to worship God. Finally, Moses gave Joshua a copy of a beautiful song that God had helped him write. Help the people learn this song, Moses said. It will remind them to serve God only. The people listened quietly as Moses read it. Then Moses spoke his last words to the children of Israel. Be sure to obey the commands that I have given you today, he pleaded. Repeat them to your children so that they may faithfully obey God's teaching. These are not empty words. They are your very life. On that same day, the Lord told Moses to climb Mount Nebo, and there the Lord spent special time encouraging Moses. Just before Moses died, God showed him the promised land. The Bible says that Moses saw all the land, all the way to the northernmost town of Dan, all the way west to the sea, and south through what would become the land of Judah. Moses died on the mountain. He died peacefully as the Lord said he would. But Moses did not stay in the grave. Soon God raised him up and took him to live with him in heaven forever. Moses is there today. There was never another prophet in Israel like Moses. God had a plan for him, and he has a plan for us. Thanks to God, we will live with him and worship him forever. Today's story is called Appointment with God. The memory verse is Matthew chapter 12, verse 8. It says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The message is the Sabbath is a day to learn more about God's love. Lisa came home from school on Friday. There was that wonderful smell again. Mom was baking bread for Sabbath. Lisa washed her hands and helped her mother finish the Sabbath dinner. Lisa loved Sabbath. This week after church, they were going to have lunch near a duck pond and then take a walk in the woods. Lisa couldn't wait. In today's story, Jesus and his disciples were taking a Sabbath walk too. Let's join them. Jesus loved the Sabbath. He loved to spend time with his friends and talk with them about the love of God. He loved to help people who were sick or sad feel better. One Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples passed through a field of grain. Jesus and the disciples were hungry. In those days, the people had permission to eat food from another person's farm. If people were hungry and had no food with them, they could eat a few grapes in a vineyard, or they could pick some wheat stalks and eat the little kernels of grain. So as Jesus' disciples walked through the field, they picked some stalks. They rubbed the heads of grain back and forth, back and forth in their hands. When just the little kernels were left, they tossed the kernels into their mouths. The crunchy grain tasted good. But not everyone was happy. Pharisees nearby decided that the disciples were doing something wrong. They said to Jesus, When your disciples picked up the wheat and rubbed it in their hands to get the kernels out, that was like a farmer working. So they are breaking the Sabbath. The Pharisees had taken God's beautiful Sabbath commandment and had made it into their own rule. They made up lots of extra rules that made Sabbath a heavy burden. God wanted Sabbath to be a special day for people to enjoy. He wanted them to learn about His love. But because of these extra rules, many people did not enjoy Sabbath. Jesus loved these Pharisees. He wanted them to know the joy of Sabbath too. Jesus asked them some questions to make them think. Do you remember David? He asked. One time, he and his men were very hungry, 
So they ate the special temple bread that was really just for the priests. The Pharisees knew about that. If that was okay, then eating grain on Sabbath is okay too, Jesus continued. People should not suffer on Sabbath. The Sabbath is for people. I know, for I am Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, while Jesus was in the synagogue, he saw a man whose hand was crippled. Jesus asked the people, What do you think? Is it right to do good on the Sabbath? Some of the people didn't think the man should be made well because it was Sabbath. Jesus asked them another question to make them think. If one of your sheep fell into a hole, wouldn't you pull it out? A person is so much more valuable than an animal. Therefore, it is right to do good on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to the crippled man, Stretch out your hand. The man's hand was completely healed. Jesus wants us to know that Sabbath is a day for joy and healing. Sometimes children think that Sabbath is a do not day. Do not do this. Do not do that. Actually, Sabbath is a do day. On Sabbath, we have more time to do something special, to do fun things that teach us about God's love. God created the Sabbath so together we can spend time with Him and learn more and more about His wonderful love. Today's story is called God is Number One. The memory verse is from Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. Today's message is God is worthy of our worship. Have you ever moved into a new town or a new school? Before you got there, what questions did you have? Were you dreaming about your new room? In this story, the Israelite people have spent a lifetime living in tents. But now, they are at the border of the Promised Land, waiting for the order to pack up and move in. Moses wishes he was going too. Moses stood there, tall and motionless. The early morning breeze began to play gently with the edges of his robe, but he didn't notice. His eyes were fastened on the camp, the huge camp of the children of Israel spread out on the plain. For forty years, God had used Moses to lead these people. He had led them through all kinds of dangers. God had blessed Moses and performed wonderful miracles through him. The Red Sea had parted to let the people go across, and the waters had returned just in time to save them from the Egyptian army. Once, in anger, Moses used his rod to strike the rock, and pure drinking water had poured out. Moses regretted striking that rock. He knew that God had said that speaking would be enough. Because he disobeyed, Moses would not cross over into the new land. He must say goodbye to the people this side of the Jordan. At first, Moses pleaded with God, O oh, sovereign God, let me go over and see the good land. But God spoke plainly, This is enough. Do not speak to me any more about this matter. Moses accepted what God wanted and God made an offer to ease the old man's disappointment. Go up to the top of Pisgah and look at the land, God said, since you are not going to cross this Jordan. Sadly, Moses stood watching the tents of Israel. His beloved people were just waking up. Many of them were wildly excited about crossing the Jordan River, but some were afraid. 
Moses shook his head, and a little smile grew on his lips. This had to be the most stubborn group of people in the world. And he loved them, everyone. Then God's loving whisper showed Moses what to do. He must write a book, the fifth book of the Bible that we call Deuteronomy. In this book, he would write about God's miracles and love and leading. He would include the Ten Commandments and give a message to help the people stay true to their forever friend. Moses knew that the Lord was about to give them cities already built. He was going to give them houses full of good things. The Lord would provide wells of water for them that they had not dug, and vineyards and olive trees they had not planted. All the Lord asked was that they love Him. But the children of Israel could easily forget where these blessings had come from. Moses knew. Remember to love the Lord with all your heart and soul and strength, he wanted to shout. If only they would do that. If only they would tell others. The people could remember God. The children would grow up to know him if they would keep telling God's story. Over and over they must tell it. They must talk about the Lord and praise him every day. At home, at work, when they were traveling, and when they were resting. That was the key. And that was so simple. Keep loving God. Keep telling His story. And that's what God asks of us today. Keep loving Him and keep telling others about our wonderful God. Today's story is called Long Journeys. The memory verse is actually one of my favorites. It's from Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It says, My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus. The message is, God can guide our lives just as He guided the wise men and Jesus' parents. Have you ever gone on a long journey? Did it take a long time to pack and prepare? Mary and Joseph went on a long journey, and they had to leave in a hurry. For some time after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph lived in Bethlehem. They moved from the stable to a much better place, and Mary often thought of the nighttime visit of the shepherds. Weeks later, another group of visitors came to see Jesus. It happened like this. On the night Jesus was born, some wise men in a country far away and to the east of Judea were studying the sky. They saw a strange light that faded away. As it faded away, a new star appeared. These wise men, called Magi, had studied the stars for a long time, but this star was one they had never seen before. The sight of that light and a bright new star made these men very curious. They immediately began to study old writings. Soon they discovered an old prophecy about a star out of Jacob and a scepter that would rise out of Israel. They wondered if this new star could be the fulfillment of that prophecy. Could it be a sign of the promised Messiah? the Jews had talked about for years? They decided it was. In their country, it was the custom to give gifts to princes, kings, and other important people. So the wise men carried gold, myrrh, and frankincense with them. They would give these expensive gifts to the promised Savior. They traveled by night so they could keep the star in view. And when they stopped during the day, they continued to study the prophecies. And they became more and more convinced that this child was the promised one. After many days, the wise men approached Jerusalem. There, the star seemed to rest over the temple. They went to the priests 
and rulers. Where is the king of the Jews? they asked, but no one seemed to know. King Herod heard about these men from the east, so he questioned the Jewish priests and rulers. From them he learned that the prophet Micah had said the child would be born in Bethlehem. Herod talked with the wise men and sent them to Bethlehem. When you have found the child, he said, come back and tell me where he is. I want to worship him too. But Herod was lying. He planned to kill Jesus. So the wise men traveled to Bethlehem. There they found Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus. These wise men were not Jewish, but they recognized that Jesus was the one God had promised. So they knelt and worshipped him and presented their gifts. Before the wise men left Bethlehem, God warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod, but to go home a different way. Days later, Herod finally realized that the wise men were not coming back to Jerusalem. That made him very angry. He had to find that baby. So he ordered the death of all babies in Bethlehem that were two years old and younger. But God was still in charge. He warned Joseph in a dream, Get up! Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Herod will start looking for the child to kill him. Stay in Egypt until I tell you to return. The little family left at once, in the dark of the night. They may have used the gifts of the wise men to supply their needs. Egypt became their home until Herod died. Then God sent an angel to tell Joseph that it was safe to return to their homeland. At first, Joseph thought about going back to Bethlehem, but God warned him and sent him to another place. They settled in the little town of Nazareth, Joseph's former home. That's where Jesus grew up. God loves you and your family too. He will guide you and care for you just as He guided Jesus' parents. Help Wanted The message for this week is, I worship God when I use my abilities to do His work. The memory verse is from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. Ah Ming and Mei Li huddled in front of Dad's iPad. They were watching a video of someone on the screen build a great-looking origami house. They followed the directions step by step, and eventually they had a great-looking house too. Some things need a pattern, directions, or a plan. God knew plans were important when the Israelites started to build the tabernacle, a sanctuary for Him. The Israelites found it hard to describe their feelings of joy and happiness. God loved them so much that He wanted a home in their camp. They called God's tabernacle home His sanctuary. They could talk to God anytime, just as we can. But God knew it was important for the Israelites to have a place where they could meet with Him. The Israelites had lived in Egypt a long time. They knew more about Egyptian gods than they knew about the living God who had rescued them. It would be very easy for them to forget God. The tabernacle was God's way of reminding them that He was there all the time. First, the Israelites collected the materials they would need. They happily gave their gifts. Everyone gave the best things they owned for God's home. They brought silver, gold, and brass, as well as the best material and animal skins. In fact, they gave so much that God told Moses, Tell them to stop. We have enough. Everyone wanted to help with the building project, from the oldest to the youngest. Everyone wanted to do something. God wanted His house to be very special for the people. He gave plans to Moses for the workers. He described everything in great detail. Soon it was time to choose who was going to do what. God talked to Moses. 
Building my sanctuary is the most important thing you will do. I have chosen two special people to help. Bezalel and Oholiab come from different tribes. Bezalel is Uri's son, Hur's grandson, and comes from the tribe of Judah. Oholiab comes from the tribe of Dan. He is Ahizamak's son. I have blessed these men in a special way. They will be able to work with all kind of crafts. They can follow the plans I have given you. No one will be able to make things as well as they can. You will need many other skilled people to help. Everyone who works on the building will receive an extra blessing from me. I will make their talents and abilities much better than before. Remember to make all the things I showed you. I gave you the plans for the meeting tent and everything inside, including the ark and its special cover. When the ark is finished, put the Ten Commandments inside. The Israelites worked together to build God's tabernacle home. Happiness filled their hearts as they worked. Just as God promised, He blessed their talents and abilities. Our church is like the Israelites' tabernacle. We come here to worship God and praise Him for everything He does for us. When we use our talents and abilities for God, He will bless them and improve them. Today's story is called, A Community Celebrates. The memory verse is from Psalm 145, verse 7. It says, They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The message is God's family celebrates His love together. Think about the best celebration you ever had. It may have been a birthday or Christmas. What made it so special? King Josiah and the Israelites had a very special celebration together. Let's read about it. Josiah had achieved much during his reign. The Israelites broke down their idols, and the Book of the Law had been found in the temple. After reading the Book of the Law, Josiah wanted to celebrate the people's decision to follow God. The Passover had not been celebrated for many years, so he decided to gather everyone together for a big community celebration. Normally, people celebrated the Passover feast with their families or neighbors. Josiah recognized that not everyone would be able to afford to sacrifice an animal. So he gave 30,000 sheep and goats and 3,000 cattle. Other leaders wanted to help too. They gave thousands of animals for Passover offerings. The Passover celebration was to remind the Israelites of their time as slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh, the Egyptian king, refused to let the Israelites go. So God sent ten plagues to force Pharaoh to set the Israelites free. The plagues were terrible. Water turned to blood. Frogs were everywhere. Darkness, lice, and hailstones added more pain. But the tenth plague was the worst. It would involve taking the life of the firstborn of families in Egypt. However, God had instructed Israelite families to sacrifice a lamb and put its blood on the doorposts. It was to be a sign. When the angel saw the blood, he would pass over that house. If the angel did not see the blood on the doorposts, the firstborn would die. The Israelites obeyed God, so that night when the angel came, he took the life of the firstborn of every Egyptian family. The Passover feast also showed people how God would save them from their sin. The lamb sacrificed during the feast represented Jesus, the Messiah, who would die on the cross for everyone's sins. The Passover feast included special food. 
The people ate unleavened bread. That's bread without yeast. It was a flat bread. At the time of the first Passover, there was no time to let the bread rise. Yeast also reminded the people of sin and how it could come silently into their lives. The lamb was roasted and eaten with bitter herbs. The bitter herbs reminded the Israelites of the hard time they had as slaves. When the Passover day came, all the priests stood in their places to celebrate the Passover for the people. They divided all the people into family groups. Then they sacrificed the animals, roasted them, and gave the meat to the people. No work was allowed during the Passover. The people enjoyed plenty of food and wonderful music. After the Passover, the people celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread together for seven days. All this time was spent in celebration of God's goodness. He had saved His people, and they would never forget it. Today's story is called The Unknown God. Today's message is I Serve God When I Tell Others About Him. The memory verse is from Acts chapter 17, verse 27. It says, God is not far from each of us. Have you ever pretended that you didn't hear your mom the first time she calls you? Sometimes we pretend that we can't hear someone, especially if they want us to do something we don't want to do. A long time ago, Paul tried to tell some people about the good news of Jesus, but many of them did not want to listen. Thank you so much for traveling with me to Athens, Paul said to his friends visiting from the city of Berea. These people had just recently learned about Jesus. They had followed Paul to Athens so he could teach them more as they traveled. Please send Silas and Timothy this way just as soon as you can. Paul waved goodbye as his friends left to go back home to Berea. Paul was lonely in Athens. There didn't seem to be a single person who knew about or believed in Jesus. Dear God, Paul may have prayed, Please show me how to share your love with the people of this city. Beautiful statues and buildings and artwork surrounded the people of Athens. Expensive temples filled with all kinds of idols seemed to be everywhere. Athens was known as a city overflowing with intelligent people. But as Paul walked around, he felt sorry for them. They thought they knew so much but they really didn't know the most important thing. They didn't know about Jesus. Paul soon began talking to people, and his words made people think and ask questions. They wanted to hear what he had to say about Jesus. One day, someone invited Paul to speak at the Areopagus on top of Mars Hill. The Areopagus was a special place where philosophers met to talk and listen to the latest ideas. Such men were considered to be very intelligent and wise. It was an honor to be invited to speak there. Friends, Paul began, I can see that you are very religious. Everywhere I look, I see statues and altars to different gods. On one statue, I notice the words, to an unknown God. I'm here today to tell you about Him. The true God of heaven made the world and everything in it. It is God in heaven who gives life and breath to everyone. As he continued speaking, many of the people listened carefully. Then Paul told them about the resurrection of Jesus. Some of the people said, You're crazy! This is just a bunch of nonsense. But there were a few who said, we want to hear more. Not very many people in the city of Athens believed in Jesus. They thought their own wisdom was better than God's wisdom. But there were some who became Christians. Dionysius, 
an important man in the city government, and a woman named Damaris chose to follow Jesus. Paul was able to talk boldly to the intelligent people of Athens because he knew God himself. What can you do to get to know Jesus better? Do you really want to know Jesus so you can tell others about Him? Two by Two The message is, Jesus gives me what I need to serve Him. Our memory verse this week is from Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Freely you have received, freely give. Have you ever been asked to do something that you didn't know how to do? How did you feel? Were you scared or nervous? A long time ago, Jesus called 12 men to do something they had never done before. Would Jesus ever ask us to do something we could not do? He asked Peter, Andrew, James, and John to leave their jobs as fishermen and follow Him. That might have seemed impossible, but they did follow Him. They left everything behind and traveled with Jesus as His special helpers. He asked eight other disciples to follow Him too. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew the tax collector, Thaddeus, Judas, Simon the zealot, and another James, the son of Alphaeus, all became Jesus' disciples. These men followed Jesus throughout Israel. What a wonderful time they must have had! They listened to Jesus talk about heaven. They watched Him heal the sick. Sometimes a person would run up to Jesus screaming and shaking as his eyes rolled around in his head. Get out of him! Jesus would say to a demon that controlled the person. Instantly, that person would become normal again. He would say thank you to Jesus and calmly walk home. The twelve disciples had followed Jesus for several months. Jesus decided it was time for them to help others. So he told them he was going to send them out on their own, two by two. Then he told them to do some things that they had never been able to do. Tell everyone you meet that a place in God's kingdom is ready for those who believe in me. You will heal the sick and cure people who have leprosy. You will drive out demons and raise the dead, Jesus said. Raise the dead? No one can do that. Drive out demons? That's impossible. But actually, it isn't. Jesus' power can do all kinds of miracles. All the disciples followed Jesus' directions that day. Are you surprised? After months of following Him, they knew Jesus could help them. They could do anything He asked of them. They didn't pack any bags to go on their trip. They didn't take extra shoes or even a change of clothes. Jesus had told them not to worry about anything. He would give them what they needed to serve Him. When Jesus asks us to do something, He never intends for us to do it alone. He promises His support, even when it seems impossible. With God, all things are possible. All we have to do is follow Him. Jesus may not ask us to do the special work His disciples did. We may never heal the sick or restore sight to the blind, but we are Jesus' children. He has asked you and me to serve Him with all our hearts. He has promised to take care of us. He will make what we can't do into something we can do for Him. Let's serve Him today. Today's story is called The Best Gift of All. Today's memory verse is from John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him 
shall not perish but have eternal life. The message is Jesus is God's special gift to me. Have you ever been in bed and not able to sleep? What do you hear? Mom and dad in another room? An owl hooting or dogs barking outside? What about the sound of traffic? There are all kinds of noises at night. What are the sounds you might have heard the night Jesus was born? The night all of God's promises came true. Imagine that you are there. If you listen closely, you might hear busy people passing outside, or the sounds of donkeys and horses neighing and shifting in their stalls, and the crackling of hay as Joseph and Mary find a comfortable spot to lie down. You might even hear Joseph's kind words as the baby is born. I'm sure you'll hear the baby's first cries. Now look at the baby. He is like other babies, small and a tiny patch of dark hair on his head. Look, even his eyes are closed. His feet and his arms reach through the air for the very first time. Look a little closer. That baby is Jesus. Now look around you. This is no place for Jesus to be born. This is a place full of donkeys and horses that belong to people staying at a nearby inn. And it's dirty. If you look up, you might see birds' nests in the rafters. You may even see a star peeking through the open roof. Watch closely now. Jesus is wrapped in a long cloth strip. He is rocked gently in Mary's arms. And then Jesus is taken to a manger filled with hay where he goes to sleep. Now that doesn't sound like the Son of God. That's impossible. Surely no one would have to take care of God's Son. Before Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem, he was a promise. Just after Adam and Eve had sinned, God had promised them that Sunday a special child would be born that baby would destroy Satan and all his temptations. That wasn't the only promise fulfilled that night. God had told David that one of his great-great-grandchildren would be the Messiah. Messiah means promised one. Both Joseph and Mary were David's descendants. God's servant Micah had written that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and he was. In one day, all of those promises came true. Jesus had lived in heaven. He had created Adam and Eve. Angels adored him. He was the ruler of the universe. But he became a baby. He needed a mother and father to take care of him. He slept in a place where animals usually ate. Why, you ask? Well, Jesus loved us too much to be separated from us. He wanted to live with us so he could show us a way to live with him. He had promises to keep, promises to all of us. He said he would come again, and he will, soon and very soon. everyone, it's Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called Death Sentence. The memory verse is from Psalm chapter 34, verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Today's message is we praise God for rescuing us from sin. Have you ever played that you were a prisoner and caught somewhere? Then did you pretend to be rescued or released? For the Israelites, it was not a game. They were caught in Egypt, but God had a plan to release them. God gave Moses a special job. 
Nine times he went to Pharaoh and asked him to let the Israelites go. Nine times Pharaoh said no. God sent terrible plagues on the land. Water turned to blood, frogs, gnats, and flies covered the land. Cattle died. People suffered with ugly, hurting boils. A hailstorm destroyed most of the crops, and the locusts ate what was left. During the ninth plague, it was dark for three days. It was so dark that the Egyptians couldn't leave their homes or even see each other. After all that, Pharaoh threatened to kill Moses if he ever saw him again. Then God told Moses about the last and most terrible plague. There will be one last plague, God said. After this, Pharaoh will let you go. At midnight, I will send an angel of death throughout Egypt. Every firstborn child will die. I will protect my people if they do as I command. Moses called the people together. Israelites, come and listen to the instructions God has given us. Follow them closely and you will be safe. Ignore them and people will die. Each family must choose a perfect one-year-old lamb. In four days' time, around sunset, the father in each family is to kill the lamb. Some of the blood is to be saved. Sprinkle this blood on the sides and top of your front door frame. After this, no one is to leave the house until morning. God will send an angel throughout the land of Egypt. The firstborn in every family will die, but no one will die in the houses with blood on the doorposts. The angel will pass over those homes. You must roast the lamb, eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. Wear your coat and shoes as you eat. If there is any of the lamb left, burn it in the fire. If your family is too small to eat a whole lamb, invite another family to share it. But both must put the blood on the doorposts of their houses. When the day came, Israelite families followed the instructions exactly. Everyone stayed in their houses until they heard the shouts. The Lord's destroyer has gone through the land. The firstborn of all the Egyptians from Pharaoh to the poorest servant had died. Pharaoh finally agreed to do what God asked. He told the Israelites to leave the country. Everyone excitedly packed their belongings. Their Egyptian masters gave them gifts of gold and silver. The Israelites were excited. They laughed and shouted to each other. We are free! At last, we are free! This meal became known as the Passover. The Israelites celebrated it every year to remind them of how God rescued them from the Egyptians. Jewish people still celebrate it today. The Passover is also a reminder of the promise that Jesus will come and die for our sins. Just as the Lamb's blood saved the firstborn at the first Passover, Jesus' death saves all of us from our sins. If we believe and love Jesus, we are free and can choose to live in heaven because of his death. What a wonderful God! Today's story is called, You Did It For Me. The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. It says, Whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. The message is, Taking care of those in need is like taking care of Jesus. Dad wheeled the lawnmower out of the garage. Go get the rake and the broom, he called to Matt. What's up? Matt asked. Why are you taking the lawnmower away? I just found out that Mr. Hoyt is going into the hospital for surgery. 
so let's go over and mow his lawn. That'll be one less thing for Mrs. Hoyt to worry about while her husband is recovering, Dad said. What do you think? Is that something Jesus would do? Jesus sat on the soft, green grass of the hillside. The breeze ruffled his hair, and he smiled as a butterfly danced through the air. It swooped close to his knees and then sailed away. The disciples shifted to more comfortable positions on the grass. It had been a wonderful day. Jesus had taught them many things, and they never got tired of listening to him. They watched Jesus sitting quietly. They knew he had more stories to tell. They waited. Jesus took a deep breath. He had something very important to say. He wanted to say it just right so the disciples would always remember it. When the Son of Man comes as King with all of the angels, Jesus began, He will sit upon the royal throne. All the people of the world will stand before Him. Then He will separate them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates his goats from his sheep. The disciples nodded. They knew very well how shepherds separated their animals. They had seen it many times. The king will put the righteous people on his right side, Jesus went on. The righteous people are his sheep. He will put the unrighteous people, the goats, on his left side. And then the king will turn and smile to say those on his right hand. He will say to them, When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a cool drink. You invited me into your home when I was a stranger. You gave me clothes when I needed them. When I was sick, you took care of me. You visited me in prison, and now I want to thank you and give you the kingdom that has been prepared for you since the creation of the world. Jesus stopped for a minute. The disciples leaned forward. Everyone was listening. He went on. The righteous people will look wonderingly at the king and ask, When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty? When did we invite you into our homes? When did we give you clothes or visit you in prison? And, Jesus said, the king will answer them. Whenever you did one of those things for the least important person, you were doing it for me. Because you did those kind things for my brothers and my sisters, you did them for me. Then the king will look sadly at the people on his left side. Jesus continued, You didn't feed me when I was hungry, he will say. You didn't give me anything to drink when I was thirsty. You did not invite me in to your home or visit me when I was sick in prison. And the people on the king's left side will shout, When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or sick or in prison and not help you? The king will answer them, when you refused to help my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. Jesus stopped. He so much wanted his disciples to understand what he was saying. He wanted them to learn to love each other the way he loved each one of them. And he wants us to learn that too. A Picture of God The message is God's commandments help us understand Him. The memory verse for this week is from Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. 
Mika jumped up and down with excitement as she looked at the letter from her grandma. In the letter was a picture of Grandma in her new garden. It helped Mika see exactly how Grandma looked now, and it reminded her of the fun things that they had done. Letters, photos, phone calls, and video chats help you remember what that person is like. In today's lesson, God gave the Israelites some words that helped them know what He is like. This was the day. God had told the Israelites to get ready. He was coming to Mount Sinai to talk with them. For two days they had been getting ready, washing their clothes, and above all, staying away from the mountain. God had forbidden them to touch it. Thunder and lightning and a thick, dark cloud hung over the mountain. Suddenly, a loud trumpet blasted. The people trembled. Moses led the people to the foot of the mountain. Smoke covered the mountain and the earth shook. The sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then God spoke. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. First, God reminded the Israelites who he was. He loved them. He wanted them to know and love him too. He knew what they needed to be happy. So he came to Mount Sinai to give them the Ten Commandments. God spoke, You shall have no other gods before me. God wanted them to respect his power, to make him the most important thing in their lives. Then God said, You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For a long time the Israelites had been in Egypt where people worshipped many idols. They had forgotten how to worship God. God spoke again. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who misuses his name. When we love someone, we are careful to respect their name. For the fourth commandment, God said, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. God gave us the Sabbath as a special time to rest and to get to know him better. He also wants us to remember the wonderful way He created us and cares for us. When God gave the fifth commandment, He said, Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. God gave us parents to love us, to care for us, and to help us learn right from wrong. In return, God wants us to respect them and to obey them. God knew that living in loving families is best for us. The next four commandments were short, telling the Israelites how they were to act toward other people. You shall not murder. God alone can give life, and He wants us to respect and protect it. You shall not commit adultery. God wants happy families. He wants parents to be married to each other and to love each other in a special way they don't share with anyone else. You shall not steal. God wants us to respect the things that belong to others. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. God's words are true, and He wants our words to be true as well. The last commandment told the Israelites how they should feel when other people have nice things that they don't have. You should not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. God wants us to focus on Him, not on other people or what they have. God gave these commandments to the Israelites to help them understand Him and what is important to Him. And God knew the Israelites would be happier if they followed His rules. God's rules still tell us what is important to Him. The Ten Commandments still help us understand what God is like. They still give us a picture of God who loves us and wants the best for us.
Today's story is called A Thief in the Family. The memory verse is from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 11. It says, Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. The message is the people and God's family are honest. Have you ever done something you knew you shouldn't do? And when someone asked you about it, you told a lie? How would you feel if you were caught telling a lie? Jacob lied to his father and hurt his whole family. You would have never thought that Jacob and Esau were twins. They looked different. They dressed differently. They even had different interests. They were opposites. Esau liked to hunt, and Jacob loved to stay home and look after the family flocks and herds. Before they were born, God spoke to their mother, Rebecca. He said that the older brother would serve the younger. She didn't know how this would happen, but she believed what God said. Isaac was now old and blind. He decided that it was time for him to give the special blessing to his son. Rebecca reminded him of what God had said. But Esau was Isaac's favorite, and Isaac was determined to give him the blessing. One day, Rebecca overheard Isaac talking to Esau. Esau, I am old, she heard Isaac say. I don't know how long I will live. Take your weapons and hunt some wild game for me. Prepare the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me. Then I will give you my blessing. As soon as Esau left, Rebekah called Jacob to her. She told him what was happening. Then she said, Don't worry, Jacob, I have a plan. Go to the flock and bring me two of the best kid goats. I will prepare food just the way your father likes it. Then you can take it to him and get the blessing. Jacob replied, But he will know the difference. Esau is hairy and I am not. Father would know I was tricking him. He would curse me rather than bless me. If anyone should be cursed, it will be me, his mother responded. Just go and do as I tell you. Rebecca gave Jacob some of Esau's clothes and Jacob put them on. She also covered his hands and neck with goat skins. Then Jacob went to Isaac with the food Rebecca had prepared. Isaac heard Jacob entering the room. Who is it? he asked. Esau, your firstborn, lied Jacob. I have done as you told me, father. Set up and taste this good food and give me the blessing. How did you find the game so quickly? asked Isaac. God helped me, lied Jacob once again. Then Isaac said, Come close so I can touch you. You sound like Jacob, but your hands, they feel like Esau. Are you really Esau? Yes, father, Jacob lied again. Then come and give me some of the food to eat, said Isaac. Jacob brought the meal to Isaac, and Isaac ate. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come here, my son, and kiss me. Jacob went to his father and kissed him. Ah, Isaac said, satisfied at last, the smell of the field. And so that was that Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob hurried away. He had just left when Esau entered his father's tent. Here is the food you asked for, father, 
announced Esau. Isaac trembled, and a shaking voice he asked, Who are you? I am Esau, your firstborn, replied Esau. Then Isaac said, Who was just here? Was it Jacob? Isaac knew then what had happened. He turned to Esau and sadly said, I blessed him. I blessed your brother Jacob. Esau was furious. Can't you bless me as well? Jacob cheated me out of my inheritance. Now he has cheated me out of your blessing. Can't you give me anything? Isaac sadly shook his head. The blessing has been given. I cannot take it away. Esau muttered as he left his father's tent. When my father dies, I will get what is mine. Jacob knew he had done wrong, and he was sorry. He felt sad. His lies had caused problems for everyone. He should have waited. God had made a promise. He would not have needed Jacob's help or Rebekah's help either. What would happen now? Today's story is called, Come Help Us. Today's message is, I serve God when I share my home with others. The memory verse is taken from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. It says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Do you enjoy getting ready for a guest in your home? What is your special responsibility as your family prepares? Do you help fix special food? Do you help with cleaning the house? Our Bible story today is about the kindness of a good woman. Come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul woke up with a start and looked around him. He listened to the even breathing of his friends. No one else was awake. Silas! Silas, wake up! Paul said. Oh! Silas rolled over. Silas, Luke, Timothy, wake up! Paul was wide awake now. I know where we're supposed to go next, he said excitedly to his sleepy companions. God just gave me a vision. I saw a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Come over and help us. Silas yawned and stretched. That's great, Paul. We can catch a ship over to Neapolis from here. Paul didn't sleep much the rest of the night. He knew God was leading them to the cities of Macedonia, and he could hardly wait to be on his way. Soon the four friends were in Philippi, a city in Macedonia. They began preaching to everyone who would listen. They enjoyed sharing their love for Jesus. When Sabbath came, Paul said, Let's go outside the city and sit by the river for our worship. As they neared the riverside, they saw a group of women who had already gathered there to pray. May we join you? Paul asked politely. Yes, please. We would like that, one of the women answered. Then she introduced herself. I'm Lydia, and these are my friends. Paul was happy to meet these women who loved God. It didn't matter if the person was a man or a woman, Jew or Greek. He wanted to share the love of Jesus with everyone. Although Jesus had been living on earth just a short time ago, there were many people who did not know about him. As they sat down, Paul breathed a little prayer. Holy Spirit, please open the hearts of these women to the good news of Jesus. Then Paul told the women how Jesus lived and died to save us. The new friends talked and prayed together. Then some of the women left, but Lydia stayed. I would like to know more. I would like to know why Jesus died for me, she said. That same day, Lydia and her whole family were baptized. Lydia was so happy. Please, Paul, won't you and your companions come stay with us? 
Paul was pleased. He smiled and Lydia encouraged him. We would love to have you, she said. So while they worked in Philippi, Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy stayed at Lydia's house. Lydia was a respected businesswoman in her town. She sold special purple cloth, and it seemed as if everyone knew her. Because of Lydia's kindness in sharing her home, many people learned about Jesus. Her home became the main meeting place for the new believers in that city. Lydia served God through sharing her home. Maybe you can't have a guest live at your house like Lydia did, but wherever you are, you can help others feel at home by being friendly and kind. As you have promised, Lord. The message is, Jesus gives us hope. Our memory verse this week is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. Jesus Christ, by His grace, gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Johnny and Katie were so excited. Grandma was coming today. They watched by the window. Then the phone rang. It was Grandma. A big storm had come up. She wouldn't be able to come today. Tomorrow the storm would be over. Then she would come. Johnny and Katie were disappointed, but they knew Grandma would keep her promise. Many years ago, Simeon and Anna waited and waited for the Messiah to come. They had hope. They believed He would come, but would they recognize Him? Simeon's heart was restless. He tried to walk a little faster as he climbed the Temple Mount. People courteously moved out of the way for this old man with a mission. The Holy Spirit was leading Simeon to the Temple. As he walked, Simeon remembered a day long before. The Spirit had made an important promise. You will not die before you have seen the Messiah. Simeon thought about this promise constantly. He would see the Messiah. Simeon's breath grew short as he climbed, yet he smiled to himself. He didn't have much energy anymore, but that was all right. He had something better. He had hope, the hope of seeing the Messiah. Simeon looked around as he entered the temple. Everything seemed the same as usual. The priests solemnly performed their duties. No excited crowds awaited the fantastic news, the Messiah is here. Simeon passed a poor couple. The young mother cradled their child in her arms. They had brought the child to the temple for a special reason. He was to be consecrated to the Lord as the law required. Simeon smiled. He loved watching happy parents with their babies. It was a pleasant part of serving in the temple. Suddenly, Simeon stopped. There was something about this couple. He stopped to gaze closely on this particular baby. Then all of a sudden, he knew, he knew for certain. With his face shining in anticipation, Simeon approached the couple. Beaming and nodding to the parents, he took the baby in his arms. Then he raised his eyes to heaven. The baby's mother and father watched in amazement. They noted the joyful glow on Simeon's face. They saw tears of thanksgiving trickling down his cheeks. They listened in amazement as he prayed. Now, Lord, as you have promised, you may let your servant die in peace, because with my own eyes I have seen your salvation. Mary and Joseph smiled. This old prophet knew he knew and understood their secret about the Messiah. Just then, an old woman 
the prophetess Anna stepped forward. This prophetess had been in the temple every day for years. She too had hoped to see God's promised gift of grace. Anna joined Simeon in praising God for baby Jesus. Simeon and Anna were among the very first people to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, the one all Israel hoped for. They were among the very first people to spread the news that He had come. Their hope was here, and that hope is ours today. Jesus gives us hope, too. Today's story is called Twice Blessed. The memory verse is one of my favorites. It's from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It says, He is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Today's message is God gives me blessings more than I can ask or or imagine. Imagine getting the most wonderful gift that could ever be given to you. Imagine the excitement of opening a present and finding the one thing you have always wanted your whole life. Now imagine getting double what you expected. God enjoys giving us gifts. He often gives us more than we ask or imagine. Let's read about a woman who would agree. A woman from the town of Shunem often fed the prophet Elisha when he visited there. She knew that Elisha often passed through town. One day she and her husband talked about the prophet's visits. I think we should have a place for Elisha to stay, she said. What do you think? So they decided to add a room to their house. This room was a place on the rooftop with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Elisha was so thankful to have a place to rest that he wanted to do something for the family. So he asked the woman to name anything she wanted, but the woman said she wanted nothing. Elisha's servant remembered that the woman had no children. When Elisha heard this, he knew just what to do. He knew that God loves to give gifts. So he called for the woman. One year from now, he said, God will give you a child to hold in your arms. One year later, Elisha returned to the woman's house in Shunem. Smiling at the door were his friends, and in the woman's arms was a baby boy. The boy grew into a fine lad. One day, he was helping his father in the fields. Suddenly, the boy's head began to hurt. So his father called for a servant to carry him home. The mother did all she could do, but the boy grew sicker and sicker. Finally, he stopped breathing. He had died. God's gift to the Shunammite woman, the most wonderful gift she could imagine, had been taken away. The woman got on her donkey and rode as fast as she could to find Elisha. I didn't ask for anything, she cried as she shared her grief and told the prophet about the son's death. The prophet hurried to the Shunammite's house. He went into the room where the boy was laying and prayed to the Lord. Elisha covered the boy and the boy's body began to get warm. Elisha covered the boy again, and the boy sneezed seven times. Seven times the boy sneezed. On the seventh sneeze, he opened his eyes, awake and alive. Elisha called the boy's mother. When she saw her son, she immediately knelt to thank God. She had been given one of the greatest gifts in life, twice. There was no doubt that God loved her. God is so good. He gave her more than she asked or imagined. 
and God will give you great blessings too, more than you can imagine. Today's story is called Bitter Waters Made Sweet. The memory verse is Psalm 138, verse 1. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. The message for today's story is we worship God with joyful praise. The Jones family was on a hike in an unknown woods. They walked for a long time. Soon they knew that they were lost. Their water bottles were empty and they were very hot and thirsty. Let's stop here, said Mother, and ask God to help us. After praying together, they began walking again. Before long, they found the right trail, and soon they were back at their campsite. At their campsite that night, they worshipped God with joyful praise. Then Mother told the story about a time when the Israelites had water problems too. The joyful celebration on the banks of the Red Sea was over. The pillar of cloud began to move again. The Israelites knew it was time to move on. So they followed the cloud into the desert. For three days, they traveled without finding water. The water they had brought with them was gone. They had to find more if they were to stay alive. The cloud led them toward Mara, where they expected to find a spring. Moses herded sheep in the wilderness for 40 years. He knew the place well. He knew the water at Mara was bitter and not fit to drink. But the Lord had led them to this place. Just as Moses expected, at the first sight of the water, the joyful cry went up, Water! Water! Men, women, and children rushed to the spring, but as soon as the first of them tasted it, their joy turned to disappointment. It had been just three days since the Lord had worked a miracle at the Red Sea. Just three days since He had destroyed the entire Egyptian army. It had only been a few days since they had left Egypt and their lives of slavery. God Himself in the pillar of cloud had led them to Mara. But they forgot all of that. What are we going to drink? They grumbled to Moses. Moses did what the Israelites did not do. He turned to the Lord for help. The Lord showed Moses a piece of wood and told him to throw it into the water. Moses did, and the water became sweet. And then imagine how the people rushed forward to the water. They had gone from joy at finding water to disappointment after tasting it. Now they were back at joy after God worked the miracle. They were no longer in danger of dying of thirst. They had been saved. And then God gave them a promise through Moses. Listen carefully to the voice of the Lord and do what is right in His eyes. If you do what He asks you to do, He will keep you from the diseases of the Egyptians. God would keep them from much of what troubled Egypt. Would they worship God with their lives? Would they honor Him with their obedience? If they did, God would give them happy lives. God gives you the joy of salvation. Just as the Israelites were saved by the sweet water at Mara, you are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. That is a reason for joy. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. That promise is as true for us today as it was for the Israelites. Praise God with joyful praise. Today's story is called Running Away Again. The memory verse is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. It says, 
Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Today's message is loving service is done well, even without a reward. Have you ever eaten in a restaurant with your family? If the service was good, did your family leave a reward or a tip for the person who waited on you? Did that person expect a reward or a tip? When you help someone, do you think about getting a reward? Twenty years had gone by since Jacob had left his home and family. Twenty years he had worked for his uncle Laban. By this time, Jacob had ten sons and at least one daughter. After Joseph had been born, Jacob had asked Laban to let him return to Canaan. But Laban had begged him to stay. Please stay, Laban had pleaded. I know that the Lord has blessed me because of you. So Jacob had agreed to stay, and Laban had agreed to pay Jacob for his work. All the spotted, speckled, and dark-colored sheep or goats would belong to Jacob. Since that time, many animals had been added to Jacob's flock. Jacob was now a wealthy man. Laban's sons were not happy about this. Jacob knew that they believed his flocks should belong to them. And Jacob also knew that Laban's attitude towards him was not what it had been. So when the Lord told Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers, Jacob knew it was time to leave. Without a word to Laban, he gathered his wives, his children, and his flocks and started for Canaan. After three days, Laban learned that Jacob was gone. Laban started after him. Seven days later, Laban caught up with Jacob. That night, God spoke to Laban. The next day, Jacob watched Laban and his men. He wrinkled his forehead with concern as they drew nearer. He knew that Laban would not be happy with him. Why did you run away without telling me? shouted Laban. You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You know it is in my power to harm you. But last night God told me not to say anything to you, good or bad. Jacob answered, I left without telling you because I thought you might try to take my wives and children away. Uncle Laban, Jacob continued, I have been a faithful worker for you for twenty years. During that time I was careful to take good care of your animals. I didn't complain about my work, whether it was blistering hot or freezing cold. I worked fourteen years to pay my debt to you for your daughters, and these past six years I have worked to earn my animals. During that time you changed my pay ten times, but God was with me. You would have sent me away empty-handed, but God knows how hard I've worked for you, and that is why he talked to you last night. Jacob, in a way, everything you have is from me, Laban spoke sharply. These are my daughters and my grandchildren. The animals you have came from my flocks, but it wouldn't be right for me to keep my daughters and their children. Laban's voice was kinder now. Let's make a peaceful agreement, he offered. Jacob agreed. So both families gathered some stones into a big heap. These stones are a witness between us, said Laban. I will not go past this pile of stones to harm you, and you will not pass it to harm me. Jacob repeated the promise. I will not harm you, and you will not harm me. Then the two men and their families shared a meal together. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his daughters and grandchildren. 
Then Laban returned home, and Jacob and his family traveled on toward Cana. For many years people called that place Mizpah, a place of blessing, for it was there that Laban said to Jacob, May the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. Today's lesson is called The Right Choice. Today's memory verse is from Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. It says, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. The message is I tell others I belong to God's family when I choose to be baptized. Sarah, a young missionary child, lived in Russia. Even though she was small, she begged to be baptized, so she studied the Bible with her parents every day. Finally, the big day came. Sarah and some friends were baptized in a cool Russian river on a sunny Sabbath afternoon. Some people who did not know Jesus watched. They listened to the singing. They heard the prayers. They were curious. That day, Sarah and her friends told some strangers about God's family. How? Sarah chose to be baptized. A long time ago, someone else told others about God's family when he chose to be baptized. The hot noonday sun sparkled on the river as the people listened to John's powerful words. Repent, he told them. God's kingdom is close. Turn from your sins and be baptized. Let God know that you choose to follow Him. Many people came to hear the preacher by the river. Some came because they really did want to give their lives to God. Others were just curious. John was a no-nonsense kind of preacher. He wore simple clothes, ate simple food, and preached a simple message. One day, John was surprised and pleased to see Jesus making his way toward the river. He knew all about Jesus. For months, he had been telling people to get ready for the Messiah to come, and now he was here. John, I have come to be baptized. Jesus spoke softly. John was so surprised he could hardly talk. What? Me? Baptize you? Oh, 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 Jesus, you need to baptize me. I should not baptize you. Jesus smiled. John, baptize me as you have baptized others. It is the right thing to do. John smiled. Then, of course, I will. Jesus slowly walked into the water. John followed. He smiled at Jesus, then looked at the crowd. John took hold of his hands and gently laid Jesus back under the water. When Jesus came up out of the water, he knelt beside the riverbank. Jesus knew that sin had made the people's hearts hard. He knew that many of them wouldn't understand his mission of love, so he talked to his father about it. Suddenly, Jesus was surrounded by beautiful light straight from God's throne. He looked up. The Holy Spirit, in the form of a lovely dove, came down on Jesus. Then God's glorious voice rang out. This is my beloved Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. Many people watched Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River that day. They saw the light from heaven surrounding Him. That wonderful day made their faith grow. When Jesus was baptized, He didn't have any sin to wash away. He was baptized as an example for us. Every day, you can spend time getting to know Jesus better. You can thank Him that you are a part of His family. And you can choose to follow His example someday soon. Baptism is a special time when we show everyone that we have given our lives completely to Jesus. 
God is so happy that we choose to be part of His family. He says, You are my child, whom I love. I am so pleased with you. Today's story is called Final Letter to a Friend. The memory verse is from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. The message is, I worship God when I thank Him for Christian role models. Do you like to hear news from a friend who is far away? Paul missed his friend Timothy, so he wrote a letter asking him to come visit him. Paul looked around his bare prison cell. It was rough, dimly lit, and not very comfortable. But he smiled as he remembered his dear friend Timothy. They had been through a lot. Their trials and the joy of working together for Jesus had made them good friends. But more than that, they were like father and son. Paul remembered when they first met. Paul had gone to Lystra. Some people there did not want him to preach about Jesus, so they dragged him outside the city gate and threw stones at him. That was when he met Timothy. When Paul went to Lystra again, Timothy was ready to help him. Even though he was still a teenager, he knew the scriptures. Timothy's father was Greek. Eunice, his mother, and Lois, his grandmother, were Jewish Christians. They had taught Timothy from the scriptures since he was a little boy. They had encouraged him to keep his mind and heart pure. It was their guidance that helped Timothy choose to serve God. Timothy became Paul's assistant. They traveled many miles together, facing many hardships, and their love for Jesus grew and grew. But now Paul was in prison, and Timothy was working in Ephesus. I think I'll write Timothy a letter, Paul thought. I would love to have him visit me. I know it will take quite a while for him to get here, even if he comes right away. Why? It will probably be several months before I can see him, and who knows, I could lose my life any day. But I'll write and ask him to come anyway, and I'll leave some instructions for him in case I should die before he comes. He began to write, Dear Timothy, you have been like a son to me. I wish you grace and peace and mercy from our Lord Jesus Christ. Every day I pray and thank God for you. I am so happy for your faith and for all that you learned from your mother and grandmother. Use that gift of faith. Let it grow into a big fire. Don't be afraid of anything or anyone. If someone is doing something wrong, tell him. Use the power that God gave you. God gives us strength to tell everyone the good news. Never be ashamed to tell people about Jesus. Preach the gospel every time you have a chance. Use the Bible as your weapon. Do not listen to what people say. Read for yourself what is true. Do not listen to false teachers. Protect other believers from their lies. Teach them everything I have taught you. The Holy Spirit will help you. Even though I am in prison, keep believing in God. Please come and see me as soon as you can. When you come, please bring my coat and my books. Be careful of the people who have hurt me. They will try to hurt you too. Say hello to our friends. May the Lord's grace be with you. Paul Paul's letter to Timothy guided and encouraged him, and it guides and encourages us today. Today 
Today's story is called Abram to the Rescue. The memory verse is from Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. It says, Serve one another in love. Today's message is I will serve others out of love. When elderly Mr. Gomez became sick and had to spend a long time in the hospital, Ronnie, Cameron, Aiden, and Ariana decided to help Mrs. Gomez. Without saying a word, they cut her grass and cleaned her yard and would not accept any money. On the way home, they felt as if they were walking on air. And that must be exactly the same feeling that Abram had the day he met Melchizedek. It all started when four great enemy kings led their huge army to war against five little cities. One of the little cities was Sodom. Abram's nephew, Lot, lived in Sodom. The kings of the five little cities took their armies into the valley of Siddim. We can surprise the four great enemy kings, they said. Let us stop their army and save our cities. And so King Bera of Sodom led the way. But it didn't go as planned. They got lost among the huge tar pits in the valley and many of the soldiers fell into the tar. The four great enemy kings knew their way around the tar pits, and soon they got to the city of Sodom. Enemy soldiers captured the people, including Lot. They carried the people and many of their animals and other things away. One captive escaped and ran to tell Abram what had happened. The four great enemy kings attacked us. Your nephew Lot is captured along with all of his family, the man reported. At once, Abram called his 318 men who were trained to fight. He also asked three of his neighbors who were leaders to bring their people to join with him. Together, they hurried after the four great enemy kings. Can you imagine Abram and his little band chasing after the four great enemy kings and their thousands of trained soldiers? Surely they would destroy Abram's little group. But Abram had God on his side. Surely Abram prayed for God's help all the way north to Dan. That's where he caught up with the four great enemy kings. During the night, Abram and his men made a surprise attack. The four great enemy kings thought that they were completely surrounded by a huge army. They dropped everything and ran. They left the captives, all the stolen things from Sodom, and their own things. The frightened soldiers ran all the way north past Damascus to Hobah. Lot and the other captives from Sodom were soon set free. Everyone began gathering up the things left by the defeated enemy kings. Soon they began traveling back toward Sodom. How happy Abram was! God had used him to save Lot and all the families from Sodom. On the way back, Abram's band entered the valley of Shava, not far from where Jerusalem is today. There the king of Sodom came out to meet them. Imagine how impressed this king must have been. Abram, his herdsmen, and the three neighbors had, with God's help, done what five kings could not. Melchizedek, king of Salem, and a priest who served God also came to welcome Abram and the others. Melchizedek brought food and drink for Abram and his men. The kingly priest prayed over Abram and blessed him, 
saying, Blessed be Abram, by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Abram knew that God gave him the victory, so he gladly counted out all the silver and gold and flocks that he brought back. He gave the kingly priest God's tithe of everything, one of every ten animals, pieces of silver, and pieces of gold. The king of Sodom saw all the things Abram gave as tithe. Gratefully, he told Abram to keep for himself all the rest. Give me the people and keep the goods, he said. But Abram would not take anything for himself. He only asked for a share that the neighbors who had helped him were owed. Abram was happy to serve others just for the love of helping them. Today's story is called, Come to Our House. The memory verse is from Romans chapter 12, verse 13. It says, Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Today's message is, I serve God when I am kind to those invited to my home. Think about the last time you had visitors in your home. What did you do to get ready? What did you do to make them feel comfortable? The Bible has many stories about people who invited guests to their home. Meet Priscilla and Aquila. Paul, God's helper, wanted to tell the world about Jesus. So he took a very long trip, known today as Paul's second missionary journey. He had arrived in the city of Corinth, to share Jesus with the people there. A lot of people lived and worked in Corinth, an important city. Paul wasn't sure where he would stay or what he would do. Then he met Priscilla and Aquila. The Roman emperor had ordered all Jews to leave Rome, and Aquila was a Jew. Having just recently moved to Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla probably were not finished settling in. But they did not worry how fancy their home was. They invited Paul to visit them anyway. They soon found out that they had more in common than just being Jewish in Corinth. They were tent makers, and so was Paul. Priscilla and Aquila were very hospitable. That means that they liked to invite people home. They liked to make others feel comfortable and visit with them. But they didn't just invite Paul to Sabbath dinner. They invited him to live with them. Paul helped them make tents, and he helped them learn more about Jesus. Paul lived and worked with Aquila and Priscilla for about a year and a half. Priscilla and Aquila learned much about Jesus from Paul. They also kept busy sharing the good news about Jesus, just as Paul had shared with them. Then one day, it was time to move again to tell other people in other places about Jesus. All three of them sailed to Ephesus. Paul continued his travels, but Priscilla and Aquila set up their new home in Ephesus. Apollos, another Jew, had moved to Ephesus about the same time. An educated man, he knew the scriptures well. He had learned a little bit about Jesus and was sharing what he knew with everyone he met. He even preached about Jesus in the Jewish synagogue. And that's where Priscilla and Aquila heard him. And just as with Paul and Corinth, they invited him home with them. They fed him, made him comfortable, and talked with him about Jesus. Priscilla and Aquila shared Jesus with everyone they met. They made and sold tents so they could buy food and other things they needed. They were good business people. But most of all, Priscilla and Aquila are remembered for their hospitality. They served Jesus and those around them by inviting people to their home. They showed others God's love in a very real, everyday way. Don't be afraid. 
The message is, because God is our friend, we are not afraid of Him. Our memory verse this week is from Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Were you ever afraid of thunder? Of lightning? Of the dark? Of people who shout? Jamie didn't like thunderstorms, especially when they came in the night. But his mother knew that. She always came to be with him. Don't be afraid, she would say. I'll stay with you. It will be all right. And then Jamie could go back to sleep. In Bible days, when God sent an angel to talk to someone, he first made sure that they were not afraid. Recently, we learned about an angel's visit to Zechariah, a temple priest. God sent an angel to stand by the altar where he served. Zechariah, the elderly priest, was frightened, but not for long. The angel immediately soothed Zechariah's fear. Do not be afraid, the angel said. God has heard your prayer. Then the angel told Zechariah some wonderful news. His wife, Elizabeth, would have a baby, and they were to name the baby John. Later, God wanted to tell Mary that she would have a special baby boy. Again, he sent an angel to carry the message. To keep from frightening Mary, the angel spoke softly. Greetings. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, greetings are friendly words. Enemies don't send each other greetings. They send threats. But even so, Mary was troubled and maybe a little frightened. So the angel spoke more plainly. Do not be afraid, Mary. There it was again, that special message from God. Do not be afraid. God sent the same message to the shepherds the night Jesus was born. When the angel messenger appeared, glory and brightness shone, lighting up the night sky. The shepherds were afraid. The Bible writer Luke says that these brave men were terrified. But then the angel spoke. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And the angel told them about the special baby born in Bethlehem. They would find him lying in a manger. When at last the angel voices were hushed and the bright light had faded, the shepherds were no longer afraid. Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has told us about, they said. No longer afraid, they hurried to look for Jesus. So when God speaks, He doesn't mean to frighten us. He wants everyone to hear the friendly message, God is with us. There is no need to be afraid. God is our friend. We need not be afraid of Him. Today's story is called The Nighttime Visitor. The memory verse is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Today's message is God's love changes us. When a mother says she's going to change the baby, what does she mean? How is she going to change it? Into what? You know what she means. But what did Jesus mean when he said, You must be born again? Crickets chirped in the grass. Nighttime birds sang. Quietly, Nicodemus walked toward the place where he had heard he could find Jesus. He didn't want anyone else to see him talking to Jesus. When he found Jesus, Nicodemus said, Teacher, 
we know you came from God. Your miracles tell everybody so. Jesus may have smiled in the darkness. He knew Nicodemus really wanted to believe in him. But Nicodemus was an important Pharisee, a member of the Jewish council. He came to Jesus late at night because he didn't want the other Pharisees to know. Nicodemus knew that Jesus was a teacher sent from God, but he wasn't sure that Jesus could really be God's son. Jesus looked steadily at him. Nicodemus, he said, Miracles are not the most important thing. Unless you are born again, you will not see God's kingdom. Born again? What does that mean? I can't go back inside of my mother. I'm a grown man, Nicodemus exclaimed. You're right, my friend, Jesus answered, but I'm not talking about being born physically. I'm talking about being born spiritually. Truthfully, Nicodemus, unless you are reborn by God's Holy Spirit, you can't be part of God's kingdom. I don't understand, Nicodemus said thoughtfully. Think about the wind for a moment, Jesus replied. You can't see the wind itself, but you can see what happens when the wind blows. You can see the treetops sway and hear the rustling of the leaves. When the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, it's like that. You can't see inside a person's heart, their mind, but you can see what happens in their life because their life is new and clean. Their life is changed. It was quiet as Nicodemus thought about what Jesus was saying. Nicodemus, your physical life came from your parents, Jesus continued. But a person's spiritual life comes from the Holy Spirit. When a person chooses to let God come into his or her life, God helps them change their sinful mind and gives the person a brand new one. That's being born again. Nicodemus, I have good news for you. God loves the world so much that he sent his only son here to save the world. When someone believes in him, God can give them that brand new life. And that new life means you are born again. And those born again will receive the gift of eternal life. Nicodemus learned something that night that everyone must learn. Jesus loves us so much. He is ready right now to take our sinful hearts and lives and give us new ones. Will you let him give you that new, clean heart today? Will you be born again? Will you take the gift of eternal life that he wants to give you? You might want to say something like this to Jesus. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. My life is sinful. Right now, I want to give it to you. I ask you to give me a new clean heart and mind instead. Change my life to be more like yours. Thank you for your gift of eternal life. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Today's story is called Jacob's Journey Ends. The memory verse is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. It says, We show that we are servants of God by our kindness. Today's message is being kind at home helps us learn how to serve others. Can you think of a time where someone in your family helped you without being asked? What did they do for you? Did their kindness surprise you? Our story this week reminds us of something important. We learn how to serve others by being kind at home. It was morning and Jacob woke up to continue his long journey to Haran. 
He had left his home because his brother was very angry with him. Jacob had tricked his father and had gotten a special blessing that should have gone to his brother. Because of this, his mom thought it was a good idea for him to go and stay with her brother Laban for a while. She also hoped that Jacob would find a wife there. The night before, while he had slept with a stone for his pillow, he had a dream. He had dreamed that he had seen a ladder and angels going up and down the ladder. Then God had spoken to him and promised to be with him. Jacob worshipped God when he woke up and had promised that God would be his God. Now he was ready to continue his journey. It was a long journey, about 450 miles altogether. It would take many, many weeks of walking. Finally, after many days and nights of traveling, Jacob neared the city of Haran. He hoped to find his mother's family there. His journey was almost over, and he was so glad. On the outskirts of Haran, Jacob saw a well. It was about noon, and three flocks of sheep were gathered there. Why are these flocks at the well in the middle of the day? he wondered. This well was different from those near Jacob's home. He saw that a huge stone covered the well's opening. There were no troughs from which the sheep could drink. Jacob approached the well and spoke to the shepherds gathered there. My brothers, where are you from? he asked. We are from Haran. One shepherd reply, Do you know a man named Laban who lives there? Jacob questioned. Yes, we know him, the shepherds answered. Then Jacob asked, Is he well? Yes, he is, replied one of the shepherds. In fact, here comes his daughter Rachel with some of his sheep. She is a shepherdess. The man pointed to a young woman coming toward them. Jacob looked and saw Rachel coming to the well. She was leading a flock of sheep, but she was still quite some distance away. Jacob continued talking with the shepherds. Tell me, why don't you water your sheep and take them back to the pasture? He asked. There is still a lot of daylight left. We can't, they replied. It is our custom to wait until all the flocks are gathered. When they are all here, we remove the big stone from the well. Then all the animals drink, and we cover the well again. While Jacob and the shepherds talked together, Rachel and her sheep arrived. Jacob went over to the well. He kindly rolled the heavy stone away from the opening. Then he led his uncle Laban's sheep to the water and cared for them. He spoke kindly to Rachel. I am Jacob, and I am one of your relatives. I have come a long way to meet your family. Your father's sister, Rebecca, is my mother. He was so glad to finally meet a relative that he began to cry. His long journey was over. He was with family again. Please, wait right here, Rachel exclaimed. I want to let my father know that you are here. Then she turned quickly and ran toward home. An excited Rachel told her father about Jacob. Laban was amazed that Jacob had come so far. He hurried back to the well with her. How wonderful to meet you, Jacob, he exclaimed. He hugged his nephew and kissed his cheeks as that was their custom. We're so glad you're here. Come, let's go home so we can visit. Laban led the way. Soon they reached Laban's home. There Jacob told his uncle about the family he had left behind. He talked about his mother, Rebecca, and how she had sent Jacob to Laban. And Uncle Laban welcomed his nephew Jacob into his home. Soon Jacob became a part of Laban's family. Yes, Jacob helped Rachel by removing the heavy stone from the well. 
and he helped her by watering the sheep. No one had to ask him to help. He showed courtesy and kindness to Rachel. Can you help others without being asked? By being kind to your own family, you learn to serve others. What will you do to serve others this week? Created and produced by Falvo Fowler. This podcast is read by Franita Buddy Fullwood for Gracelink.net. Animation and artwork by Giogo Godoy. Audio is post produced by Faith Toe at Studio El Piso in Singapore. The theme music is by Clayton Kinney. The audio engineer was Maurice Bailey. <laughs>